Okay, aloha. You know, we are live now. I just got out, uh, I got to the Kalanimoku building where the uh, Board of Land and Natural Resources for the state of Hawaii are having a hearing on an uh, emergency rule basically trying to bar uh, Mauna protectors uh, access uh, to the mountain so that uh, TMT construction crews can uh, continue. Um, this is I think the first important issue that New Deal and our uh, director Suzanne Case uh, will be presiding over. Uh, we're going to try and get in, but I thought uh, what I'd show you is we'd try and show the venue because uh, you can't see that easily. It, the meeting itself is being uh, live streamed uh, on Olelo, uh, both on TV and on uh, the internet. Uh, I believe channel 55, you can look that up. We'll take a look at what's happening outside and then we'll try and get in. You can try and follow me in if they let me in. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, this meeting room, there's a large screen we'll take a look at outside that shows uh, what's going on at the hearing. The people inside the hearing can also see what's happening outside the hearing because there is a camera on the screen. Uh, so we'll show uh, a lot of people here. Sign me. People are all looking at this screen. It shows the uh, Just try and back up and you can see uh, all right. that's it. Trying to get some stills also. Okay. Sorry about that. First Amendment right to worship and government's right to manage property. I think that it is it's useful to read that to understand the mix that we have to remind the member who we adjust the party in the past because they come together right now. Sorry, I got a camera on my neck and also my glasses. Got tangled up. Let's let's try and go inside and see what happens. I'm gonna see if they'll let me in. Okay. We're in the hallway. Let's see if we can get in here. Hawaii Gorilla Video Hui, we're live on the internet right okay. now. Okay. Can we um, I just gotta be sure there's a media seat, so hold on one moment. Okay. I just gotta get my bag. My bag. 
You know, I never come to these things, but my name is Kalani Hassan. Um, this has been very, very painful uh, being here and um, just knowing what I know as a Kanaka Maori. I know the truth of this land, mine, of ours, not yours, of my people's existence here in Hawaii. This is my, this is our Pico. So there's a conflict here. And no wonder we have Heva. Heva exists in this room. It is, the, the real truth is outside there with all those people out there. That's our truth. That's my people's truth. We would never be sacrilegious in our own homeland towards Mauna Kea. There's no such a thing. You don't ever even attempt to insult us in thinking that you know better than us. I brought the signage to make it very easy. We're not as handicapped as, as you think we are. <coughs> We're truly the answer for being the proper people to Malama, to Ia Aina. And not one of you qualify to be here in this room with us. Um, once again, I find it quite sacrilegious to be even in the same room with all of you. Um, I brought my rock saw, and that gentleman, wow, I mean, the slipping and sliding one does, boy, one would definitely get hurt coming down Mauna Kea with, the, with that slippery tongue of his. Uh, so that's the biggest fear, are people that don't know how to be pono. And that's the last word that should be used anywhere within this room. None of you have any comprehension as to the depth of Pono. You will never comprehend the pain that we have suffered for the last 122 years here in our Aina. And I thank you very much for enduring what has to happen. Truth must prevail, not yours. What is righteous to us is not right for the U.S. That has been the problem from day one. Get it right. Then possibly you could possibly enjoy understanding or even beginning to understand who we are. We're truly righteous people. 
You cannot say the same. Is it three minutes already? Yes. Mahalo. 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 Aloha, Michael Kumuka Ohali, recognized uh, cultural practitioner. Uh, the state is, the occupying state is going over its powers. In the uh, First Amendment freedom rights, no other religion is permitted for their sacred place, sacred presence, and sacred practice. We, our kuleana comes genealogically through Heva Heva Nui, Pele Iholani, Kiamoku Papa Ahi Ahi, last high priest of Iho. Uh, Pele Iholani um, is a, ska, a star priest. I am a star priest. Recognized by the city council in page one, it tells who my genealogy is, it tells um, who my teachers are and who their teachers are. And as you can see, the date is uh, May 8, 2012, with all the city council elected representative for a million people on Oahu. The second page is my recognition as a practitioner with um, Kahea against the National Fisheries Service in the U.S. District Court on the Big Island. Okay. That's my standing. My name is right there, Michael Kumukau Ohali. Then, Governor Abercrombie always said they showed up 10 minutes ago, the Hawaiians, and made it up. Star Bulletin Advertiser shows me 20 years ago in front of my student as the chairman of the Religion Department of Damien. I taught Hawaiian studies, and it talks about my Kilo, kilo uh, Hoku background, Star Priest. Guess what? We need to look at the viewplane at night, and you're denying me. The state is denying. And then it says it has the audacity to give me a permit, which it doesn't do to the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus, and any other religion. It's specifically selecting us. Uh, Supreme Court 2006 recognizes us. Then, my um, royal patent land in Ka'apahu, in Hamakua, which is the district of the telescope, and up there. We still own that land. We have the royal patent. My family have the royal patent and also the archives of where the wills come directly to the original land owners of a half of Ahupua that we still own. So not only am I recognized on so many levels, but how do I teach my students? Our Ibi Kupuna is buried up there on the mountain. And what is being taken away is the sacred space of our sacred place, of our sacred practice. The VQ bug gets more attention than the living Kanaka Maoli, and I'm the 966th generation by name to Ki'iyama Ila'i, the first that goes 50,000 years back. And I want to say this, that in your denying me, you do injury with this arbitrary, capricious rule that is not done to any other, any other religion or any other purpose. Yeah. So, what we want to say is, this is denying us our rights presently, but someone does that practice at night. And our la'au that we use, we use it on the sacred nights of la'au, la'au kukahi, la'au kukulua, and la'au kupau, at night to gather them. And you're denying me, denying me of my teaching of my students to do what our bloodline says is our kuleana, and this is specific, and you have the specifics out of the finding of fact in Western venue. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, number three is Hank Ferguson. Good afternoon. <coughs> My name is Hanalei Ferguson. I'm the chosen spokesman for the for Mokokiabi. I was the group of elders that established themselves in 2003 and it is noticed publicly um, through publication. Uh, as of, since then, there's been no counter to our establishment. Um, anyway, um, there's a whole lot more I need to say about this, but I'm given, given only three minutes, I'm 
trying to select how I say this is most important. One of the first things that's really important to understand is that in the traditional use, nobody was allowed a monarchy, except for priests and certain chiefs and certain craftspeople for a particular reason. It was never for residents or for things like telescopes, because that's a residency. Okay? So this is why it's so hard for me. I am I am from the Temple of Lomba. I have been taught these things. And so to you know, I, I certainly understand the, the, the dilemma that we're in right now. I, and I appreciate the, the problem that we're having and how we have to address it. But it would be unfair to talk about about the mountain without putting it in perspective as to how it was for thousand years before Western time, yeah. And so, if, if I may, I'm just going to quickly read what I wrote to you because it has some very important features. May I do that? You have a minute in here, you'll have to summarize. Okay. Okay. Um, we stand firmly against the proposed emergency rulemaking procedures to adopt a new section under Hawaii Administrative Rules, Title 13, one, Chapter 123, Section 21-2. Anyway, you have that, that. You already have that part. Um, there is no evidence of imminent peril to public safety and natural resources that was not caused by the aggressive behavior of law enforcement agencies against the peaceful protectors exercising constitutionally protected rights of freedom of speech and freedom, religious freedom enumerated in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Other protections include, but not limited to, Public Law 95-341, which is the Native American Religious Freedom Act, Public Law 103-150, which is the Apology Bill, which clearly states that the Hawaiian people never directly relinquish their inherent sovereignty or their national lands. And clearly the entire area of land area compass in this proposed proposal are identified to be Hawaiian kingdom, crown, and government lands. Further protection, protections are stated in the Admissions Act in numerous sections, including 5F, regarding ceded lands belonging to the Hawaiian kingdom, crown, and government with clearly stated beneficiaries, of which there are five, directed to, the, to the benefit for the Hawaiian people and the public. Other enumerations of, of protections... Here, 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 here. I'm having a hard time understanding how you think it's all right to enter the realm of the, of the gods and think that I, who am a priest, I have to be regulated by you folks who have absolutely no authority up there whatsoever. Thank you. Can I just say one more fast thing about the um, hunting? Um, by the way, I went to the forest department to find out this hunting area, A, eh? and I was told by there, I said, I should know because my father made all those roads around Mauna Kea. Thank you. Okay, number four is Felicia Cowden. Aloha, my name is Felicia Cowden and I am from Kauai. And this type of assertion of power set a precedent across the island. I respectfully, respectfully urge the board to reject the request for the new administrative rule because it, to me, is a blatant attempt to create an environment to criminalize the protectors of Mauna Kea that the state would utilize the Division of Forestry and Wildlife to trump up an emergency set of rules to protect the public is a demonstration that the protectors, in fact, are not currently breaking state law in their preservation, a perseverance of peaceful resistance to the continuance of unwanted development on the mountain. This illegitimate use of emergency procedures is a violation of broad public trust. The possession of a blanket or a backpack does not constitute an emergency. An emergency is a dam break or a lava flow. This 120-day uh, rule period will provide time for the development to get started implementing the primary damage of putting in the TMT. It basically invalidates what these people are trying to protect. The state government, from the governor to UH and now the DLNR, are prioritizing global corporate interests over the will of the people. It does not constitute an emergency that the companies behind the development of the TNT ignored the results of their own homework. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation commissioned a study in 2007 that advised that the project would encounter significant cultural resistance. 
The draft EIS simply dropped the elements that resulted with the do not build. The process that has given the green light to the approval of this 14th resisted telescope has been as disingenuous as the emergency set of rules. These companies and the governing entities underestimated the strength and commitment of the people after decades of being ignored. And this power struggle has been their business risk. The First right, Amendment rights to peacefully assemble, freedom of speech, and religion are being violated by this set of proposed rules. Additionally, the rules restricting access directly contravenes the state, you know, Hawaii Supreme Court PASH decision that prohibits state of Hawaii from enacting laws that restrict Native Hawaiian cultural practices. Um, the mission of the Department of Land and Natural Resources is shifting from the original preserve and protect towards the more egregious mission of the Public Land Development Corporation, which was to exploit the resources for revenue. In this case, I don't see much revenue, just the exploitation. I ask the board to please stand on the right side of history. This 106 days of commitment to peaceful prayers of protection at the 9,000 foot level, are, these are to me on the level of movements like what Gandhi did. Or, um, so this crime is being committed to the protectors, not by them. So I ask you to reject the set of rules. Good afternoon. My name is Stuart Hunter. I'm the general manager for Monica Observatory Support Services. MKSS operates the visitor information station, the mid level astronomy facilities, and maintains the eight and a half mile summit route. I support these rules because of the unsafe <coughs> and illegal behavior of many of those that have been encamped across the street from the visitor station. They have obstructed traffic by standing or sitting in the middle of the road at all hours, harassed visitors and workers, questioning them about their destination and affiliation. Protesters have built structures on DNLR lands and introduced an invasive ant species. There was an impromptu reggae hunt. T-shirts were sold. Free tattoos were off. State DOE vehicles were used to bring up charter school students who obstructed traffic while chanting in the middle of the road. Protesters also used the visitor station bathroom and even the drinking fountain to wash clothes and themselves. They blocked the road with large rocks, trapping people on the summit. If there had been a medical <coughs> emergency, there would have been no way to reach these people. Many felt harassed. Visitors and workers complained about being yelled at after expressing opposing views. Many visitors took offense at being stopped in the middle of the road and questioned. Protesters shined lights, yelled out during the evening free public stargazing program. A large person walked around to Viz with his face covered with a balaclava and stared down staff. Threatening Facebook posts were found and staff were yelled at after being questioned about their job. The stress about this began to show and many let the manager know that they were looking for other work. The cost of supplying water, restrooms, lures, trash removal, and other services to an illegal camp is also costing the visitor station about $5,000 a month. June 24th saw around 500 protesters arrive and use over 10,000 gallons of water. It was apparent the visitor station had to be closed due to continued stress on staff and the cost of supporting a new encampment. 16 employees now face the loss of their jobs. However, most stand ready when they can work in a safe and lawful environment. In closing, I strongly support access to Mauna Kea for all those willing to follow the law, along with my verbal testimony, a photos, and a daily log from the staff have been submitted. I'll open your time and may I take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Number six, Nunzani Trask. Aloha, board members. I'm Nimilani Trask. I'm a Native Hawaiian practitioner of Mauna Kea. I'm a founding member of Mauna Kea and Inaho, the original petitioners who will go to the Supreme Court in August. 18 years ago, Mauna Kea and Inaho and the Royal Order built the Ku'ahu at the Halipuhaku. 
and we maintained it for many years. I practiced there for four years, till problems with the science community and tourists caused me to change my practice. Uh, in 11 and 12, we planned the Apapalani ceremonies. We held them three consecutive years. My family and myself were there. The Apapalani ceremonies are sunrise ceremonies at Mauna Kea, and that occurred uh, 2013, 14, and 15. Uh, in recent months, I have returned to my practice on the Mauna. Uh, I camp out, I have a sleeping bag. If it's 40 degrees or below, I sleep in the car. If it's 40 degrees and above, I sleep on the cot in the tent. I was up there about a week and a half ago. Trustee Hulu Lindsay and other trustees were sleeping in their cars next to mine. I'm there not because I'm a hunter or a camper. I'm there because I'm uh, exercising rights in Article 12, Section 7 of the state constitution. Uh, our rights are not limited there. There are two exceptions in our state law that I believe you would have to take a look at and include if you're looking to adopt any language here. The first exception is Chapter 171-6, Subsection 15. It provides that in exercising the powers for regulation of state land, no person could be sanctioned who says that they are there for the purpose of utilizing or uh, exercising rights in Article 12, Section 7. This is in the current uh, uh, statutory framework now, 171-6, subsection 15, paragraph 3. No person shall be sanctioned pursuant to this section for the exercise of Native Hawaiian gathering rights and traditional cultural practices as authorized by law or permitted by the department. I have gone to the OMKM and also DLNR to request if there is some permit, if there is some license that my family and I and the other Kumus who did a Papalani could obtain so that we could do 24-7 practice. The answer was there is no permit available for us. There is no permit available. Now the second exception uh, to our right arose when the legislature passed Act 132 in 2009. That, uh, that was the University Autonomy Bill. If you take a look at Act 132, it has very clear language that the university shall, shall accommodate Native practice, but they have refused to do so. <laughs> Lastly, there is a, there is a federal district court case on point here. It's a case that came down years ago when the Protect of Ho'olabe Ohana was trying to get overnight access on Ho'olabe. The case was in the district court. The military said that they had a long-term lease, there were live ordinances, and they were doing <coughs> training and bombing exercises. The federal court struck them down, and the federal court required that they provide 24-7 access for Native uh, peoples seven to 10 days a month by the cycle of the full moon with full military escort. You know, that's a precedent we should look at. I think that we could work together if we could have a consultation of the native practitioners, which has never occurred. Once we have the consultation, we can understand the practice, the location, the nature of the practice for those that are doing sunrise or sunset. But we can't make a cultural resource management plan without first having the consultation and the data. And I have done this all over the world with my work at the UN. You think you have a problem. In the Philippines, we had 50,000 demonstrating, three killed over the World Bank, and we were able to resolve it. These are rights to worship. I can't be a camper. I don't want to be a hunter. I will be returning with my sleeping bag. I will not be told for 120 days that I cannot pray to the Akua. And I'm requesting that you put the exceptions in that the law currently provides for me so that I do not have to have my constitutional and human rights violated. Thank you. I humbly come before you because we all live together. I was born and raised in Apua Bayao, 
I retired as a virgin seaman. I spent 40 years looking at stars. I spent 20 years of those 40 years as regional port engineer, Madison Navigation Company. My kuleana was the state of Hawaii, Micronesia, and Guam. I respected everything that they did in their environment, their laws, and mostly their spiritual values. For me, being here, it hurts, mostly, because my na'au hurts to watch the continuous desecration of Hawaii Day. Not just mana or kea, also our moana, our aina, our wai, and the prejudice towards the Hawaiian people. The deal in our agency of the illegal state has exercised the prejudice on the mana or all of the government ihi through council, through law. It's not fair. We, the real true Hawaiians, not the worst of political influenced Hawaiians, we feel very unjust. For 122 years of desecration, I fought with me every time I travel the truth to a petition. I bring the ancestors with me. I bring the ancestors with me. This is us. Oh. Oh, Evie. Why? With, you know, our Kuleana is to protect this place. It's not a control. Look at the crime. Look at the traffic. Look at the desecration. It's sad. We don't have to be that. We don't. But the federal government and the state allows it to do that without controlling it. Kala. You know, on the money, it says, in God we trust. Is that true? And every dollar, it says, in God we trust. Is that true? Since the very beginning, it hurts because you know and I know the true history of Hawaii. We know what happened. Excuse me, you're approaching three minutes. Okay, okay. For, okay. for my closing, this is what I got. My closing is the President Cleveland's own words in his message of Hawaii, December 18. 1893, quote, by act of war committed with the participation, participation of diplomatic representatives of the United States without authority of Congress, the government of a feeble but friendly and conflicting people has been overthrown, unquote. The President of the United States, Wilson, told the truth, and today there is no honor in the United States President's words, no honor to the truth. And honor to God we trust. The AG, he says, uphold the law. What's the Constitution of the United States law? Thank you. <laughs> this is for you the history of President Kingdom. Williamson Chang. Uh, good afternoon, board. Uh, my name is Williamson Chang. I'm a professor of law at the University of Hawaii and have been for 39 years as the longest serving uh, member of the faculty. Um, I am here as the counsel for uh, Mr. Hanley Bergstrom and Mr. Kate Lee e. Ion, who are filing a request for a contested case hearing. And that was filed at 7 o'clock this morning. Um, but now I realize the rule has changed. So I'd like to take care of that by filing a new uh, request. Uh, and I don't have much time up here. If you want to know what I'm going to argue, you can read the testimony I have filed. And I have extra copies here uh, if you haven't seen it. Uh, there, Bill. 
over here. Um, and I have copies for all of those who are outside as well. Let's try to bring it up. Sorry. Um, first, I want to say that um, in filing the contested case hearing, it occurred to me that what's not going to happen, which usually happens, is there's going to be a stay on the administrative action. There's no, there's no question that the trucks that are building the PMP are going to continue up under this rule. This rule is a pretty thinly disguised effort to facilitate what the governor said. Essentially, the TMT is going to be built. And that bothers me. Um, I don't think that the 120 days of truce and negotiation can take place in such an environment. Um, and if this, if this board either doesn't grant the contested case hearing or doesn't stay the effectiveness of the rule, essentially I'm going to be forced to move to court to enjoin and declare the actions of this board in adopting C1 and C2 to be unconstitutional, beyond your powers under state law, um, beyond your powers in section 183D, and um, I know you had an hour with the Attorney General. I'm going to be across from him. I only have 32 seconds left. So if you want to ask me what my strategy is, <laughs> I'd be happy to answer that. But first, let me say, I'm probably going to have to name you as individual defendants in your individual capacity. That's just required by law, and it's nothing personal. I am admirers of all of you, and I respect you. Um, but this will be decided in the courts. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <coughs> Professor Chan, you wrote an article in Civil B where you said a number of things. Um, but one of them was that uh, President Obama could stop the, cons the construction on Mount Akea by invoking the Antiquities Act and declaring it a national monument. That's completely wrong, you know. It is wrong, I apologize. What I meant was you could start a process by which eventually it could reach the status of a World Heritage Site, which was a pretty fast track for Papahano Makea, and then perhaps we could stop it. In other words, I was really just saying one thing, which is uh, we have a local boy as president, and this is a really important issue to the state in which he was born, and he ought to weigh in in some way. Either mediate or um, do what he thinks is best, and I think it's funny that Mauna Kea is not, is, a, is simply a conservation district you, area, whereas Mauna Loa and Kilauea are on the World Heritage Site, and Papahanamakea is a World Heritage Site, and they're, they're, they're married yeah. together the, in the, the you basically, the, I have this question about the legality of, of using the Antiquities Act, and, and you answered that question. Um, I, have a, I also have a question. Basically, you, you, you provide us a 30 or 40 page um, legal brief which I take it as arguing that the United States government has no authority. No, I argue that DLNR has no, no authority. Because the United States government had no authority? No, because if you look in the state constitution, the territorial boundaries define what's in the state as all the islands that are acquired by the joint resolution. Yes. And do you believe, sir, that a joint resolution of Congress of the United States could acquire a foreign sovereign independent country? Um, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not here to debate that point. I just. Well, that's uh, the it, definition the, of the, the territorial the question, claim. The, the question I was going to ask you is, do you think there is federal authority, U.S. federal authority over Hawaii? Yes, they're clearly here. <coughs>
children, and I am a resident of Kaaba, Hawaii. Um, I was one of the um, protectors, it's called protectors, not protesters, at the time of um, June. I just wanted to mention why I'm wearing pink, and if you knew why I was wearing pink, then you would know the legend of Poiyahu and pink tinted snow god, which is known as Ku Kahaula. He never get in the Mo'olelo, he never gives up on Poliahu and he keeps on coming back to win her love. And that's what I'm gonna do for Poliahu. I'm gonna protect her, I'm gonna stand beside my brothers and sisters as a, pro as a protector, not a protester. Know the difference. So if you had a connection to, any of you in this room had a connection to Mauna Kea, then you would know about this Mo'olelo. Um, I emailed my testimony, and I'm shaking right now because I feel like there was so much Eno and Heva that was said from the TMT supporters, especially when I witnessed the highest form of Aloha. And I challenge all of you, each of you, to go to Mauna Kea, and I don't know who's been in whose face, sir, but when I went up there, the Malibini, the visitors, they were given a high just a high dose of aloha, just the highest form of aloha there. And that's what I experienced. Before I left to Mauna Kea, I had zero dollars. I had nothing to go there with. I had, um, I had my crochet, I have a bunch of health problems. One of them is a kidney problem. Others are feet problems. Before I went to Mauna Kea, and when I went there, there's protocol. We don't leave our rubbish or our trash. We clean up our mess right after, leave it the best way we can when we have a lele. There was protocol and um, some members of um, the protectors, like such as Sacred Mauna Kea, we and uh, a lot of teachers, educators came up there and he talked to us about how to take care of the Aina of Mauna Kea and the historical significance of Mauna Kea. Um, I know I only have a brief moment, but my ties lie to Mauna Kea lies to the Kaunui family. Though so I'm a descendant of the Kaunui family, I am also a descendant of many Kahuna that was part of Kala King Kalakawa's Hale no Nawa. And I am a, because I am a descendant, I have a responsibility, and I was reminded of that responsibility when I was up at Mauna Kea. Now, I seen both sides of the DLNR. I saw some very sweet DLNR. Um, officers, and then I see some really um, hasty and very mean and vicious DLNR officers. Okay, just one thing. I video those mean and harsh people. I just wanted to say that um, please stand with us in protecting Mauna Awakea. Mahalo. Mahalo. Next, number 10, Michelle Sakurai. Aloha, I'm Michelle and Alamani Sakurai, and I came here to testify not only for myself, but on behalf of my my spouse, my parents, and our ancestors who have lived on the slope of Mauna Kea and in this Paiaina for millennium. I am here today to object and to oppose the proposed emergency rules for Mauna Kea. The only emergency facing Mauna Kea today is further desecration by TMT. Your emergency rules are another fine example, sorry, <laughs> another fine example of history repeating itself. Whether it be the self-proclaimed provisional government of 1893 or the entity who claims to be the state government today, the tactics are the same. Manipulate the facts, spin the truth, change the rules to achieve your goal. I ask you, by what authority do you exercise your powers? Because the simple truth is that there is no treaty of annexation. The joint resolution of Congress in 1898 has no legal authority in a foreign country. The United States of America 
and its agents have no legal jurisdiction in the nation state of Hawaii, which was recognized as much by many countries, including the United States in 1844. Historically, the problem the people of Hawaii have in trying to work with the people of the United States is that the United States doesn't abide by the rule of law. It doesn't abide by international law. It doesn't abide by its own laws. But today, you have the opportunity to right some of those wrongs. Now is your chance to search your heart and your conscience and acknowledge the truth and act accordingly. <coughs> Now is your moment in history to be Pono. What will your legacy be for yourself, for your family, and for the people of Hawaii? Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo. Next, number 11 is Linda Wynell Mills. is from uh, Big Island, um, from Kumuela, and they're going to Kataliela. So, so our roots and, 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 uh, mm -hmm. and our ohana is, is on, on that island as well. Now that I'm retired, I plan to actively participate in voicing my concerns as often as necessary, so hopefully it's be a lot of me. According to my research, okay, this board is planning to enforce the emergency rules for Mauna Kea mm -hmm. to restrict public access to the Mauna and impose severe penalties for violations. So my understanding is that me and my ohana, we won't be allowed to travel to the mauna and to offer our cultural practices, our uli, our pulu, because we'll be <coughs> subject to severe monetary violations. Right now, my great-grandson, his name is Kaiko from Oahu. He's visiting his aunt on the big island. And the highlight of this summer for him was to visit Mauna Kea, as I taught him the uli, uh, and Hula Hanau Kumaona, and he wants to visit and offer this in honor of, of his kupuna. Of course, he always takes his backpack with him, which says, you know, Captain America on it. So he says, he has Tutu, um, can I go up there with my backpack? Or are they going to turn, what are they going to take away my backpack? <laughs> so, uh, no, um, uh, Olin. So right off the plane, he, when he had, had his aunt take him up to Malakia, so he could offer um, his pule. So my question is, just what does this board consider an emergency? Okay, some members of my ohana have visited Mauna Kea, offering our pule, our protocol, and have respectfully remained by Hale Pohaku, far from sensitive summit environments. So how is their presence more of a threat than the 100,000 visitors and over 32,000 vehicles every year who visit Mauna Kea? I believe that the Kukia Imana has been an excellent conduit for the many and varied political and spiritual protective energies that have been brought to the Mauna. How would forcibly removing this peaceful organization ensure the protection of public safety and natural resources? This group represents me and my Ohana who are not residing on Hawaii Island, but we are in support of their efforts. I support the constitutional rights of Kukia Imauna to assembly and free speech and Hawaiian cultural practitioners in our vital practices, public access, recreation, and enjoyment of the pristine environs of Mauna Kea. So I humbly ask you to reject the proposed emergency rules. Number 12, Eileen Kane. <coughs> Good afternoon, board. My name is Eileen Kane. I live here in Honolulu. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I know it's a lovely day for any of us. Um, I felt moved to come, even though this isn't one of my favorite things to do, to testify in front of people, because this issue has been disturbing me so much. Um, and I feel that this so-called emergency is bogus 
and has been invented for the purpose of um, interfering with people's rights to assemble and rights to practice freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and I hope the board will not allow that to happen. I believe that these protectors have been motivated by the same kinds of motivation as the folks in the Protect Ho'olabe Ohana back in the generation before, um, same as Rosa Parks who refused to give up her seat on the bus because that law was a law, but it was a wrong law, and she violated the law, and she was arrested, but she needed to do that as a matter of conscience, and sometimes people have to obey their conscience if the conscience and the law don't go together. Supposedly, the law and the conscience should be able to go together, but they don't always. So people sometimes feel pushed to the limit where they have to say, no, you cannot take any more from us. You cannot take any more. So much has been taken and taken. And I'm Holly. I've been living here 38 years. I feel that I've seen over and over again this pattern where some, for some people, you know, it's like Hawaiian's places, well, their poncho, do little hula, you know, cut the ribbon in the new building. And when it comes to their land, they're supposed to shut up and be invisible and go away and let the state do whatever the hell it wants. And I don't think that's right. I think that's really a violation of, it's, it's a moral violation. Now, if a particular individual does something wrong, for example, not that you would, but if this gentleman insulted that gentleman, you couldn't say the whole board is unruly. We wouldn't disband your board. We'd have to have a few words with this gentleman about his behavior. And yet it seems that some kind of across the board retaliation is being perpetrated or planned by um, those who have put forward these rules to try to retaliate against people who have had to say no to exploitation, no to abuse, no, you cannot just keep taking our rights away and taking our land away. And that's what I want to say. Thank you for this. Thank you very much. Okay, number 13 is Keala Walt Mahalani Mix. Not here. Number 14 is Kalani Ka'ana Ka'ana Ka'ana. Number 15 is Keke Manera. Aloha, Hako. My name is Keke Pania Manera. My mom is from Rhode Island. My dad is from the Big Island, and I was born and raised on this island. Um, I just wanted to share that. So I'm a mixed, a mixed breed, but I connect more with my Hawaiian culture. Um, I love my island, and I love, you know, our island, our, our other islands. I'm kind of nervous right now. This is my first time doing this. But I just wanted to say that I've been up to Mauna Kea, um, and I really, really appreciate its beauty. And uh, I wanted to ask you folks, have you guys been up there? Have you folks been up there? Have you guys experienced it? I truly believe that if more and more people just go up there and they see for themselves um, the, the true rare beauty that it has and just leave it be that we don't need all of this construction. We don't need um, this desecration on the land. And also, I want to be able, I have keikis. I want to be able to start bringing them up there as well. So I want you folks to think about um, stopping all these rules. We don't need more rules. There's already rules in place, and I believe that I want to be able to bring my kids, you know, when it's their time, when it's their chance, to come and experience it as well, and without all these rules and regulations. Because as a Native Hawaiian, I believe that I have a right to do that, and my kids should have a right to do that as well. And as far as the protesters, protectors, um, I think that they're just doing w with the rocks, when it comes concerns with the rocks, um, they're just doing that because enough is enough. They want to put out the message that enough is enough. They just don't want people going up there. And I feel for them because they're just, you know, it's enough already, yeah? So um, 
I hope you guys vote against it. And thank you for your time. Mahalo. Mahalo. Oh. Mahalo. 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 No and I'm here today to oppose, obviously, the, um, the proposal to create a rule that would essentially criminalize us for being on the mountain, protecting it from things that the DLNR themselves should be protecting it from, which is a violation of HRS 711-1107 desecration law. I'm not going to repeat it because you guys sit on the board, so I'm sure you know it better than I do. Um, I think it's quite clear, and I think it's been acknowledged by a few members on this board, that this that this, this law directly targets people like me. Uh, people that have been on the mountain for the past 107 days, not camping, no matter what it looks like, no matter how people want to interpret it, we know we're not there camping. We're there holding vigil, ceremony, at least three times a day. Sunrise, Kokalai, Tololo, Napo'o, Sunset. Uh, as groups and individuals hold ceremony outside of that time. So we're not there camping, we're there due to necessity. We're there as, an, as a reaction to the potential and, and possibly imminent threat of desecration, further desecration upon Mauna Wakea. And with all of the heva, all of the ino, all of the haumia that is on that mountain and that uh, people intend to, to further put on that mountain, it requires much pulit requires diligence. It requires, at this point, 24-7 watch. And that's essentially what we're doing. And, and this, this law, I think, is, one, I think it's silly, two, I think it's irresponsible, three, I think it's weak, and four, to be quite frank, I think it's kind of pathetic. And, and, but it's quite irresponsible to, to really target us, because it's clear that it is, and to affect, as Uncle was saying, the larger community. And so I'm not here just to protect our rights, but I'm here to protect the rights of those people as well. The rights of cultural practitioners who maybe in some senses cannot access the mountain because of its current state. And now, I've been up there for the majority of the time, since the very beginning, before we started counting days. And, and I know for a fact that we have held ourselves in the highest standard in Kapu Aloha. And am I going to deny that there have been absolutely no incidents on that mount mountain? Absolutely not. I'm sure there have been some. Um, but in, in many of the things that we have been accused of, I will, I will stand firm and say that that is absolutely false. Majority of it is a blatant lie. And in even many of the truths, there is only some truth in that. I have not seen any full truths in any of the, in any of the allegations made against us. And, and I know that the media and, and the state obviously wants to sensationalize the pohaku in the road. And I will mention how he uhani poka pohaku. And we don't know what those people heard from those rocks. And, and I understand this, this, this thought that it, it, it posed a threat to public safety. I do not believe that any of those individuals did it with that intent. Again, it was a reaction to what was happening on the mountain. That we needed to protect Mauna Wakea from further desecration. And so, I know my time's up. Um, Again, irresponsible. It's, it's an attack against us for really doing the job that the state is funded and paid to do themselves. So let's work together. Help us out, because we're trying to help you guys out. We're not here to make you guys the enemy. Um, we know that the rule hasn't been accepted yet, and I hope that you know at the end of the day we do not accept it. But let's work together. Um, last thing, I've been arrested twice for protecting Mauna Wakia. And my last arrest happened on June 24th, and I was, as I was being carried away by four Dillano officers, I noticed on the side, mm. That's what we're doing. That's all we're doing. And the day that we know Mauna Wakea is safe from further desecration, then we don't have to worry about this little camping thing. And any law that wants to be passed, you know, you guys got to do what you got to do, we're going to do what we got to do. It will not stop us. Very well. That's the truth. It will not stop us. An unlawful law will not stop us. Everybody here is smart enough to know a joint resolution has no power and authority outside of the boundaries of its territory. You know?
ka mea mea give us the ability and a kanaka e malama o koe ike a koe malama o ike kanaka nui me ke kanaka ike hele ka elema kule ka lua hina me ke kama a moe ke ala a ohe mea nā ne ho opini kia we have access to those at all times so you guys do what you gotta do we're gonna do what we gotta do I hope that we can work together and truly malama pono yahoba i mahalo I was served a notice of trespass by a private security group who has been privately hired by TMT. I, I believe it was June 8th or 9th, a few days before uh, Kamehameha Day. Um, thank you. Um, not to, not trying to extend or go super long, so maybe just a couple minutes, but you mentioned just now wanting to work together. Right. What does that mean to you? First of all, I'll pull, again, like I said, I believe this government, I think many of us believe this government to be unlawful. But, so the question was, that's, does the United States have authority? Yeah, because they're here. Do they have lawful authority? No. But, this is the situation we're in. So work together. Let's, let's start with looking at HRS 711-1107. You know, and, and why is TMT allowed, why are they exempt from that law? If you're going to call placing the rocks in the middle of the road vandalism, that is desecration even a strong enough word for what TMT is going to do? Yeah. So, I think we can work together. First of all, we can look at the laws, we can uphold it. Um, I think we are doing what DLNR is meant to do. And so, um, not here asking for any money, we're going to do it for free. Uh, we're doing it because it's our kuleana. But I think that there's things that you guys can do to help us. When you come and, you, and your officers are in the line, turn around, arrest the other guys. Because we're, again, we're there to prevent desecration. We're not there to obstruct traffic from the very beginning, from the time that we instituted the Allah Safety Checkpoint. We have let every single vehicle through, except for those that told us they are going up there to commit desecration. I have one more question. So the, we've been getting log, got log reports in this set of testimonies, not necessarily with a lot of more information in it. Some of it may be questionable, or as you said, some of it lies, some of it not the whole whole part of, of what may have happened. What is our responsibility, and I mean our Kako, not just us, the LNR, you guys, but what is our responsibility to that situation, and what do you think going forward we all can do together about that? Well, I think we need to fully assess the situation. We need to fully uh, understand, I guess, the accuracy of those claims. Are they true? And if we claim for them to be true, do we have proof of those things being true? Because I can bust out a, a log right now too and, and give all kind of claims and allegations against a certain party. But going forward, I'm put, putting these high, probably mm -hmm. both sides get claims from the past. But yeah. going forward, what can we do? I think there can be better communication. Um, I thought we had decent communication with the park rangers. When a lot of these allegations and these, these documents were made aware to myself, I realized that communication is, is not as good as we thought. Um, so that's the biggest thing. And there is, you know, so-called leadership on the mountain. Whenever there has been issues, we have been addressed. And, and there's videos all over YouTube and Facebook that can show us addressing those situations as soon as they're brought to our attention. Um, and we've been very clear from the very beginning. We are not there as a group. We are simply individuals who know that we have a responsibility to this place, to our history, and to our future. And we're uh, willing and more than happy to awamo that kuleana. Um, so, I think we just need to have, again, better communication. If all of those things were brought to our attention, we would have addressed them, again, if they were true. Um, there, again, there's many things that in there that I would <coughs> say is not true, but all evidence points to us doing everything we can to cooperate fully with the Office of Mauna Kea Manage, Management, the park rangers up there. Um, again, I was under the impression that we had a pretty decent and honest relationship what I've seen doesn't exactly exemplify that, um, but it is what it is. I think we can do better moving forward. And again, because we don't plan to leave until Mauna Wakea is safe. And until that happens, we'll be there. We'll be there with all respect. We'll be there with dignity. We'll be there in Kapu Aloha. Um, but we will not shy away from what the truth is. Mahalo. Right. Mahalo.
My name is Vivi Kalakame Ilehiva. I'm the senior professor and the current director of the Kamakaku Okalami Center for Hawaiian Studies at UH Manoa, where I have taught courses in Hawaiian ancestral knowledge for nearly 30 years. I'm also a native Hawaiian whose ancestors have lived in these islands for the past 100 generations. As such, I am defined by the United Nations as indigenous. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, agreed to by all the countries of the world and signed by President Obama in 2010, ensures the religious rights of indigenous peoples worldwide as basic human rights. Under the United Nations standards, the proposed amendments to Chapter 13, 1-123, Hawaii Administrative Rules, not only contravene basic human rights, but are racist and intended to allow the state of Hawaii to commit cultural genocide. There you go. I refer specifically to Articles 10, 11, 12, and 25 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'll just briefly refer to them. Article 10, Indigenous Peoples shall not be forcibly removed from their lands or territories. Article 11, Indigenous Peoples have the right to participate and revitalize their cultural traditions and customs. This includes the right to maintain, protect, and develop the past, the present, and future manifestations of their cultures, including ceremonies. Article 12, indigenous peoples have the right to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies. The right to maintain, protect, and have access in privacy to their religious and cultural sites. Article 25, Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands. <coughs> Synopsis. The state, that is the state of Hawaii and the government of America, has a duty to support these rights. As an expert on traditional Hawaiian religion, I can unequivocally state that one, Mauna Kea is sacred to the sky father Wa Kea known in English as the Constellation Orion, and is the most important site for the worship of Wakea in all of the Hawaiian Islands. Number two, Wakea is a primordial ancestor of Native Hawaiians. <clears throat> Number three, Native Hawaiians have the right to worship Wakea on Mauna Kea. Number four, Native Hawaiian religious ceremonies frequently were practiced throughout the night. Number five, Native Hawaiians have the right to stay overnight on Mauna Kea to worship Wakea. Number six, Native Hawaiian religious practitioners, known as the protectors of Mauna Kea, have adopted a kapu aloha, a religious law of aloha, toward all those who come onto our sacred mountain. The proposed amendments to chapter 13, when I wrote this testimony and I sent it in to you folks, I didn't know about C1, I also oppose C1. It gives much too much authority without hearing to various peoples without us having, as Hawaiians, a chance to say what we think about any decisions made. Of course, I'm again C2. You know, I'd like to say I agree. We should find a way to talk to one another. So I'd like to give a solution, since I have it's a very nasty testimony and say people ought to resign to say what they say, especially the law. I have a solution. Let's put a campsite. Got the bathrooms there already. We got people willing to take porta potties out there. Let's afford people the space. So hunters can go, the tourists can go, the guys can stay overnight. We have Kaho'okahi saying, he's quite willing to be there with his kapu aloha. And when the rocks went into the road, he made him clean it up. He said, no, 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 that's not what we're saying. We want the kapu aloha. We have to have a space where we can say no to this TMT. If you think it's bad for rocks to be thrown on the road, what about the two acre site that this TMT is going to take? Digging out two stories into the ground and 18 stories above the ground. That's, that's bad for the mountain. Even non-Hawaiians agree. So, I want to say, let's just take a look at that kapu aloha. Let's find a way 
for all of us who are working together to have Allah for each other. I'd like DLNR to have Allah. I want the government to have Allah. I want the Attorney General to have Allah. And not privilege the foreigners of TNT. Because you know, they could have built the TNT on Mount Fuji. I understand there's another two observatories up there already. Questions? Was there 17? I'm 18. Yeah, you're 18. Sorry. Okay. Hello, members of the Board of Land and Natural Resources. Uh, my name is Kiyad Nikola. I'm here to testify in strong opposition to C1 agenda item as well as C2. Because, um, we, my initial testimony only focused in on C2, but I do want to express it and we affirm my strong opposition to C1. Um, my understanding first is these rules are short-sighted, narrow, and extremely restrictive. Uh, furthermore, these <coughs> rules set a very bad and dangerous legal precedent for all other activities that fall under the jurisdiction of the LNR. And we're talking about other activities that could affect other cultural and sacred sites throughout the Hawaiian audience. Second, uh, from an international perspective, the board of land and natural resources will be in direct violations, violation of Articles 10, 11, 12, and 25 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is now customary international law and was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in September of 2007 and later signed by President Obama in 2010. I won't cover those particular articles because Dr. Kamehile Hiba also um, had a general discussion of and um, focused in on those four articles as well. Third, from a federal perspective, the Board of Land and Natural Resources will also be in violation of the Native American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which also includes Native Hawaiians, the right to worship in the matter appropriate of our customs and traditions, including Mauna Kea, our sacred mountain. Finally, from a state viewpoint, the University of Hawaii, who manages and administers Mauna Kea, um, I'm really, I'm extremely concerned with their blatant disregard and lack of respect of the host culture, especially when there's formal executive policies relating to so-called their respect for the host culture and seeing that they're trying to become a model indigenous serving institution as well as a Hawaiian place of learning. Why are their own executive policies being uh, contradicted? And Native Hawaiians um, who are continuing to assert our right to sovereignty and self-determination. And my conclusion is that they're just concerned about the money. Um, this $1.4 billion corporate project like TNT could it be that the contracts have been signed to build and construct the TNT? And I just want to state that it's without our free, prior, and informed consent of Native Hawaiians. As the Native people of this land, we, have, we really have had enough of these uh, continued misuse and abuse of our lands, resources, and especially in this case, Mauna Kea. However, it has galvanized our people. Um, we continue to stand in solidarity all islands, Native Hawaiians, and you know, one of the things that I do want to say in closing is that the Hawaiians are, are rising up. The Hawaiian nation is emerging, and, and it's because of these continued um, mis misuse and abuse of our lands. Based on these reasons, I humbly ask that you reject these proposed amendments to Chapter 13, 123 of the Hawaiian Administrative Rules as well as that was in agenda item two, and also um, to oppose um, C1 as well. Aloha aina, ku kia i mauna. Ku kia i mauna. Aloha aina. I strongly oppose item C1, delegating authority 
performance and action to just one person um, without our consultation. Um, second, I'm offended and disappointed in the Department of Land and Natural Resources in the illegal state of Hawaii proposing to adopt any emergency rules which intentionally, intentionally seek to limit access to those protecting and engaging in their cultural practices around the camp. Hence, I strongly urge you to not approve the adoption for the following reason. First, the illegal state's attempt to limit, na to limit Native Hawaiian right to care, to care for the land, not to protest, to care for ceded land, or to observe cultural practices in a sacred space violate the spirit of the 1993 Apology Resolution and rights guaranteed to Native Hawaiians under Article 12, Section 7 of the Hawaii Constitution. Protecting Mauna Kea and holding it in reverence of the sacred spiritual realm are traditional and, cu and customary practices that are constitutionally protected. It is clear that adopting the emergency rule rules would prevent Native Hawaiians from engaging in their customary practices, especially in a safe manner. So this, this rule, creates public safety issues, not the protectors who are on Mauna Kea. Further, we need to stay up there 24 hours, like Kahoka'i said, to protect our sacred space, because we cannot trust the state that they won't desecrate between the hours of 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Second, the illegal state lacks documentation of imminent and serious threats to public safety and natural resources consequent to camping alongside the summit access roads. Campers have rather sought to exercise significant constitutional and due process rights re relating to the First Amendment and the right to assembly. DLNR's proposed arbitrary declaration of public safety is a thin and illegal veil for its primary purpose in dispersing people working to protect a place sacred to Native Hawaiians in accordance with HRS 711-1107 on desecration and U.S. Public Law 95-341, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which includes Native Hawaiians. Third, the illegal state of Hawaii has been quoted in the media as saying that they have respect and aloha for all in Hawaii around the issue of Mauna Kea. Let it be clear that there is nothing respect respectful about intentionally desecrating a sacred space and preventing peaceful protectors from protecting that sanctity. Further, aloha is a reciprocal an interdependent process of nourishing and caring for one another. The proposed emergency rules do anything but show aloha for the land, aloha for Mauna Kea, and for those who are protecting the mountain. Instead, these rules only seek to silence important voices and violate constitutional rights. This is a disgrace. Finally, this is, the board, this is the board of the Department of Land and Natural Resources whose mission is to protect our environment. How does limiting access to folks who are protecting our natural resources support that mission? So actually, I think what we need is for all of us, including the board, to go up and do the job that those protectors are doing for free right now. And we should be able to take our tents, right? So that we are safe. And so that we can take care of the place that we have a mission to do. With all I said, I oppose the two items. Mahalo. Mahalo. Aloha. Uh, my name is uh, Aloha. Uh, some of you know me and know how much I hate coming here. And I've kind of already uh, addressed to you as far as your legality and having anything to do with my Aina, with my future, my children's future. Uh, I've been up on the Mauna for 21 nights. I've watched it kind of grow. I've seen, I've seen young, the younger generation stepping up and grasping, giving them some kind of future, some kind of hope of our direction, on which way we're gonna take this far because we're all in it together. The way that you guys are gonna go, we're gonna end up with everybody homeless, sitting by a garbage can, trying to find a piece of food. The way that we're going, we're thinking of our future generations. We're thinking how we take care of each other, how we malama our water, our future. We have land to be growing our own food, not being brought in. So with this group that's been up there, they've been doing it not because they want to be somebody or be out in the thing. It's because it's like me. Kuyana, yeah? 
We're thinking about our island, thinking about our future, and we don't need to have you erasing us like a mistake that should never be there. I ask you to please honor and respect, but also think, you guys do not have any meets and bounds. You have no treaty of annexation. So again, let this sink into you, yeah? You want to be a continuance of genocide, culture side, and social side? Or would you like to kind of hui in so we can work together? Kuka kuka, yeah? There's a direction that we can take it, but not pumping head to head. Since you guys got the guns, all we have is aloha. Mahalo. <laughs> Nakamura, number 21. <coughs> Sorry, I apologize in advance for the I'm about to say I was saying. Sorry, can you repeat your name, please? My name is Haki Nakamura. I speak on behalf of my Ohana and the Kuwai no Wamanalo and I post C1 and C2 of today's agenda. The reason for this emergency rulemaking is complete bogus protect from imminent peril of public safety, health, and natural resources. Office of Monitor Management stated that since 2002, an average of 270 visitors use restricted area, your restricted area, compared to the average of 20 protectors that has been there the last 100 days. I work with numbers every day, and I promise you, 270 is a lot more than 20. Public health was only a concern when the water was shut off, bathrooms was closed, Fines were threatened to be used against the protectors for bringing portable toilets. Not just for themselves, but for visitors also. And if any of you guys went up there, they would have let you use it. <clears throat> so public health was an issue. It only became an issue this last week because of people in office with no heart but deep pockets. Public safety wasn't an issue. Um, oh, no, it was an issue when an uh, officer ran over a legal advisor's foot two weeks ago without checking on it. Or maybe when another vehicle sideswiped the protector and left without checking him while he was going out to pull it. If you ask me, the safety issue isn't the protectors. To me, that sounds completely backwards. Common police and the our employees on the mound have said on record that they themselves are proud of the way the protectors have conducted themselves through Aloha or in a couple of Aloha. So law enforcement safety and the public safety should carry no weight. Unless you have evidence of the protectors harming anyone in any way. Last but not least, natural resources in peril. It's annoying how stupid you think we are. You either think we're stupid, or you guys are straight up a corrupt government from top to bottom. I actually think it might be both, but how can you sit there and say Mauna Kea is a conservation area, and the average of 20 protectors is a threat to the land and natural resources, when you folks continue to defend and you guys have approved the TMP construction. What angers me is how much testimony and public input from the people today won't matter because we all know you guys already made up your mind. Rarely ever these emergency rules are made like the Ahu Alaka Kaneone Bay ban of liquor for that three-day weekend. There's documented ev evidence of public safety due to liquor, um, including the fights and death. Understandable why emergency rule would be made. However, the only documented injuries the last hundred days on the Mauna, at least I know of, were the two protectors who were ran over and left there. I'm sure you guys already know how you're moving forward, but know this, Aloha Aina will move forward, no matter what the border lies of natural resources decide. Once again, my name is Apaki Nakamura, and I oppose C1 and C2 of today's agenda. Mahalo. Mahalo. In regards to what I said earlier, I myself have been up on the mountain for at least 14 days. After the past arrest, I was up there for seven days. Um, 
All of these negative things have been said, they're the negative things that have been said. I don't think anyone mentioned how children are almost ran over, it doesn't matter who's up there. That road is not safe for anyone to be up there because of cars and anything like that. If anyone's on the road and a car's coming down and brakes fail, that is a safety issue. It doesn't matter if someone's in the road or not because you don't know when someone's gonna cross the road. There's a crosswalk there. Another thing is that there was a pregnant woman there the day that the pro protectors brought up Lua, about an hour before the Lua arrived. There are people in the visitor center and she asked, a woman from India, pregnant, obviously pregnant with a young child, she humbly asked if she could use the restroom and they said no. They turned her away. Instead, she had to go and use the restroom under my money. That, I think, is more of a safety issue and that is kupono ole. I'm sure if anyone has ever been around a pregnant woman, and we all come from pregnant women, that that is hepa, law. People getting run over is definitely a safety issue. I was there when Mikey got run over. None of you have any authority to say that rocks being moved, by the way, I was also there when certain rocks were moved, not every rock, but they did speak to every uhane. Actually, the uhane of the rock spoke to them, Ew. and they wanted to be there. It's a biohazard to not have lua up there. And all of these entities decided to not have lua up there. Whether protectors are there or not, there are still tourists that come up every single day. And since the day of the arrest, in July, there have been visitors there. And the visitors there have been informed. And the visitors there are outraged. And the visitors there look for the bathroom, even though the visitor center is closed, because you go somewhere you think there's a restroom. And there's not. And I am totally outraged that these things were issued to Konalua and Hamakua Joe because they were taking care of this biohazard, which you are not. You are not taking care of this biohazard. What are you going to do about urine and feces from all over the world? Don't, isn't that why we have public restrooms in an airport? That's a huge issue. Is science greater than culture or religion? Okay, so I have two questions. First, C1 and C2 I have posed. The first question I have is for you, um, Chairman. So, I read the Gilo Tribune today, which states that in a July 1st email to the Hawaii Attorney General Douglas Chin, Suzanne Case, Chair of State Department of Land Natural Resources, thanks Chin for the clear delineation of options he laid out the day before and outlined several options for moving forward. Quote, file a board submittal for the July 10th meeting authorizing a DLNR representative to conduct temporary closures and restrictions in public hunting areas statewide. Parentheses, i.e. not specific to Mount Kiel, close parentheses. As the next step in implementing the amended hunting rules that were just finalized, close quote, she said, she wrote, um, Chairwoman, can you please verify that these quotes are indeed yours? Can you, can you <coughs> summarize your testimony? Can you please verify or not? This is your opportunity to testify. Okay, so if this is indeed your quote, I am humbly asking you that you resign your position at this time because you have not brought this up to any of our attention and we've been here since one o'clock. Board, can you please find out or ask her because this is not right. If she will not answer that, then why are we here? Also, question two. A CIA is integral to an EIS. I know that there's no EIS in question, but this is a DLNR issue, so it's always an EIS. So it's also a CIA. So my question is, who is here on the DLNR to contest on my behalf, to listen to my and all of the issues on religion, among Awakia and our cultural living, not practicing, it's alive, cultural living on Mauna Kea, and what is the qualification in regards to Mauna Kea? In regards to hours of access, practice, length of time, where on the mountain, and what I need, and how important it is to my culture and religion, and why do I need a permit to live in a Hawaiian, in a Hawaiian mountain? Does this balance that we're talking about between science and culture, does that happen at the Vatican? Does that happen on Mount Shasta? Does that happen on Mount Fuji? I don't, 
I would really like to know who on the board has this qualification. Because if not, you are violating our rules by even listening to us because no one is qualified here. Specifically for Mauna Kea. I totally, humbly mahalo you. I think the guy that was here earlier has that qualification. But I don't think that any of you here have that qualification. And I say this humbly. Mahalo. Please find a way before you make this decision to figure out if you are totally in this regular jurisdiction to make rules for Hawaiians practicing, not even practicing, living in a Hawaiian way and our rights. Mahalo. Thank you. Number 23, Scotty Kaiba. My name is Scotty Kaiba and I'm the Chief Ranger for the Office of Monarchy and Management. Good afternoon, Chair Case and members of the board. I am here today to, to in support of the proposed emergency rules for Chapter 13-123-21.1 and to ask for your help to regain the order of control in Maakea. I have submitted written testimony and a summary of ranger observations and interactions with the protesters of Maakea. I will be presenting a consent uh, condensed version of both for you at this at this time this afternoon on three focus areas. The first is safety. On June 24th, the protesters blocked the road with rocks and huge boulders and human chains trapping workers on the summit. The second focus is resource management. Use of open flames present a huge threat of wildland fires to the surrounding critical palila habitat. Third, social impact. Workers of Mauna Kea feel threatened and don't want to report to work. We have lost two highly qualified rangers since the encampment on Mauna Kea. And this has created a and this has also created a problem for us to recruit qualified members. I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak before you today. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them as best as I can. I have one question. Yes. You folks don't have any police power. No, we don't. Uh, has there been discussion about that? Yes, there has been. And um, what's your manau? I don't want to put you on the spot. You're not, you're not. Other guys above you, you're you. not, you're not. Okay. And I, I'm speaking for myself yeah. and, okay. and my guys. That's sure. what I'm here for. I'm here for everyone. I'm here for everyone's safety. Yeah. It's our responsibility, and I take that very deeply, to ensure everyone who goes up, goes up safely and comes down safely. And we're in the process, we we're in the process of creating rules prior to the contested case hearing. We are, we are stopped. So with that being over with, we're in the process again of formulating rules and depend, and my feeling is depending on the type of rules that gets approved would depend on the type of enforcement powers needed by the Rangers. What are some examples of what you can do? I'm sorry? What are some examples of what kind of powers would be, be considered? Again, law enforcement powers. Thank you, Chairman. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Number 24, Robert McLaren. Hello, Bob, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is Bob McLaren, the Associate Director of the Institute for Astronomy. I've been involved in astronomy on one occasion, one way or another, for nearly 35 years. I've given you a written testimony describing my experiences on the period of July, excuse me, June 24th through 26th, and I'll just summarize the, what I think are the most salient points. Uh, by midday on June 24th, the TNT construction crew had abandoned their attempt to reach the site, primarily because of the presence of large, three or four large rock barriers across the road. The, the, the construction workers had basically left the mountain by that point. 
Early in the afternoon, a group of protesters created a new roadblock at the beginning of the gravel road. This group was stopping vehicles and asking the occupants about their purpose in traveling to the mountain. Some were allowed to pass, some were not. Two staff members of the James Clark Maxwell Telescope were allowed to pass after explaining that there was urgent work they needed to do with the telescope. They were seated up the gravel road, but were then stopped by a second group of protesters at the rock barriers. This group, this group told them they are not allowing any observatory vehicles to pass and that they could blame their predicament on TMT. The JCMT staff returned um, and left the mountain. Now, while some were being blocked from going up, others were being blocked from coming down. That's a far more serious situation. One of these was a ranger. Another was a group of four researchers who had been doing field work in connection with their study of permafrost on the mountain. This group was stopped, the rock barriers coming down. The protesters helped them remove some of the rocks, but actually the final two barriers, the group had to remove them themselves. This reckless action by the protesters could have really had tragic consequences if there had been an accident or a medical emergency about that area. But they didn't stop there. TNT had left. But nonetheless, they decided to uh, continue their activity and block all traffic. They decided to hold everyone hostage to their anti-TMT objectives. Later, when Monarchy Observatory Support Services tried to mobilize heavily, heavy equipment to clear the hazards from the road, the protesters at Holly Pahaku refused to let the equipment move uphill. Seeing no way to provide safe passage above Holly Pahaku, an accommodation was reached with the protesters in which the rangers would block the road to all traffic after ensuring that everyone was off the mountain. In long disclosure, most of the observatories lost a night of observing and suffered other losses, which you'll hear about in their testimony later. A condition of the deal was that the protesters would be allowed to remove the rock barriers by themselves, with no assistance uh, desired from UH. Following morning, in fact, they did that uh, after a brief a brief inspection by a group of us from UH. That, uh, okay. <coughs> I just mentioned that on Friday morning there was a scare and the protesters returned and put more rocks on the road. Thank you. Okay, uh, number 25, Lewis, no last name. The United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 12 states, Indigenous people have the right to maintain, protect, and have access in privacy to the religious and cultural sites. With that said, to the Board of Land and Natural Resources, I do not agree with these emergencies. I sit um, with I to sit there and call our Kiai campers is an insult. It is a travesty. Do you think we would be up there day in and day out, sacrificing jobs, precious time with our ohana and our everyday lives if we didn't think that there was a greater goal? When the proposed construction of the 30 meter telescope is over, when all the telescopes are gone, and when the aina can rest and revive, our people will leave and the mountain will be at peace as it should be. I still do not think that the state of Hawaii, Governor Ige, or the University of Hawaii understand. Governor Ige even stated, and I quote, in many ways we have failed the mountain, yet you continue the approval of desecration. We have seen the lack of stewardship by UH, we have seen the Department of Land and Natural Resources turning on their mission. We have seen the misuse and mismanagement of Mauna Kea, and we have seen the consumption of money and greed corrupt the connection to this land. I see no means or rationale for these emergency rules. They are himyakole. There will be no TNT and there will be no compromise. Number 26, come up a few minutes. Number 27, my money. Number 27, my money. 
always would depend on the mountain. If it wasn't for the mountain, we would never have the water. And that's why it's so important to all of us. I just say they to bring out the new law. Yeah, it's easy for you to bring out the new law. Stop the toilet, stop the water, and they will bring them down. It's fine, you can know all safety. At the same time, stop that convoy from going up the mountain. I don't know why, but even all these kids that know the law. All I know is that it's not right, and I'm a fisherman. And I depend on the mountain. I depend on the clouds. You know why they put in that 30 by 30 up there? Because we're above the clouds. You know, I, our coupons knew what we had. I was still with you there when it was given. Well, that's not desecrate what we had. Uh, Molly, the time. Thank you. Number 29, Don Ariel. Okay, I'll just, uh, Aloha Chair, uh, and members of the Board of Land and Natural Resources. Uh, those in here, Wahana friends, personal and professional Aloha. Uh, I'm Don Avial, Native Hawaiian hunter, fisherman, uh, public access uh, advocate, and cultural practitioner. Uh, I may disagree with some earlier speakers here, and I love what they stand for, but I believe this is an esteemed body that represents our community, our island community, uh, whom I have great uh, respect for all. Uh, my classmate, um, my culture and language practitioner, uh, Rupal Kua, ranch man, yourself, protector of our watersheds and conservation land, great Hawaiian waterman, our Kilkaha Hiva icon, and longtime public servants for Hawaii Island and Kauai. I speak on behalf of my Ohana friends who are hunters and gatherers. There wasn't much public notice or understanding regarding these items. Uh, it is in my view and all here supporting the Mana that this action before you today is an unwarranted attempt to target and possibly an exclusionary action for Native Hawaiian practitioners, cultural practitioners, and protectors. Uh, in furtherance to prohibit their constitutionally protected activities under the U.S. Constitution, as well as the State of Hawaii Constitution. Thus I implore this august body to reject this agenda item and give reference to such actions now and in the future. As board member Hoy says, there are regula regulations already. In fact, even sections 209, who uh, board member Woodside was in the Natural Air Research Commission, um, that these actions would hurt hunters and the general public. And I have the same concerns, especially, specifically sections 13, that's 122, 123, and 124. Um, and as he said, temporary closure of the public hunting areas on in, in all of these regulations would be something that would even go further for a year or so, even at this 120 days uh, temporary um, request at this time. And I do have a, a, a lot of um, deference to the delegating authority to delegates uh, a rep DNR representative to arbitrarily have this authority to do, uh, take action under the C1 item. And then also in section 124, which is um, the Palila bird up there, um, which may be part of the environmental concern. Um, and this is not a, the bird is not um, extinct because of the actions of the protectors of the Mauna. Is more so because of the extension of much of our Momani trees. And it's already stated in the, the DLNR website um, that, the, um, that deals with the Palila bird that the last of these honey creepers and why they are in danger. So they give several reasons, which I won't go over. Moreover, understanding this, these agenda items and its implications to Native Hawaiians and members of the public, this board has a fiduciary kuriana for seated public trust lands that hold paramount importance to not only Native Hawaiians but to the general public. If this item is passed, it will revoke trust in the department, and I'll summarize. Its policies, processes, purposes, and ultimately, the board, the director, the chair, and the governor of Hawaii. As President Lincoln once said at the Memorial of the Civil War battle, and which I have believed is the foundation of our government after the Civil War, 
that we here highly resolve that these dead should not have died in vain, which my kupuna that means, I say, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So again, I call the, this board, the government and all entities involved, to negotiate and make this issue, as Uncle Stan said, Kono, so that our Ainukan community, including Native Hawaiian community, to heal and move on. Mahalo for the talk. Let me testify. Okay, Mahalo. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to, I'm trying to understand and see if, we're, if there's a way to take care of specifically hunting issues. So I wanted to try to understand what you see as a problem for hunting. Well, like uh, board member Boy said, you know, much of the, like the paved roads along the uh, Mauna Kea access or the Hunter Road, uh, which was closed in 2014, much of us still go along those uh, those roadways, which are, you know, they're, they're not, um, they're overgrown a little bit, but they're still able to walk on those trails. Uh, a lot of us just do hiking you know, most of the time, and they're near the access road. So, um, you know, if we're wearing backpacks, camping gear, you know, a lot of us have to have our camping gears, you know. Might not be for an overnight stay, but a lot of it is because we're, you know, it's past the time that, um, that is, um, proposed in this new rule, too, in the 21-2. Um, I have a problem, too, because sometimes we do stay out late, maybe even past 12 a.m., and then we make it back to our, uh, you know, down the hill to wherever our vehicles are. So um, a lot of times it's, um, you know, get, get caught up with the uh, mama, and, um, you know, we sometimes forget we're hunting, and then we look up and we see all this beautiful uh, scenery up in the sky. So. You know, as Hawaiians, we, you know, we are very spiritual, we see a lot of things, so that's one of the reasons why um, I feel, you know, we might, we might get into trouble just being, being there, uh, maybe in the wrong place, wrong time. Okay, so, but, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, I'm just trying to understand what the situation is. Um, hunting is allowed until 30 minutes after sunset and from 30 minutes before sunrise. And the, the time, the closure time, would be 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Right, and uh, before this, before it came to, to today's yeah, so uh, hearing. It, it was different. Yeah, it was so it's, so it's, it's, it's better. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that, that I was yeah. changed. So um, mm -hmm. that was the, um, when I made the, my testimony, that, that was I was concerned about that at the time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have one question. Yeah. I used to go hunting up there in another life. And uh, sometimes you forget the time. So let's say you're, let's say you're close to the time of, of uh, closed down. In other words, you're close to 10 o'clock because you, either you lost your way or you lost your dog. You know what I mean? We have we have played that we lost our dog. And so we try to find our dog and we don't know where your dog went. And you hear them barking sometimes they're chasing something big or whatever. So uh, what if we have a grace period if you made a good faith effort to come out and you're a little bit late? Well, I mean uh I'm not sure how that would be. You know, I don't either. I mean, it, would be, it, it would be a it nice just thing to me, yeah. but that there, there's some grace period if you're in there in, in uh, a kind of good faith, you, you're going hunting and you, something happens, you have an emergency for whatever, right. you know, and uh, you're a little late, and you can show that, and that should be adequate. Yeah, if the officer or, you know, whoever is going to. Right. Um, Penalize us, I believe that they're, well, they're trained to, to do that. They've got to investigate and see if, you know, the facts. Right. right. I mean, if they take into account of what happened. You know, sometimes, too, we're just, um, the air is thin up there, too, where, you know, we're poop. we don't go as fast up, up there as we would do down at a lower elevation. So, yes. Some people get lost in the market, we never find them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Can you name along? Um, I'm on C229, so I think they gave us yeah. the same number. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not on the same sheet, then what's your name? Kai Perry. Um, I talked to a crew up in the front. She said to make sure I got this. Sorry, can you guys... 
Conversation with Hawaiian people, with people who love the land, then we have to be conscious about what we're doing here. Passing a rule designed to criminalize people who are conscious is inappropriate and is hurtful. And I know, I know from going to school with Doug, talking with Billy Kenoi talking with the brothers up on the mountain and the rangers, I know people are conscious. The brother over here told us, rangers are quitting. I talked to them. We know why they quit. Because they have a conscience. Because they cannot sit and watch this continue desecration and have to deal with their own family, with people who have conviction. That's why they quit. I heard from some law enforcement guys, they felt embarrassed because they were crying when they had to arrest their own people. That's not embarrassing. That's something we should all be proud of and learn from. Those men who are up there trying to enforce the law are conscious men. They have conviction. They're learning. That's what consciousness is all about. It's not about how can we never do something 10 years ago. It's about once we learn what's important, once we understand what aloha means, we have to take action and be conscious. We cannot ignore anymore the falsities of everything that's gone on before. So I ask you folks to please act with consciousness. Act with aloha. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Number 30, can you along? Aloha, my name is Joshua Noma, number 30. There was a switch outside. I have the paper right here. Josh, what's your name again? Joshua Noma. Noma. Noma, N-O-G-A. I live in the Ahupua Paula, the Moko Kola Um I am here in opposition to C1 and C2. Um, I spent a week on the Mauna when he uh, went to head on, July, on June 24th. Um, spending, I, I know why this, uh, these emergency rules are come out. It's meant to criminalize the protectors on the Mauna uh, in regards to a strategy that they want them out there so that they can send the TMT workers and, uh, up there um, early enough. Um, by doing this, they can criminalize them um, in the media, in public perception, make them look like troublemakers, hazardous uh, to the environment, um, which is uh, simply untrue. Uh, we have a sick disease going on here in the fake state of Hawaii where we have our politicians 
are in the pockets of big business developers. And I'll give you one example right here. To my left here, we have our Hawaii Attorney General, uh, Douglas Chin, um, who was a managing partner for law firm Parsmith uh, Ball, who's representing the University of Hawaii and TNT. Now, he's the Hawaii Attorney General, but he's sitting here for almost three hours. What kind of message does that send? He gave a testimony um, in favor of these rules. But I'm a little worried in regards to what kind of message that sends to, to our people as a whole. When we have somebody in such a high position of power who is uh, able to use that power, wield that power, um, speak for almost an hour, even before any of us can testify and then continue to sit in here. I'm sure there are way more things that he can be doing, he should be doing, rather than sitting in here and listening to um, these silly emergency rules, you know? And it's, I got no pretty kill with, um, you know, because Attorney General, but what kind of message does that send? You know, when, when Ige talks about failing, uh, failing the mountain, uh, failing the Hawaiian people, it's absolutely true. And this attempt and these rules to criminalize the very people who take it upon themselves um, and really um, going against possibly losing their jobs, supporting for their families so that they can go up there um, and to criminalize them like this when they're up there holding vigil is just reckless, irresponsible, um, and it only goes to further point to the sickness that I talked about in regards to um, businesses, politicians, um, some like an attorney general who's in the pockets of these people like TMT who are able to, while we have these things in case, sure, um, while we have uh, this in Supreme Court, TMT is allowed so-called permit to, to resume this. So I think this is irresponsible. This is just an opportunity to criminalize our protectors. Uh, Kuki Aimona. Mahalo. Thank you. Uh, number 31, Andre Perez. Hello, my couple. Hello, Andre Perez. No call, no call, no Um, I just want to point out there's a problem going on even with this meeting. We're all getting parking tickets out there. So if you come off the mountain, the struggle and the, and, and the things that we have to endure, we have to come to this meeting and get a $40 parking ticket. I'm not the only one. Many people are getting tickets out there. And your parking attendant is standing by outside waiting to ticket people as the time expires. I think that's a problem that you guys should address. Also, I want to point out that um, in addition to all this Hawaiian suppression that's going on on the mountain, we also have OEV TV who's been barred from this meeting, but there's other media going on right now that's filming this inside this room. So I don't think that's fair to OEV TV, a Hawaiian-owned um, media business. Yeah. Okay, um, I absolutely oppose the rulemaking. Um, I want that to stand for the record. Um, when the United States invaded and bombed Iraq, one of the things, the first things they did was they targeted sanitation facilities. They bombed the water facilities. And in principle, that's what's happening on the mountain in response to Hawaiians protecting the mountain right now. They've shut off the water. They've locked the, the sanitation facilities. And so they're trying to starve us off the mountain. Yeah? There can be no doubt that these actions and rules are designed to purposefully suppress and marginalize Kanaka Maori, criminalize us, and starve us off our own mountain. Um, I believe that these are fundamentally human rights issues and self-determination issues. Are Hawaiians human beings? Do we have the right to say we don't want this on our land? Is this Hawaiian land? Does anybody question that? Does anybody think this is not Hawaiian land, that we don't have Kuleana to this land as Aboriginal people? I believe we have a clear human rights self-determination issue going on right now. And I see how, in principle, fundamentally, we're being targeted as hazards and health issues to public safety. I think it's a very bad move on the state and Hawaiians the Hawaiian community would not forgive and, for, and forget this for a very long time. There's no question that we have an issue, ongoing, long-standing issue of 
redress and reconciliation between Kanaka Maoli in the United States, state of Hawaii, as outlined in the apology bill. So we have to have sensitivity to that as well. Um, we, summarize. I'm summarizing. Um, we believe that these, these types of rules, desecration, will result in harm to the deeply held religious beliefs and cultural values of Hawaiian people. And as a result of this failure of the administration process, because we know it's still in court right now. You all know that. It's still in court right now, yet they're, they're still trying to build the TMT while the issue's still in court. As a result of the failure of this administration process, we believe that further desecration is imminent. And we're compelled to occupy and to protect Mauna Kea as a people, as human beings who love and have a strong relationship with our land. Desecration of Mauna Kea and suppression of Hawaiians on the mountain will be a moral outrage to Hawaiians and to the greater community. In closing, I just want to say that civil disobedience is based on moral political principle. America is a country that's founded on civil disobedience. From the Boston Tea Party, anti-war movements, women's suffrage, abolition of slavery, labor laws and unions, civil rights movements, anti-nuclear war movements, uh, environmental and forest protection movements are all part of civil disobedience. <coughs> and if these rules are passed, there can be no question. There will be mass coordinated civil disobedience on Mauna Kea to break these rules based on moral and political principle. I think it would be a disaster to pass these rules. It will only exacerbate the situation. Um, Hawaiian community has welcomed settlers with nothing but aloha to even our own detriment. We're not hazardous or dangerous to the community or to our land. Mahalo. Number 32, Noe Lopez. of the, the person who had this number. My name is Malia Kuragawa. I'm from the island of Hawaii. I'm an assistant professor of law with the William S. Richardson School of Law and Hawaii Nuiakea School of Hawaiian Knowledge. I make this testimony in opposition to C1 and C2 provisions. I submit this letter in opposition for many reasons. Um, first, I concur with Professor Williamson Chang about violations of constitutionally protected First Amendment rights to free speech and assembly. Um, it's a veiled attempt to propose among monarchy of protectors from exercising their rights. Um, I'm also very concerned about the circumvention and violation of the public's constitutionally protected Fifth Amendment right of due process. One, I received this revised rules about two or three hours ago. The Sunshine Law, Chapter 91, um, basically requires notice one week prior. So this is against your own rules. And I know these rules very well, not just because I'm an attorney, but also because I've sat on a number of boards and commissions on a state and county level. Chair of the Island Girl Council of Molokai, Chair of the Molokai Planning Commission, and most recently a member of the State Environmental Council. So this, this body is in violation of Chapter 91. There were also um, links that did not um, lead to any of these rules. So there's a question of whether um, the public was adequately noticed. So that is something that is very troublesome to me. Um, additionally, provision C1, which would grant um, executive power to um, DLNR chairperson case uh, to close off hunting grounds without benefit of a public hearing is also a violation of the Sunshine Law and a violation of due process rights guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. Um, I, I'm also daughter of a hunter, sister of a hunter, um, 
we eat deer meat. It is our subsistence lifestyle. Um, to have closures for six months would be a very, um, it would be, it would be something that would affect our ability to subsist. And those are also constitutionally protected under Article 12, Section 7 of the Hawaii State Constitution and Hawaii Revised Statute, Section 1-1. Um, so I'm concerned about the hunting issues as well. Um, Molokai, we have two economies, and a subsistence economy and a cash economy. So to deny our families of deer meat, vet, venison, goat, and pig uh, would deny us from having food on our table. So this is important. Uh, the religious and ceremonial and cultural practices, yes, um, violate Article 12, Section 7, HRS 1-1 and 7-1. 7-1 also protects the trails. Um, this is originally the 1850 Kuleana Act, which used to require permission of the chiefs or the landlords. <coughs> because there was testimony by Hoa Aina of being blocked access and being unable to gather the things they needed for their daily life. The Kuleana Act was amended to not allow, uh, to not have that permission provision. And that is the law that stands on the books as HRS 7-1. So to limit and restrict by providing certain time um, for people to go along this trail is illegal and violates the state constitution as well as a public trust provision which includes Native Hawaiian practice and the rights and the resources that are associated with those rights and practices. So to, to limit access along the Monokia Road would be a violation. The office, I'm not done, I'm almost done. The office of Monokia, the state office that manages Monokia on their website identifies the summit access road as the trail that people will walk upon. There are other ancient trails that have been overgrown and they say it's unsafe. So that's the only place that they can access. So that road needs to stay open at all times so that religious and ceremonial, ceremonial practices can take place. The fact that you are singling out Native Hawaiians uh, who are the protectors of the Mauna and exercising kapua law is and calling them vandals instead of protectors, making their religious pilgrimage, it bothers me, especially because you guys are aware that two protectors were hit by vehicles operated by TMT security personnel. And nothing was done to ensure their safety, nothing was done to investigate, nothing was done to prosecute. Can you wrap up your comments? That's, the, that's my last comment. So if you want to protect safety, public safety, do that first. Thank you. Mahalo. Number 33, David Lopez. Oh, wait. stuff everybody was talking. I don't know nothing. But I just went Kanaka from Nanakuli Homestead. Nanakuli Homestead or DHHL don't represent me. I represent myself. I've learned the truth. I've learned the truth all my life. You all been hitting it from us. No treaty. My children go to Olelo. They, they, they love Olelo. They come home and teach me because I don't know nothing. I was deprived. The Mauna call. Something inside <coughs> my, my gut tell me, go. There's something. I go. Hey. I go two times. First time. Oh, honey, come. 
sleep on the mountain. Your people come visit you through the night. Your family gonna come talk to you. Spiritually, you will awaken. You will awaken. We're still here. We cannot come. We're still here. Please, don't pass through. Imagine, I just nobody who just woke awoke. There's more of me. There's more of me out there who will be awoke, awakened. I will awake them. I will go back to my people, our people. Or if you call them your people, do something for our people. Don't oh, just talk, spin us. My brother got banged up on the mountain. I was there. Do you care? No, you care. You like make all these rules. Why? Because my brother got banged? Did you do anything? Nothing. Not even turn around, stop and help him. Quiet. Everybody quiet. Yeah. Feel something. Feel. Feel what we feel. Ha. Ah. No. Kapu. No. We will be there. Rest of my life, I will be here. I will teach my grandchildren. I have 19 grandchildren. I will teach them to be there and defend that mountain. That mountain who created us. That is my level. That is my creator, my creation. I am learning. I am a young child, but I am old. But I'm still a young child because I'm learning. Thank you guys for waking me. I will tell my, our people that I have what going on. You do not have a treaty. Remember that. It will always be there in front of you, in back of you, in the side of you, forever. The queen has fight the fight, fight the, the battle. All we want is the right thing for our people. Please. Please. Couple of all, it's easy to go to the dark side. See. Couple of all. We have taken Aloha higher. We have taken out Aloha to the sacredness of that mountain. For us, Kanaka, the rock talked to us. You, Kanaka, rock don't talk to you because you are on the wrong side. Kanaka, the rock is all we have. It's all we got is that mountain. It's like the color, trying to take the color from us. Now you like the mountain. You got everything down below. I have holes, everything, you know, you guys do. I started off. Can you wrap it up? Please? I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. Be polite to her, please. And I will be polite. Deeply respect to you and to you, my friend. I love you guys all. May God be with you. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Please forgive me. I forgive you both. May God forgive you. May the Lord give you. For He will judge you for what you do. Aloha no. Aloha no. I will go back to Ramona again and again and again. And I will camp. Okay? Aloha no. Civil rights. It's been fine. The chief. Aloha no. Aloha. Aloha, good afternoon. I'd like to address the board and the attorney general as well. 
my name is Mel McAlton, Covina, Okualani. I am a pro se litigant and a paralegal. At this time, I would like to also hand to this board these documents. Pass it off to your members. Based on what I have here, there's going to be two documents. One is a statement from Monica at TMT. The second document is the Constitution. The Constitution that I have here was from 1895. And it was reproduced in 2000. And then again, well, in, I'm sorry, not 2000, but in 1998. That was the final. And now in 1998, what we have here under the Constitution, if you read it on Article 1, Section 18-3, and it's the rights of access. Under the rights of access, Native Hawaiians and their de descendants shall be allowed free access to the mountains, caves, seas, and sites of religious and cultural importance for personal subsistence, religious, and cultural purposes. This statement alone is in the Constitution of the Hawaii Constitution itself. This was backed up. If we can, TMT report that I gave to you guys, page two, <coughs> I have here, Pelly Defense Fund versus Patty. That's 837 Pacific, 2nd edition, 1247, Hawaii, 1992. And then again, in 517, U.S. Court, 1163, 1996. This was brought down, ladies and gentlemen, for the Supreme Court, 9th District in Washington, D.C. This refers to that Constitution that we just saw. In other words, what's happening here is that the Hawaiians itself has free access to any and all mountains. It doesn't say just one particular mountain. It doesn't say Diamond Head. It says all mountains. Therefore, the restriction is against the people's rights. And when we talk about rights, I am going to go ahead and address the fact that the rights of the people were were actually violated. We're talking about their civil rights, their First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment. I left out the Sixth Amendment. It doesn't really matter. But the First, the Fifth, and the Fourteenth Amendment is very important. And the reason behind that is, it's their civil rights. The violation that was taken by the Department of Land, Natural Resources, and the State Attorney General for them to lock the restrooms is a violation of federal health laws. What you're doing is you're keeping the people from being healthy. You're keeping them from an environment which is inhuman. That is inhuman acts. If you produce any inhuman acts against any human, it is a federal law. Do not, and I repeat, cease and decease from locking those restrooms to anyone publicly because now it becomes a U.S. law. And I am, right now, when I walk out that door, I'm making a phone call <coughs> to two people who are waiting to hear from me in Washington, D.C. They want to know what the outcome is going to be on this. And they want to know what I have to offer. Because whatever I have to offer, when it goes to them, it's going to come to you. Reason? You are an entity of the state. As an entity, you can be sued. The state can't be sued, but the entity that works under the state can. And that is the law. We know that. Now, just for the last part of this, I just want you guys to know, I know each and every one of you at one time has lost somebody in a family, relatives, or whatever. When you lose somebody, you lose them forever. And the whole point behind that is, it's in the heart. When you lose something, you can never get it back. This is the same thing that these people are fighting for. 
Monarchia, when they lose Monarchia, they lose a part of them. You do not want to have these people lose something that is precious to them as much as it is to you people when you lose something. Thank you. you do not want to have that happen to you. Thank you. Do not let it happen to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mahalo. And I will. Excuse me, sir. Can I get a copy of your constitution? I'm sorry? Can I get a copy of your Yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys all Thank have you. a copy of that. Please yeah. be sure to read Telly Fund. Thank you. The defense fund is an actual court case that cited the Constitution on Article 1, right. Section 18-3. Our next, Thank next, you. Our next uh, person is number 35, who is not here at Camelot. In the number 36 is Milton Lewis. Oh, uh, yeah, Mom. My name is Steve Gord. Hello, <laughs> My name is Milton Lewis. I'm the director of the WK Observatory on Monokea. I've worked for the Cape Observatory for 29 years, 26 years on the Big Island, raised my children there, my youngest is born in KL I'm very deeply committed to my community, to Hawaii, and to the well-being of the staff of my observatory. Without question, Monokea is the best site in the world for astronomy, and the observatories that are on top of Mark Hare have had enormous impact on science. So it is with deep concern that I've watched the events of the last nine months unfold. My concern first and foremost is for the well-being and safety of my staff and for everyone who is on the mountain. I'm also very concerned about the impact of shutting down access to our facilities on our ability to carry out our scientific mission. Any blocking of access can be potentially life-threatening. We have had several occasions over the years where we had to take staff off the mountain urgently or visitors. The difference between unimpeded access and even a short delay can make the difference between life and death. This is a very real concern among our staff and that they not be stuck on the mountain, perhaps in dangerous weather conditions or with a sick staff member or a sick member of the public who needs urgent medical attention. We have already lost highly valued observing time in perfect weather conditions due to the recent road blockade in June. This time is competitively assigned to astronomers, and once it's lost, there's no guarantee that they can get a, a access again. My concern is that unpredictable or extended loss of access will significantly reduce our ability to do the cutting-edge science that we are tasked to carry on. We have had to expend significant resources because of the new safety and security concerns. These expenses include a large <coughs> fraction of time of our managers and supervisors in, in planning, coordinating, communicating, changing work schedules, changing transport schedules, hiring additional staff to ensure safety in the event of a confrontation. The ongoing protests and the concerns over safety and long-term access are taking a toll on the morale of my staff. Our staff members are part of the Big Island community and there's now a lot of division among family, friends and neighbors. I am concerned that a prolonged conflict could affect the observatory's ability to retain and affect staff. And these are people and their families who are deeply rooted in the community and make a significant economic and social contribution to society. The long-term impact of uncertain access also extends to our ability to attract funds from federal and other sources. And these funds are essential to keep the observatories alive and vibrant. The Keck telescopes are the two most scientifically productive telescopes on the planet. More broadly, Keck Observatory and myself are concerned about the vibrancy of astronomy on Mauna Kea. Astronomy is a science that seeks to answer the deepest questions about the universe, questions that all humans everywhere have asked since the beginning of time. Astronomy done in Hawaii is something we can and should be proud of. It inspires people, young and old, across the globe. It is the vital contribution from Hawaii to all of humanity. Number 37, the Hello, my name is Stephen Kakalia, uh, resident of Hawaii Island, by some resident. Um, I'm here to testify 
and strong opposition to the proposed emergency rules of Mauna Kea. Um, and to ask that you please reject the request from the Division of Forestry and Wildlife to, to adopt a new rule that would prohibit essential items that may be needed when accessing different areas of the Mauna like you've heard in prior testimony. Um, these proposed changes are said to address impacts on the natural resources and eliminate risk regarding public safety when there really isn't um, any imminent peril to these resources or the safety concerns um, that are being brought about except with the closure of the um, visitor station and, and bathrooms and such. These restrictions would instead infringe upon the, kana the kuleana and rights of Native Hawaiians and other Hawaii <coughs> citizens to access and conduct ceremonies on sacred, on sacred sites. Um, I'm testifying here today as Kalo Kekioka'aina from generations back, like many my kupuna hail from the cardinal points of that moku. Um, I was raised on that island. I raised my children and now grandchildren, specifically on the um, slopes of Mauna Kea on the Hamakua side. We know her intimately as Wahi Kupuna. Um, she is a big part of our life and how we identify to being Native Hawaiian. Um, it's a little difficult to hear that this one-time action of the Kia'i and the stone structures and what they felt that they needed to do at the time um, is considered, considered vandalism and cannot be ignored by the state especially when the sacredness of Wayao was vandalized several years back with no action by the state. And this was rangers watching as um, a young person took stand-up paddleboard into Wayao, walked in the sediment, which include our Pico and our sacred <coughs> tradition, carved his name in the, um, again, in the embankment on a low <coughs> level type. Um, that to me is vandalism. And if the one-time action of protecting a resource cannot be overlooked, why was that? There wasn't any sense of urgency to um, put any sort of ruling together. Um, there was no restitution. There was no, there was nothing done. Nothing was done to the person that did this or their family. No me, he was made with, with that place. So it's really hard to hear some of, some of this stuff. Um, I've worked in the field of education and wellness for Hawaiian communities for well over 20 years, and currently uh, I work for the Department of Native Hawaiian Health. And it's through this department that I learned that social determinants um, directly impact the well-being, which causes health disparities for our Native Hawaiians, none more prevalent than the current situation on our Mauna. Um, it's more than just <coughs> access, astronomy, and culture. We're talking about the wellness of people. Yeah, I'll wrap it up. For many years, Kanako Ivi have been denied fair access to social justice in our own land. For restricted cultural practice, desecration, sacred sites, it continues on. Supporting the proposed emergency rules for Mauna Kea will only perpetuate the demise of Native Hawaiians and promote cultural genocide. Please consider this. Um, I'm testifying today as an individual, but I do want you to know that I do belong to a volunteer group associated with the Office of Mauna Kea Management. And as you know, they do have a cultural advisory board of council. Um, to date, we have not been invited to one discussion regarding this issue, not one. Rangers have been. Um, you know, it's in the comprehensive management plan since 2009 that we are supposed to take the lead in things like this. We have not been consulted on it at all, to date. Um, and I find that very troubling, especially hearing testimonies of people and our community wanting to engage. This council was put together for that reason. It was started as a kupuna council in 2000. It evolved and into um, Kahuku Mauna, an advisory council, in 2009, in the comprehensive management plan. There's administrative protocols that are in place to, to take care of and address the concerns that people have been stating today. It's not been followed, and I, I would just like to let you know, it has not been, even at the risk <coughs> of request to be informed, we have not been informed. And again, I'm speaking as an individual on that council, not representing anything. Any. I'm very 
really bothered by this thing on Lake Royale. Somebody on a stand-up paddleboard, that's bullshit. Excuse my word. Take yes, it back, but I, I think that that's outrageous. And here's my letter to William Island that so, was not addressed. So I want the university to investigate this. It and again, the university, that's okay. not even our Kuleana. Okay, wait, 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 let me, let me finish. I want, if the university has investigated, I'd like to hear what they have to reply. The other thing is, this advice, Hawaiian advisory group is supposed to be consulted about the mountain. We, when I was in the Board of Regents, we started this whole thing in 1998. Mm -hmm. And I know that it has become an integral part of the Office of Mauna Kea Management and that this advise, Hawaiian advisory group is supposed to play an active role in protecting these very things that we're talking about. And it needs to be an active body and it needs to be consulted on an ongoing basis. Part of what we're finding out in this docket is that maybe we're all made mistakes as we went down the road, and including myself. But we don't know that we made mistakes sometime until after it's done, and that's the way human beings are. But on this one, uh, Chancellor Strainy, if you folks can, you know, address this idea of the Hawaiian advisory group uh, and have them have a more vigorous voice, that would help us out. And as far as this, this uh, thing of Lake Royale, do you want to comment on that? If I could. Yeah. And I appreciate Tiffany's request to come from out of me more frequently. Um, heard and understood and we'll uh, move on that. Uh, Lake Royale is not part of the lease that the University of Hawaii holds. Um, it's on lands managed by Gail and I. I believe DOCARE did investigate this, I'm told, but I have no direct knowledge because it doesn't report to us. So I would do uh, But here's the problem. Your Hawaiian advisory group should be utilized to investigate the whole mountain, not just where you folks are. And if you don't, if you don't have the authority, we need to fix that so that they do have the authority because we just have one mountain and there are arbitrary lines where the science preserve is and maybe uh, part of the problem is this falls in the cracks that we didn't know about and now we know. So let's find a way to fix it. Uh, and the university works very closely with the LNR personnel on the mountain. Um, and I'd suggest that in this instance, uh, we should have But the D D okay. DLNR doesn't have a, a Kupuna advisory council. They look on the to us said, for, right? for they look to us for input, they and we shared as neighbors as neighbors. So we right. did that. My concern in bringing this issue up is that we have we have young people that do protocol at the the lake, and this this young scholar was getting ready for an international trip to be away from our Paiaina, our Ohana. And she was restricted access by rangers who have no authority to restrict access to the lake. Okay, well, let's keep on this one thing. Well, that's why, I brought, uh, that's why I brought it up. Let's, let's try and do a better job with the... Right, I think this is a larger issue of coordination between okay. UH and DLNR. Yeah, but we're, we're just finding this out. You know, we, we're trying to make it better, right? I, I, yeah. I, I just wanted to follow up. You, you said Tahu Pumana has not been consulted on... on this what? issue of Kia Imauna, the presence of cultural practitioners, we have not been consulted in meetings that the university is saying they have consultation. They might with other groups, but in the comprehensive management plan, the first action item that we're supposed to attend to since 2009 was to meet with cultural lineal descendants, cultural practitioners, and community members that frequent the Mauna to set policy and UH procedure. We have continuously asked for COCUA in how to address these things. It's 2009, so the state of emergency that we're in, that's neglect. That's, that, that's neglect. We've known about these process and these things to be put in place. Everything you're hearing the community say, it, if you look through the management plans and all the sub plans, there's ways that they have organized to address it, it's just not being addressed. 
But yet continuous development happens. So when was the last time Prabhu Kumar met? We met in May, during our May and our April um, meetings. It was regular meetings that we called. We called and we don't want to meet without the Chancellor present. Since before 2000, the office has been found negligent many times on the management of cultural resources. Why would, we, why would we possibly still engage for another 15 years in that conversation when things aren't changing? Nothing personal against Stephanie. We have, we have communication. Sometimes it breaks down. It's absolutely frustrating. And then to learn that these things are what causes the ills of our people. That's why the emotions come out when they talk to you. It's, it's extremely frustrating. Well, we need to control what goes on in Lake Wyatt because it's very sacred. Again, that's not in the universe. I understand that, um, um, uh, but us in DLNR, in DLNR, we have an obligation to do a better job there. And uh, thank you, Paul, for bringing this to our attention. We need to work on that because uh, some of my friends have their people there too. Yes. Like Larry Kimura. That's how you buddy. He was so, a part of this council, actually. So that's, that's, thank you. I had a question. Hi. Thank you for um, mentioning Kamu Kumana. That was actually one of the questions that I had down was, um, was listening to see if there would be some discussion of any, um, any discussion with Kamu Kumauna or any advice coming from them as it relates to this matter? So I just wanted to clarify, um, Kamu Kumauna hasn't specifically taken a position or has been asked we, to? We actually made a, a, a public announcement when this first started that we are here and available for the university and have not been um, invited to any conversation when this first started. Um, we're at a, a place right now where we're discussing putting out another public statement just to say that we're here, we're trying, and we are not engaged in this process. The Kia'i Mauna know that we're here. Really, the community doesn't think we're much because we're, it's advisory. They can listen or not, but we have a responsibility to our place. That's why I wanted to let you know that we have been there for many, many years. And it's, it's very frustrating to be part of a process that the, the state can pick and choose, whether it's the university or any department, to actually have mm -hmm. administrative protocols and pick and choose when you want to follow it. So I just, mahalo nui for your time. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And again, I'm speaking as an individual. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Mahalo nui. Aloha board and all of the opportunity to share a few thoughts. My name is Doug Simons. I'm the director of Canada France Y Telescope, previous director of Gemini Observatory, UH graduate, 30 year veteran of uh, Hawaii astronomy. I'm basically dedicated my whole life to Hawaii astronomy. I've heard a lot about hunting. I'm also a big fan of hunting game for my own I have a lot of experience there too. I'm providing you with a letter uh, this afternoon that I think is fairly unique in the evidence that we've uh, been provided with. Well, that's a letter signed by 10 managers, not K Observatory directors, and I'm here representing their interests in, in particular to describe our perspective of what happened on the June 24th protest. My overarching message is that the observatories seek at the highest level safety for the public and the staffs in the future of economic chaos. And careful stewardship is going to be integral to the future of economic chaos. Well. We are strong advocates of working across and within the community for that. In summary, on the night of June 24th, we had a complete shutdown of Subaru, Keck, Gemini, Newport, IRTF, and JCMT because the road was left impassable, covered with rocks and boulders. It was unprecedented. It was a, uh, an event that unfortunately left those telescopes unmanned and they cannot operate without people on site. Some of the telescopes are remotely controlled, but many of them are not. The night before was cut short to avoid having nighttime staff 
uh, interfere or conflict with gathering protesters that night as well. So we basically lost a night and a half. The night that we lost on the 24th would have been exceptional. You heard from Hilton Lewis. And as a couple of examples of what was lost that night, uh, a general observatory, and a scheduled observation, what we call target opportunity for the largest sat satellite, Pluto, was scheduled to be looked at looking for water ice. That may not sound like a very exciting uh, observation, but in a few nights you'll understand, or a few days you'll understand why, because on TV internationally you'll see New Horizons, a billion dollar NASA spacecraft flying by Pluto. That was part of a carefully timed observation, ground support for this NASA mission that didn't happen because protests happened that day. We also had eight engineers and scientists stuck in Taiwan that had to, be, had to have um, their plans canceled. They were coming out to have commissioning work on a new instrument on one of the telescopes. And a group from the mainland scheduled to use the NASA RTF as well. They canceled, lost the tickets, cost them money. It was a big task to reschedule as well. There's lots of other knock-on effects, but I want to give you some sense of the loss of science opportunities, specifically on that money. There are a number of uh, tasks that the day crews um, are responsible for on the, the observatories. We were un unable to get uh, day crews up there for those two days, the 24th and 25th, except for a handful. The, the point that I want to make about this, though, is that there's literally millions of dollars in instrumentation that runs at cryogenic temperatures and requires humans to inject liquid nitrogen into it. If you do not do that on a regular basis, you'll have an uncontrolled, potentially dangerous warm-up. Could be very expensive and ultimately very dangerous. One of those instruments did have an uncontrolled warm-up. It was not damaged. That's a what? An uncontrolled warm-up. I can explain that if you give me more time later. Um, in addition to that, the road was, as you were well aware, left covered with boulders. Um, and that represented an enormous safety uh, issue for our staff. I would say the overarching safety issue for us right now Somewhere. is that Done. is that at any given time, protesters can block that road, trapping people above, including observatory staff, and you can create a medical emergency that way. Just last month, we had somebody at my observatory pass out. You always put them on O2 and you rush them down the mountain. So this is a big issue for my staff who's up there all the time, and I really do want to service them. So, sure. And I want to thank you for your time. Again, the overarching message from us is please do what you can to provide a safe working environment for our staffs. It, it's to the benefit of the public, and we want to see the road ultimately open up for everybody as it was in the past. To resolve this, what is your interpretation of uh, safe working conditions? What would you, what would, what plan would you put out? Besides, if we wouldn't implement the rules, that we have before. So, so I support the rule, to, to be clear. And, and I support it in the sense that I'm not here to prescribe a solution. I'm simply here because I'm a strong, I'm not an expert in law enforcement. I'm simply here to tell you from our perspective what the safety issue is. And for us, it's this matter of instantaneous road closure and prevention of a medical emergency from getting back down. <coughs> I met you before, so I think that you know, we went up to the what was supposed to be the dedication of the uh, thirty meter. You know, have a, you know, I think you were the speaker. You have a good memory. And in the you know conference room, and I was there with uh, my friend Will Shane, and so I listened carefully because I wasn't aware of all the history. So when you tell me today you're just an astronomer, well, my comment to that is that you and all the other leaders of all those telescopes up there, you've got to help us. I agree. Okay? This is a new day. Times have changed. You know, and there has been a, a reawakening. All my neighbors in the Kilkavi have flags flying in their cars and trucks. Times have changed. So it's not the same as it was three months ago. This is a brand new situation. So what is going to have to happen for the existing telescopes not to close down and not to lose all their billions in investment <coughs> and not to lose all of their grants that get funneled through the uh, Institute for Astronomy for viewing time and all the grants is that there has to be a heart rendering discussion between all the telescopes, including the 30 meter 
The 30 meter is holding all of you guys hostage, not because they're mean or whatever, it's the practical consequence of this dispute. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you, as a, one of the cases we had in Torts, uh, when you shoot a gun into a, into a uh, occupied uh, auditorium, it really doesn't matter whether you intended to hurt somebody. The risk is so great, it's outlawed. That's why you can't shoot guns into auditoriums. So in this situation, it doesn't matter whether or not the various protesters had uh, mean intentions and something beyond, you want to say, kapu aloha. Kapu is, has a lot of meanings, probably the best meaning is religious. It's a religious deity. And because of that, this na'au just drives people. Mm -hmm. And so they have this momentum coming, all right? And I wrote down in my notes here, when we had one of the last witnesses, no 30 meter or civil disobedience continues for a long time. So mm -hmm. let's say that that's the situation mm -hmm. right now. No 30 meter or civil disobedience continues for a long time. It will con continue long enough for you guys all to close down. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reminded, mm -hmm. you know, not to be, ch chairwoman says I talk too much, but I'm going to tell about King Kamehameha the first. And I'll be real short, you can find me. <laughs> okay, so King Kamehameha the first, when he fought with Kibala O at Kamehameha, that was the first big battle of the Civil War on the Big Island. Right above Honanao in the field across the street, they had a big fight. And King Kamehameha the first uh, seer, or clairvoyant, or or you could also call him Kuhi Kuhi Kuhuone, the man who writes in the sand. You know, that they never get paid for those days because they would do that. So they said, he said, leader, in the morning time you're going to get lickings, and the other side going to laugh. Okay? In the afternoon, Kivala O going to die. And you're going to win. And so when they had the confrontation between Kivala O and K.L. Moku, K.L. Moku had a spear through him. So he was crawling on the ground, and Kivala O was laughing at him in his face just before noontime. And the guy with a sling with a rock in it threw it, hit him right in the forehead. And he dropped on the ground. K.L. Moku went over, and that's why they call him Pratt. Paia. So he's called Paia Ula. That's K.L. Moku's nickname because he was crawling like a crab on the ground. He was a royalty or Ula because he had red coming out of his body. And he hit him with a lay a mano right across his chest and mm -hmm. opened him up. So right after lunch, he stopped laughing and Kamehameha won the battle. So now here we are up in Mauna Kea. Are we in the morning or are we in the afternoon? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where we are. Maybe this is in the morning and one side is laughing and the other side going to win in the afternoon. I don't know. All I say is <coughs> history repeats itself. If we don't want to have this thing go on forever, all the telescopes got to sit down, you guys got to crunch it together and decide where's the future of this. The one person who speaks the loudest of Mauna Kea isn't in this room, he's in heaven right now, and that's Danny Noe. And Danny Noe told me in 1998, that's why we made that big group when I was in Board of Regents to get this thing started. He told me the, the future of the universe for the people on Earth, all human beings, is to look through the telescopes on Mauna Kea to see our past and our future for the savior, salvation of the human race. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important to him. And that's why he was in favor of the telescopes to keep coming. <coughs> Not because he necessarily loved all of that, but because the, the free world needs that viewing site. It's either there or Chile. You got it, Chile. Chile. So there is, that's Chile. the Pilakia. Let's go Chile. So I just say this, so I just say this, you have a good chancellor. I like Don Strainy because he's a reasonable guy and he listens and he's hardworking 
and he's interested in helping the Hawaiians. So you guys got to work with UH Hilo and the Institute of Astronomy. And Randy Moore, the chairman of the Board of Regents, is a good man. I know him very well. Yeah, I'm all right. So, so James, James, usually wrap, James usually wraps me up. So I just say, you guys got to get going because if the protests continue, you know, you guys, we, you guys might win the battle and you might lose the war because everything's going to stop. And all the, all the neighbors on the big island, get choke neighbors not going to work up the mountain. We know it. I get phone calls. Remember Rory? So that's it. Hello. No, no, no. Excuse me, Chairman. I concede my three minutes to this gentleman we're, here. We're not, we're <laughs> and, and please. No, no, that's okay. No, I'm, no, no. no please no, read, no. read this statement. I just want to no. pass my, my paper out. And let him go. Oh, but, no. I shouldn't have talked too long. And no, I that's all right. But I we got my three but, minutes. But we got to we yeah, get this thing moving. Yeah, we got to move. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you. All right. Number 39, Gunther Hassinger. Thank you, Mr. Sonnen. Honorable Chair Chase, honorable board members, uh, I'm the director of the Institute for Astronomy that uh, we have mentioned. And, um, I'm here in support, in strong support of the emergency rules uh, for the mountain. And I would like to um, give you my perspective uh, on the, the claims that the University of Hawaii and the Office of Manakea Management have done a bad job in managing the mountain. Um, I think we have seen this in this debate and, and in the past. We will just uh, get um, the finger uh, about um, managing the mountain badly. I'm, I'm as uh, Institute of Astronomy in Manoa, not involved, and so I uh, give you my personal perspective on, on that because it's not a, a defense of mine. So the mountain management, from my point of view, has improved significantly and demonstrably over the last 15 years under Office of Manga Care Management. You know that there were the state audits of 1998 and 2005 and 2014. And while the 1980 and 1998 and 2005 audits were very critical of the management, the 2014 <coughs> audit came out with very positive statements, uh, which are usually ignored. Um, so they basically said that UH and DLNR, you, uh, your board, has addressed many of our recommendations, including development and implementing uh, management plans for Manakia as natural, cultural, and historic resources. And the result is an improved and more comprehensive framework that coordinates the agency's efforts to manage and protect Mauna Kea while balancing the competing interests of culture, conservation, scientific research, and recreation. And you also know that the major missing item in this audit was the adoption of administrative rules, which we are now working together at UH and DLNR. And so while we have clearly um, things to improve, in particular with Kaupu Mauna and with the native Hawaiian um, element, I think in the overall management of the mountain, the combination of UH and DLNR is the best possible organization. There's no other organization who can manage uh, that mountain. And you know that the comprehensive management plan has become the underpinning framework of all activities on the mountain, and all the observatories and the university are complying in every aspect, uh, be it the mandatory orientation on cultural and natural resources, the inspection of vehicles and equipment for protection against invasive species, safety rules, and regulations protecting these resources. And all proposed projects on the mountain, big or small, I mean, Kahuku Mauna uh, and also uh, Mauna Kea Management Board are dealing with all, all these issues. I mean, they are not dealing, I agree, with the big issue that we are talking about now, but they have worked in the last uh, 15 years together to look at every individual project that uh, is done up there. The Mauna Kea Rangers are on duty 365 days a year and they are monitoring the activities of the summit, watching for safe and unsafe, inappropriate activities, responding to safety warnings and so on. So they are the guardian angels of everybody on the mountain, including the protectors. And so from my point of view, also Office of Mauna Kea Management and Stephanie has done a great job and uh, now the standoff has shut down a lot of these activities and therefore I really support the emergency rules to get uh, back to a, a safe and orderly access. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry, one question. Yeah. Back in 1998, after the whole process of establishing the Office of Monarchy and Management and the Kukun Advisory thing got thought through, 
there was strong forces in the university to move the management of the Mount to Hilo from the Institute for Astronomy yes. because there was a strong feeling that the Institute for Astronomy being centered in Manoa was not doing an adequate job. So maybe history is repeating itself, but rather, rather than tell us how to, to do what the university is doing, this is the Board of Regents and the President's Kuleana. And the President and the Board of Regents need to weigh in on how to make Mauna Kea better. Because it's not just the Board of Land, and it's not just UH Hilo, it's the entire UH system has to pull together to make it stronger. So that's just my, yeah. my so observation. What, what I would like to point out with the statement is that you are right. I mean, the, the, as long as the management was in Manoa, uh, there were a lot of to criticize and the mountain is in Hilo and the management is in Hilo now. And since these 15 years that that has happened, this, yeah. uh, there are significant improvements, really dramatic improvements. Uh, not in all in all facets, but for instance, Native Hawaiian practitioners are uh, have highest priorities to go up the mountain. There was never a problem before the TMT issue um, arose. I mean, there was uh, the sacred areas up there are clear. They are uh, free for for the access. They are free of telescopes. So uh, I think there is a chance for um, a fruitful, and peaceful coexistence on that mountain where science and cultural practitioners can work together. And they have to work the, together. What are you going to do with the 30 meter? The 30 meter telescope is not on a site which is it's cultural. It, it's not on a site which is culturally or environmentally <coughs> um, uh, that problematic. I, I think it is. It has been tucked away where you can't see it, even from Lake, uh, from Lake Waia or from Ku uh, Vikyu or from Ku Poliato, you don't see it at all. And so I think from my point of view, there has been for many years of, of cooperation and a fruitful coexistence between culture and science. And it is a chance if we work together to continue that. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, number 40, Andrea Tupolo. Board members, my name is Andrea Tupola. I'm the State House Representative for District 43, which starts in Maibi and ends in Eva. Today I'm testifying as an individual um, against the proposed rules and just kind of wanted to share some of my thoughts. Um, first is, I think in HRS 91.3 it states that an agency can change a rule if it states in writing the reason why it's doing the emergency change. And so I was just requesting to see what was written as to why the emergency rule was being proposed, kind of like a preamble when we look at the law, like when we're looking at a bill. It just says kind of how it came about. Obviously, we know there's certain reasons, but I wanted to see in writing like how how it came to this solution. Like, there's many solutions that could have been proposed, but this is a specific solution. And I think also the things that other people have been bringing up about other current laws, I mean, as a lawmaker, I know that the public loses trust in us when we don't abide by the law. And so they're losing confidence in us because we need to check our check to make sure we're not violating any other laws. And if there's any support we can give you with people that can help you to look into that or whatever it may be, because it seems like we're crossing into a lot of different bounds that perhaps are unintended. Maybe the original intention was to protect the people that are there, but now it's just into every area that may or may not be the original intention of this rule change. Secondly is the unintended consequences. Um, something that was brought up earlier by Andre was in regards to the civil disobedience. You know, sometimes when we're making laws or rules, thinking that we're affecting one thing while unintentionally we're creating other things to happen, and that's what we don't want to happen. You know, we want this to, to not end up being something that's going to create more civil disobedience than what we've had. I mean, I have people come to legislature, you know, during sessions saying that our prisons are overcrowded ever since the sit lie bill. Now we have a bunch of homeless that are inside the jail with, you know, convicted felons. This, is, this cannot be where we continue to criminalize behavior because we think that we're shaping it to make people stop. And so thirdly, increasing access. I mean, we're talking about an issue that's on Big Island, but we're having a hearing on Oahu. 
And so in order to get a bigger scope of the people who are being affected, we need to be having this hearing on Big Island, where people can actually attend this and not have to fly over. Or even here in Hawaii, where you know people have been here since 1, maybe 8 in the morning, and I know it sounds like a long time, trust me, I've sat in a long hearing, but still, to continue expanding access so that everyone's voice can be heard. Okay. And lastly, is the solution. You know, a lot of times when we're making rules or laws, it's to find a solution. But what we're doing is so peripheral. Like, we're going to stop backpacks and this thing, but when the root of the problem is something bigger than what we're talking about right here. And I understand that that may or may not lie with you guys. That may lie across the building. That may lie. It may lay with you at the legislature. That's what I'm you saying. You could enact legislation to cure this whole thing if you had the votes. Well, and that's what I'm saying is that doing this rule is very peripheral, whereas we may need to solve this problem that's much bigger and there's a root of it. And so lastly, I just wanted to say that I'm not coming up with these conclusions blindly. I have met with the chancellor here. I've talked with him. I've read through the court cases. I've gone up to Mauna Kea. I've met with the people. If you need somebody to stand in the gap and try to communicate or try to find some type of solution for this, I will do it. If we need somebody that needs to go up there and try to figure this out, we should. Because I don't think by continually ignoring the people that are up there that it's going to get any better. Or by making a law or a rule here on Oahu that affects Big Island is going to make anything better either. So we need to sit down and be realistic with ourselves. Are we really doing what we need to do to come up with creative solutions? The people of Hawaii are depending on us. They're depending on us to protect the land and to hear their voices. So if you need help, if you want us to help, and we have lawyers that work for we will come and we will help. I will come and I will help. I will go to the Big Island and I will help to advocate to help get the people protected if that's what needs to happen. Do I think that a law or a rule is going to change the behavior? Probably not, and it might worsen it. But we should think about that. What is this going to do adversely instead of being proactive, we're just reacting. Oh, this happens, let's react. So we have a choice here. We can initiate something mm -hmm. proactive that's going to help the people as opposed to restrict them or cut mm -hmm. them off, ignore them, or stand on a walk and tell people in the big island what we think. Mm -hmm. So if you want me to take that there, I will. Whatever you need help with, I am there to help. That's what I think that we can do to make Hawaii better is have agencies work together, be more collaborative instead of divisive. And that's the same way we need to make legislation and rules. Let's collaborate. The same, uh, I think mm -hmm. she left, but the girl that was here, she said there are groups willing to help. Have them help advocate. Have them help out. You know, have them weigh in and have them bring you information. There's so many people willing to help with this issue. Let's bring them all on board and say, you know what? We need everyone's help. Let's bring everyone to the table and let's figure this out, as opposed to just ignoring people or, or assuming. Let's not work off of assumptions anymore. I have one question. Yeah. yeah. What's the I, I, I'm a music teacher. Would you like me to sing a song? <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's what we need to do is make music. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sing you something. Thank you for your help. You, if Anything you, folks you need help, help you I know that this is a chairman, difficult position. I understand He's that. the boss. Chair Case, if you need help, I'm here to help you. I know that it's hard to do these types of things. If you need help collaborating, calling meetings together, identifying groups that can help you, I will help. So, I'm at your service. Yeah! Woo. It's on the website, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Chairperson Case and members of the board for this opportunity. My name is Rich Matsuda. I'm the Operations Manager at the WM Kekwetu Board. I am a third generation Hawaii resident. I was um, raised on Oahu and I've lived on Hawaii Island for the last 21 years. I'm very proud to lead the um, decent and hardworking men and women on the operations crew who work on Mauna Kea to enable the world-class astronomical discoveries that Keck is known for. As a resident, I also care deeply about the community on Hawaii Island that I live in and that my crew lives in. My concern for both the crew and the community compels me to speak today. Mauna Kea is an extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily special place. It can also be a perilous place due to its high altitude and unpredictable conditions. This makes safety a particularly important concern for those of us who access the mountain every day and something I urge you to prioritize. Several in the operations crew, including myself, have prepared ourselves by becoming certified emergency medical responders. <coughs> in 2011, our training was put to the ultimate test when one of our own team members suffered a heart attack on Mauna Kea. This was a dire situation. 
because the nearest hospitals are an hour and a half away in Hilo and Waimea. We transported our worker down the eight mile long road from the Summit Observatory to Hale Pohapu, where we transferred him to an ambulance. Thanks to the quick response, he recovered and he's fine today. Um, this is the same stretch of road that has been closed to the public since June 24th. In my 20 years working on Mauna Kea, we have responded to cases of <coughs> acute mountain sickness, cerebral edema, concussion, broken limbs, vehicle accident injuries, to name a few. Some were observatory workers, some were residents or tourists. Serious health incidents occur without warning, and getting the victim down to qualified emergency medical care is crucial. This is why our crew and I believe maintaining order and clear passage of the roads on Mauna Kea must be a priority for all who access Mauna Kea, whether they are observatory workers, cultural practitioners, visitors, or others. As you look for ways to assure the safety of everyone on the mountain now, I hope that you are also guided by a longer term vision of Mauna Kea's future. I believe that Mauna Kea is extremely special from many perspectives, including science, environment, and culture, and deeply deserving of stewardship from all of us. I sincerely hope, and I've heard this um, mentioned multiple times, and the speaker just before me, uh, that we all find a way to work together in aloha and peace to help create a shared long-term vision for Mauna Kea that we can all be proud of. And I would add my offer of help as well uh, to the last what the last speaker said. Thank you. I have switched. I have a meeting to go to at 6 o'clock. Aloha, my kako. My name is Candace Fujikane. I'm an English professor at the University of Hawaii, and I'm here to oppose agenda items C1 and C2. Regarding C1, if the chairperson of the DLNR is granted executive power to close public hunting areas, there will be no public oversight or input in making important decisions about what constitutes public safety or protection of natural resources. Regarding C2, neither acting administrator of the Division of Forestry and Wildlife, Scott Fretz, nor Attorney General Douglas Chin has identified imminent peril or threats to public safety that can be specifically attributed to camping. Fretz's call for emergency rulemaking for the public hunting area is unwarranted given that hunters and cultural practitioners have been camping on those lands for years. Mm -hmm. Chin's concerns about the boulders and rock walls placed on the road cannot be attributed to camping. Attributing the uh, introduction of invasive species to the protectors is also disingenuous given the traffic of 300,000 visitors to the mountain every year. The placing of unauthorized toilets is not an Im imminent peril, nor is the consumption of water. Stephanie Nagata, director of the OMKM, has described the protectors as cordial. Clearly, this proposal is another effort to remove the protectors from the mountain so that the TMT can proceed with construction. Mm -hmm. The public is concerned about transparency and accountability. The decisions about the protection of natural resources cannot be left to one person, as, pro as the problematic reasoning by both Fretz and Shin illustrate. I'm concerned about how these emergency rulemaking processes will impact the ability of Oiwi to engage in cultural practices. I am not Hawaiian, but as a member of Huaka'i Ina Aina Mauna, I have walked with Ku Kawakahi on the ancient Kuamo'o, some of which fall within the proposed restricted areas. Who engages in walking the trails, the practice of ka'apuni ma ka'ika'i, traveling on spiritual huaka'i or journeys taken as occasions to view, remember, and teach the mo'olelo, the histories and the stories of the vahipana or celebrated places of Mauna Wakea. These huaka'i span not one day, but several days. This culture practice is also critically important to the monitoring of sacred sites, as we have, as we have seen desecration happening on remote parts of the Mauna. Water from the sacred springs, Kahopokane and Waihu, have been recently diverted through aluminum pipes down the Mauna to storage tanks near Pohakuloa. Who authorized this diversion? Why wasn't the general public notified and allowed to provide input? We need public oversight in order to protect Mauna Wakia. And I have photographs, before and after photographs, of what the springs looked like in 2005 and what they looked like last year. 
We have looked out over Na Aina Mauna, the mountain lands, and we have seen the land as the late afternoon sun cast a yellow glow on the grassy slopes. I think of Poliahu and her sisters Lilinoi, Vayao, and Kahopo Kane, and the golden pa'u made from the kapa pounded from the rays of the sun. I think of Vayao and Mo'inanea, the reptilian water deity who is kapu, or guardian to Poliahu, as she dwells in Vayao during the summer months. From a vantage point on an ancient Kuamo'o in the proposed restricted area, we have seen what Kupuna of long ago would have seen. Clouds rolling in around the Pu'u that evoked Kane Hunamoku and the other 12 islands of Kane, flowing high, floating high among the clouds. In Keao Melemele, Moses Manu references three of the islands, Kuai Heleni, Heolohileni, and Nu'umealani, as once being home to Mo'inanea. All of these sites inspire the remembering of these mo'olelo of Mauna Wakea. How many Oevi will, will miss these experiences if emergency rules are implemented without cause? I urge you to oppose this proposal for the emergency rule. Nakia and Mauna are only doing what you yourselves have sworn to do as members of the BLNR to protect the conservation district and the sacred lands of Mauna Wakea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want to see the pictures? <laughs> I have the pictures right here. They were amazingly beautiful. The springs were green. There was a carpet of grass. Who wanted to sleep on the grass when we went hiking last year? But instead of this, what we actually saw was barbed wire around concrete poured to create these reservoirs mm -hmm. and aluminum pipes drawing water from these very sacred springs that are recorded in the Mo'olelo of Kamiki, who went to Vayao to get water to make mm. ava, and some of the water jiggled out and created these springs that spread across Pohakuloa all the way to Huolalai. Mm. So, so did you follow where the pipes go to? Yeah, you can see it on Google Earth. You can see the wow. silver line of the pipe. They go down to these four water tanks that are down by Pohakuloa. So anybody can look that up on Google Earth. Wow. And we don't wow. know mm. who, uh, who approved that diversion or who's, where the water is going, what it's being used for. We're just hoping it's not being used for toilets in the state parks. We, we have no idea what the water is being used for. Well, what's the name of the springs? The springs are Kahopokane, Ohopookane, sorry, Kahopookane and Waihu. Thank you. volume a little bit please <laughs> and besides that I'm please is there any way you can put up the volume a little bit I just talk loud sorry I'm, I'm sorry in the big island I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. okay well better go sit by here oh uncle <laughs> there's a chair right here you go you bring your chair with you okay there's a chair there there's a chair right there there's a chair 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 Thank you. Go far. Sorry. You want to start the time? But then me. No, it's all right. Uh, I'll be quick. Um, so once again, you know, I'm in strong opposition of um, Section C, um, one and two. Um, you know, as as a person who lives on the Big Island, and while I can't speak for all my friends and family who are there, um, I do have lots of friends and family who not only work within the um, um, DLNR system, um, but also up on the mountain. You know. Um, in the observatories themselves. And you know, I think these rule changes, well, you know, they're under the, the, the guise of maybe um, safety. You know, it seems more like um, retaliation, uh -huh. you know, to things that are happening mm -hmm. on top of the mountain right now. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe just, you know, this simplistic um, approach maybe is just to, you know, um, just don't build a telescope. Mm -hmm. You know, everything goes back to normal. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 
telescopes that are up there now have several years left of, you know, structural integrity. You know, they're fine right now. They're working. You know, you talk about advancing stuff now, you know, at the expense of what? You know, you say, you know, we talk about conservation. You know, conservation is using something now, but, you know, keeping it so that future generations can still use that same resource, mm -hmm. you know. There's a lot of words that are being thrown around, but I think some of them have been twisted and misused. But anyway, that's all I had to say about this. Thank you guys for your time and being here for us. Thank you. 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 Thank My number is 56. If you do call my number, would you read it loud? <laughs> 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 So I'm not here because I am real familiar with the details of what you guys are trying to do. From my perspective, and I come from a grassroots perspective, and a lot on the sidewalk for Wednesday, morning signs. I encourage people to protect on the kill. Um, I'm against the project, I'm against any rule that helps you to convenience yourself to buy, and, and by doing so, inconvenience the people. The mountain needs to be protected for all the reasons that I haven't mentioned before. I don't have it written on the palm of my hand. But um, I just want to say from a lot, large part of what's going on, this rude intrusion onto Hawaiian space or places and stuff is kind of a racist based thing. And, and we look far back in time, we'll see. It. That, that that's just usually at the root of the problems that we have. And so if you were to implement these emergency rules and kind of limit the amount of resistance that would be able, able to amass on the mountain and therefore making it easier for KMP to proceed with its goal of completing its construction, we create an atmosphere and occupy it.
maybe the one corner and uh, you already know. Uh, for me, I always try to uh, just speak up for people, speak up for what is right. And um, I'd like to um, send a clear message to both sides of the aisle. Because um, where I come from, what is right is right, what is wrong is wrong, what is fair is fair. So I'm going to say on, uh, on the part of the state and Attorney General, um, I was trying to wait for you to say specifically what was the exact threats that was given, and he, he, did, he failed to do that. And um, so I say to you, um, to the board, that for you to consider making this rule, it's like a knee-jerk reaction um, to something that is vague and conclusory. And uh, so for that purpose, you need to just outright reject it. Um, uh, however, on the other hand, I do recognize that, um, and I talked to uh, Ko Okahi, I talked to the leaders and uh, Anamona, and you know, it was outside of their control that, that uh, the Puaku would end up on the road. Uh, some other people decided to do that on their own. And so I say for on our side, if we want to be able to continue to make progress forward, we cannot continue with this kind of uh, negative attitude. I watch Facebook all the time, and I started to see Kapu Aloha go out the window, and people give in to their emotions. So on our side, we have to remain calm to this concept of Kapu Aloha. And I gotta tell you, that's a, that's a very uh, rare thing for me, because I come from a place of violence, and to respond to everything I don't like with violence. And uh, these two young men will teach me about Kapu Aloha. I will push 51 next month. And I got these two young 20 year olds telling me about Kapu Aloha, and I accept that wholeheartedly. So I say to you, I'm committed to that, and I'm committed to pushing our people forward through Kapu Aloha. And for those of us who stand on our side, hey, laugh with the craziness, bro, because you're hurting our cause. So I know a lot of people don't like to uh, speak up against our own people, but for me, what is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong, and what is fair is fair. And so if you folks on the board want to be fair, then be fair to us as well. You heard in the hunters, you heard in the people that, that depend on the mana, then they had nothing to do with the protests. And you know that this rule is only because of the protests, or the protectors. You know what I mean? That's the right, that's the right moniker for that. It's the protectors. So I ask you to not consider or reject the claim until they can come to you and show you proof of threats. You know, this thing about um, blocking the road, that's a problem. I understand that because that is interfering with interstate commerce and that's a federal law. You can get, you can go to prison for that. And uh, so we need to be mindful of that. But you know, that was one incident and it's power ready. It took the um, protectors to go clear the road on their own without being asked. So you guys need to consider that. And um, this, this come to a place where we end this already, all right? We need to get to that place where we can sit down and discuss how we're going to resolve this issue. Because if you stand strong and you don't like move, TMT don't like move, and the protector's not going to move, we're not going to go to no place. We need to resolve this and we need to resolve this now. Aloha. Aloha. Oh my Mahalo for the opportunity to testify today. I'm speaking on behalf of myself, my Ohana, and Anakala Robert Ibanez, who could not be here today due to medical reasons. I won't spend my time talking counterpoints to the ridiculous arguments and accusations based in nonsense that are being spun by TMT, their PR firm, <coughs> UH, the current administration. Um, as I'm sure they have and will continue to be well refuted today. Nor will I waste time discussing the legality of the proposed rules as they are illegal under numerous U.S., state, United Nations, and international laws. Everyone in this room knows that this attempt at emergency rulemaking has no more to do with public safety than Lauren Thurston and his committee of safety had to do with safety. <laughs> this is clearly a conspiracy to stop Kanaka Maoli as well as non Kanakas from exercising their civil, constitutional, and indigenous rights in protecting Mauna Kea, our history, and our culture. This is clearly evidenced by West Hawaii today's release of internal emails between members of this board and other agencies in the current administration. But I would like to talk about what you as a board can do. You can fulfill your kuleana to your own mission statement to enhance, protect,
conserve and manage Hawaii's unique and limited natural, cultural, and historic resources held in public trust for the current and future generations of Hawaii Nei. This is nothing there is nothing natural, cultural, or historic about what is being attempted here today. Please set aside your politics, personal agendas, and the influence of big money and stand up for our people and the very resources you're supposed to be protecting. I ask you, Ms. Case, Mr. Rory, Mr. Downing, Mr. Gomes, Mr. Oi, Ms. Woodside, and Mr. Yoon, who and what is it that you stand for? Our people and our aina, or big corporations and their money. In closing, I humbly ask you, please rise up, be strong and courageous, stand with us, not against us, in protecting our mauna, our history, our culture, and our future, and oppose this emergency rulemaking. For many of us, the sacredness of Mauna Kea is a very real thing. <clears throat> my fifth great-grandfather, Samuel Kalehohano's bones, were carried on the Mauna by my fourth great-grandfather, George Kalehohano. And those bones, although they're long gone, are, <clears throat> excuse me, although those bones are long gone, that Mauna is just as sacred to me as your grandparents' graves are to you. Onipa. To the last of the Hawaiian lips. I'm on the front page. <laughs> and there was a specific word used for my emotions at that particular time. And yes, I was emotional. I'm 84 years old. When I was 12 years old, I saw my grandmother cry because Lenai was being bombed. We were eating mango on the porch, and every time the bomb would chop it, oh, oh, oh. And I said, what? what's going on with you? You know, to my brothers, my older brothers. I'm 12 years old. I didn't 
did not understand what she was doing. To me, it was like live TV today. We didn't have TV in those days. It was like live TV. I said, man, this is the best picture I ever saw so far in my life. Not realizing what was happening. And it took me 84 years to come to this point. On the 25th, I went up there to see what was going on on the mountain. I was so disturbed. On the 26th, I go up there and I'm watching again. Everybody's talking. The DLNR officers are walking proudly, and they should be. But guess what? They weren't watching the keikis, the babies running around loose. The parents are so busy talking to everybody else. The police is so concerned about watching traffic and going on. And guess what? A baby almost died in front of my eyes. This is my flesh and blood. We're talking about flesh and blood on the next generations to come, future, future, future generations. It, it moved me to the point that I almost, in fact, I lost it. I took all my clothes off. I'm a diabetic. I took my slippers off, my socks off, only my baby knees. And you know what? Those boys covered me and started to pray. And I was so moved. I thought I was there maybe to sacrifice my life for this cake. And that cake almost died in my place. This is reality to me. Where is the jail an hour up there watching traffic? and then concerned about the KK. What do we do when they die and the next generation make, make, make? There will be no Hawaiian blood, but guess what? The Hawaiian blood has circumvented this globe even before Pokulea. Prior to that, Hawaiian music is circumvented. If you ask the Hawaiian population here... It's time for you to wrap it up, Mr. Duarte. Pardon? It's time for you to wrap it up. Okay. Make it short. You read the statement that I wrote? Now let me tell you, my second amendment to this note, which I haven't given you a copy of, I state, I'll ask my Hanai grandson, Barack Obama, to come home before Christmas to help us and to be very careful that the enemies of this world don't jerk on his chain and have us, the U.S., bankrupt. Thank you all, and aloha for your time. Thank you. Everybody's time, we need to I don't know what else to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Shelly Muneoka, and today I'm testifying um, on behalf of Kahea, the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance, um, in strong opposition to items C1 and C2. Um, before I get into the bulk of my testimony, I just wanted to say that when issues of access to a specific area is being discussed, if at all possible, um, the hearings could take place on the island um, in question. So in this case, I'm going to get um, so today at around 12.45, we're going to start at 1. We received, uh, I was handed a new draft of proposed rules. Um, and I think the changes that were made uh, are substantial and the item should have been, at least C2 should have been re-agendized. Um, the new version has categorical exemptions for folks that work at the facilities. Um, it also, yeah, I, I think it was substantial enough that needs to be re-agendized. It's something to look at. Um, in terms of C1, the delegation of authority to the board chair to close public hunting areas is unnecessary. The proposed language um, calls the instances requiring closure are relatively rare. Thus, the administrative burden that would be alleviated by streamlining would be minimal, while the potential abuse for, the broad, for this kind of broad power is great. Um, to create an emergency rule, the agency that I want to see to it, the agency must show imminent peril <clears throat> to public health and safety or natural resources. The only clear imminent peril to public health and safety is the closing of bathrooms and the removal of porta potties provided by the protectors and cutting off access to water. Hydration is key on the Mauna, forcing people to relieve themselves 
um, in the wilderness is creating an avoidable public health and sanitation issue. If indeed we are to talk about the peril to natural resources, it begs the question why no emergency rules were put in place in 98 when the auditor's report said plainly that UH's management of Mauna Kea was inadequate to protect her natural resources. Why not in 2005 when the, the auditor found that DLNR did not provide a mechanism to ensure compliance with lease and permit requirements? Why not in 2010 when a CDUP was given to the TMT, a project that admitted if built would contribute to the cumulative, significant, substantial, and adverse impact already caused by existing telescopes? How about just a few months ago when people reported, well actually one month ago, people reported that machines in the Mauna were leaking oil directly on the ground? Why not then? Why has there been so much documented dereliction of duty with no consequence, no punishment, and yet now an emergency of imminent peril is being declared? Mr. Chin has cited rocks on the road. Those were removed the day after the action, yet the road has remained closed still till today. Telescope operators have been allowed unrestricted access up and down the Mauna, while cultural practitioners are only being allowed between the hours of 1 and 2, and only if an escort is available to take them. This points to an arbitrary application of rules, and actually when people ask for them to produce the rules that they're enforcing, they're unable to do so. So I don't know what's being enforced actually, but it's being applied unevenly. Yeah. So the pohaku that were placed there were placed there to prevent further desecration of Mauna Kea. They were there removed by hand, not requiring heavy, heavy machinery. Um, and HRS 703-30 permits a person in certain limited situations to justify disobedience to criminal law if the harm the actor sought to avert far outweighed the harm sought to be prevented by the law. The construction vehicles were imposing imminent harm. In this specific situation, the rocks were placed to prevent irreversible damage to the body of our aqua. When we say that Mauna Kea is our kupuna, we mean it in a literal sense. People are acting out of protection of an elder. Chin said that individuals remaining in the area have caused visitors and workers to feel harassed. Okay. Um, and we we're all here last month. Um, Ms. Magata was asked directly if there's been um, any conf confrontations and she described the protesters, protectors as um, cordial. Um, so the justification of, of imminent peril is dubious at best. Um, so the last section of the rule prohibits from entering or remaining in the area from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. now. Um, and the opinion that came out of PASH guarantees access for customary and traditional practices in connection with undeveloped land, which it is, and states that the state does not have the unfettered discretion to regulate the rights of all people attendants out of existence. This proposed rule would amount to regulating rights out of existence because it would criminalize nighttime celestial observations, sunrise ceremonies, and other practices that require access after dark. Um, it's the rising, the traversing, and the setting of celestial bodies that's key to the practice. So asking us to leave in the middle of the night for six hours and come back is, is not, that doesn't, won't allow us to continue the practice. Um, in closing, I just wanted to quote David Ige, actually, um, who said, let me be, my computer died. <laughs> he said something to the effect of, let me be direct. Um, the public the public roads will be, remain open and we'll do everything in our ability to ensure lawful access. That's basically the same position we have. Mm -hmm. um, My name is, um, <clears throat> I am my father's daughter. His name is Kanako O. Neil Bio. Sit over there. See, this is and my Mizero name Ross. is Wella. Oh. Call me Alani. Okay, I see. I have a Bachelor's of Arts in Geography, and Cartography, and GIS. Today I'm here to talk about Pohaku. And it's and it's reverence to Kui Alaloa. I mentioned my father because during his time, Pohaku was essential to his survival. Pohaku has many uses. <coughs> Pohaku is used to grow plants, to give birth, mm -hmm. to build fish ponds, and to build outhouses. My father was born at 1845 Manuelli Road 
in Kailua on Oahu. Um, he also passed away at the age of 87. On our property, on his property, we still have outhouses. Mm -hmm. My grandmother sold um, clothes for Lili. And, you know, um, I had to use that same outhouse when I was a little girl. Um, I, you know, I'm asking myself, where is the civility here? I'm a human person. I make number one, and I make number two. At my age, I have to rock to maybe make number two. And sometimes, and Chi-Chi, when I make number one, I have to go often in, in, at my age in hopes, and in hopes that I make it in time. I made a uh, uh, reservation to go to Mauna a month ago. And I'm taken that I have to worry about using the restroom, because I'm going to go in about a week. And I have to ask Kanua what what you folks doing up there with for restroom? Because, you know, if I go up there and stay a whole week, what should I do? I need to go. I'm aghast that I have to ask him those, have a conversation about using the restroom. Mm. Okay. Um, and I was out there on the wall talking to my friend Manu, and I was looking at, at that artwork that Isamu... Uh, no Gucci made, 1977. You know, we used to call that the King Kong toilet bowl. I mean, he get one over there. And I know more when I get to go to Mauna Kea. By the way, I'm from Waianae. Um, in 1978, very quickly, in 1978, Public Law 95-341, Hui Alalong. I had to go to Kaholabi and walk from Kiali Kuhiki, Holokanae Nai, Kumai Ivi, and over to Hakiwaba in one day's time and return. <coughs> Public Law 95341. We didn't make rules then. And we and I see that we're coming close to making rules for Public Law 95341. We most of our people <coughs> don't know what is Public Law 95341. But we mm. have to access, we have to hui ala law. In 1978, I'll be really quick. There was a, uh, that night on Koholami, there was an archeologist that was doing his objectivity on his science project. And he was trying to tell all of us that he is the owner of Keale Ikahiki. So I stood up in front of 200 people and I turned around and told him, and I said, Keal Ikahiki is very sacred to my people. This, you, you cannot own Keal Ikahiki and turn it into meets and bounds. That's what he was doing that night. Can, can you ask? Okay. On Molokai, a week later, Cynthia Thielen, I turned around and told her her consent decree. <coughs> we all voted it down because on her consent decree, it allowed the military to continue on bombing. It allowed the military to con continue on bombing all Kanaloa, Kohe, Malama Lama. Okay, I came home from Oahu and I went up and I talked to my Uncle Randy about our trip. And I told him we were picking up Pohaku and we had to make this pathway from Honokanae Nai over to Keale Ikahiki. He asked me what color. I said, oh, all the rocks that we have, the Pohakus we have to pick up had to be white. So he was very satisfied that. The day later, at 9.15 at night, I went to talk to Uncle Sam Lono. I went to talk to Uncle Sam Lono, and I turned around and I told him, I said, <coughs> Uncle Sam, I saw this pohaku, this cradle for a baby. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, very emotional, um, before I left the Aina, I put a Pupu uh, inside the cradle. Uncle Sam Lono began to tell me all about the cradle and its purpose. Mm. I'm very blessed to have known him, and I will wrap this up. I am asking all of you 
you know, in this protect monarchia, I'm asking you to um, to take care of our people mm -hmm. because um, even Uncle Sam Mono was arrested at Kolo mm -hmm. Park and cited, and all he was doing was kahia because mm -hmm. of the evi that was inadvertently mm -hmm. uh, uh, taken out. We also did mukapu. Uh, within that, that month, we did Mokapu, <coughs> access to Mokapu, Mokapu, and he asked us to bring Pohakus, and we asked him why, and he said, never mind, just bring it. So this whole thing about Pohaku, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taken by the way the Howie man look at the Pohaku, and the way I look at Pohaku. As far as I am concerned, I am <coughs> very happy the Pohaku was on that road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Better the Pohaku be on that road than our people, our young people's body be mm -hmm. on that road. And I think, yeah. I think that the sign that. that everybody here would rather see a body on on the road rather than a Pohaku. What is more dangerous here? And Okay. Please return the Lua. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I absolutely admire your endurance and that of everybody else here. It's really impressive. I'll be very brief. I'm but a guest here. I'm from Colorado. Sorry, can you say your name? Greg Johnson. Uh, from Colorado, so I know a bit about rocks and mountains. The point of what I have to say here is I, I have a perspective that may not have heard today. I was on the mountain uh, the 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th. Uh, I'm a professor of religion, and I was up there because I study sacred land issues. Um, I learned a lot on the night of the 23rd about Kapu Aloha mm -hmm. uh, from the protectors and during their strategy meeting. And I have to say, it's my professional opinion as a scholar of religion that that absolutely meets every standard of reasonable religion, would meet any legal test mm -hmm. of what counts as religion. Mm -hmm. And the kind of practice and love of place that they simply exude is just, to me, astonishing and humbling. So anyhow, uh, took that in, admired it a great deal personally, but also professionally. The next day, with my son, walked up with the protectors as an observer, a sympathetic ally to be sure, but as an observer. Was there as the various folks got arrested. And the point that I want to most <coughs> emphasize is this. As leaders of the protectors who were most who most set the tone for Kapu Aloha got arrested, mist and rain began to fall, obscuring vision. When it became clear that the leaders were gone, there were a number of younger men who clearly were not part of the leadership, and they took it into their hands to move the rocks into the road. This one, I witnessed this directly. It was a very marked departure from the Kapu Aloha that had been so clearly articulated and held to, to that moment. So the media story that this is generally what happened on the mountain strikes me be because I was there and saw it uh, as uh, wrong and offensive. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention that it was an act of very few people and an act that um, an emergency rule like this would be a disproportionate response to, particularly in view of the kinds of religious freedom issues that might emerge in response. So, uh, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number 16 is not here. You want to hear like 62? Yeah. Olivia Akuragawa? She went already. Switch. She switched to 83? She took 62. Yeah. Who switched to places? Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Aloha, my couple. Uh, my name is Sterling Wong. I'm the public policy manager for the Office of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we've provided detailed written comments. Uh, I'm going to highlight some of those. Uh, OHA opposes the provisions in <coughs> Senate C1 related to the delegation of public hunting area closures by BMR to the department. OHA opposes these provisions because they will limit transparencies and opportunities for public input for decisions that could significantly and adversely impact constitutionally protected Native Hawaiian traditional and customary practices. OHA opposes Senate C2 due to a number of technical, statutory, cultural, environmental, 
public safety and constitutional concerns, as well as the potential for unintended natural, cultural, and public safety impacts, all of which may expose the department to a range of legal challenges that could drain DNR of fiscal staff, fiscal staff and legal counsel resources, otherwise necessary, necessary to more effectively manage our island's cultural <coughs> and natural resources and the public trust. Our written testimony details many of the legal issues relating to the submittal, including concerns regarding the written justification for why rulemaking is required in less than 30 days notice of the hearing, and lack of specific evidence demonstrating imminent peril to public health, public safety, or natural resources. Therefore, I won't go into those specifically now. However, I wanted to take this opportunity to provide some general context. According to the Rangers report, since March 25, uh, 25th, about 10 protectors have continuously been on the mountain. At some points during that period, that number has increased to nearly 200. In stark contrast, according to OMKM, an average of 100,000 people have visited Mauna Kea each year since 2002. That's about 270 people a day, every day, for over a decade, who have not triggered any finding of imminent peril to public safety or natural resources requiring emergency rulemaking. And even in those occasions where public safety or natural resources were impacted, there was still no apparent need for rules. And so I just want to take the opportunity to pass out a couple of pictures um, that I found on the internet. And the funny thing about the internet is when people post pictures of Mauna Kea, they tend to post them with the telescope, so you know it's actually Mauna Kea. So these are incidences that we have found that have occurred in the last, I think, two or three years that all raise significant uh, public safety issues. And none of these incidents uh, triggered some sort of need for emergency rules. So our question is, if emergency rules weren't needed for these incidents, why are they needed now? So let's just go through them. So uh, we have a body blogger, uh, going along, I don't know, whatever. Uh, this is actually a rental car that went up to the summit. Uh, apparently the driver uh, left his car in neutral, got out of the car, left his wife in the car. It started rolling down, she had to jump out. It literally rolled down the summit. This is a fire that happened right at the Gemini Center. There's actually a YouTube video of them trying to extinguish it with fire extinguishers. I believe that's a rental car. It's on fire. Um, sorry, just really quick, that, that's uh, ESPN X Games that I guess a photo shoot up there. That's a skier. There's actually a big ramp over here. He's jumping over the access road with two police officers throwing shakas. Uh, this is <laughs> CrossFit. I mean, you can see what they're doing. I don't know what this lady's doing. But anyways, <laughs> thank you for your time. Mahalo. 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 And I'm really proud of everybody today. I don't think it's <coughs> chunk information. Uh, I can't add to any of the legal stuff. There's a lot of legal things hanging in the air on this one. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was the real war. Um, all of our resources are depleting. Uh, it was easy for us to understand that um, when we had to deal with Kahulabe, it was pretty in your face. Uh, this one is a little bit slower, like a cancer that's going on. And I'm really worried about the ability of the LNR to resolve some of these issues that we find ourselves in because the legislature is really cutting you guys' budget and your, your manpower is getting less and less. And I think that when Abercrombie decided to do the PLDC, people reminded him that it's not a good idea to privatize the natural resources for, for a private entity and profit making. So that went up in smoke. Um, so that leaves you with very few options. And one of the options is to find allies. And you cannot find better allies than the Hawaiian people. Mm. You have the same kuleana that the Hawaiian people mm. have. And we have answers that are 2,000 years old mm -hmm. that have allowed us to survive in these islands. Mm -hmm. So for you guys to start making us the enemy is a bad mistake. Mm -hmm. mm. So yep. this stuff that's going on now, everybody can see through the smoke screen. I mean, we got stuff on the internet right now showing what happened. Um, this is targeted to the Hawaiians because of what we're doing up on the mountain, and nobody can really dispute that. Nothing has been proven. 
But I want to get back to the idea of allies. We, the Hawaiians, need allies. We've been talking to environmentalists, trying to join and make coalitions to go to the legislature to protect our environment. And we would love to go to the legislature and increase your budget. But recently, um, I was involved in the pushing and the shoving of the Mauna Kea. And I had a different view of the LNR and the enforcement division. It was a really bad feeling and a bad view that I had. Mm -hmm. We need to get that out of our mentality. Mm -hmm. We need to stop playing these um, Konani games between mm -hmm. the protectors and mm -hmm. the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. where this building should be different from that building. Mm -hmm. We cannot have the governor coming over here with his long arm, with his yep. schemes that he's putting yep. before us. Yep. It's going to divide us. Yep. If we have legitimate food concerns, fine. You guys have to do what you have to do to provide public safety, fine. But this kind of stuff, it's really bad. You guys are looking really bad because you can see right through all of this. These rules, <laughs> it's not worth dividing. If you guys are going to come up with, with solutions, it has to be working with the Hawaiians really closely. I think the county police guys are working pretty good. They tell yep. us exactly what's going to happen and everybody's prepared. We need to have a much better relationship with the LNR. Much better because in the long run, we're going to lose this war with our resources if we don't find allies. Mm. And, and I'm here to say that we want to do that. Um, whether or not TMT is worth splitting up the allies, I'm not quite sure. But you heard the testimony today, so that's your decision to make. But I'm truly against C1 and a little bit against C2. C1 is going to cut our lines. I mean, you guys are only lying to this building. You take that away and give it to the chairperson and to the, to the staff, you're cutting our lines for us to become allies. So don't do that. You know, we need to be more in, engaging. I think you guys learned a lot today. You know, you saw here a long time ago. <laughs> And a lot of you are new, so that's a good experience. Some of you are old timers. Got some good old stories. Maybe you're older than me. I don't know. But we want to be allies, and just in case this actually goes through, I want to make a formal request for a contested case hearing, just in case that yeah. um, this thing doesn't work out. So I don't know how to do a formal, except to say it to all of you. And I would like to say that I would like to have a contest, formal contested case here. And I hope we can be allies. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I got a question. Um, um, the, sure. The, can he make the contested case request dependent on how the vote goes? Does it uh, He's going to have to follow it up in writing, right. so, so I think the answer follow is yes. Yes. Follow sure. up make the, the, make the request, and if yeah. you wish to follow up in writing, depending on what the outcome is, then please do that, sir. Mr. Rory has a question. What's your name again? Walter. <laughs> Walter. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> Walter. Yeah. So here's my question, because I didn't hear it clearly. You're you're against one. You're more against one than you are against two. So explain that to me again. Well, one one is really clear that it cuts off our ability to come before this board. And I see this board as our only way for us to express our satisfaction or dissatisfaction in whatever With permits. Decide. With permits. Is With that what you're saying? Well, if, if, if let's say an area is going to be closed, yeah. we've got to come before We can say something before this board, and whether, what the impacts are going to be on us and all of that. Okay. If you, if you don't have one, chairman, or who does it mean? To make that decision, and we don't have that ability to come before this board and express our dissatisfaction or our satisfaction. It, it cuts us off. So the more power you give away, the less power we have as a community to come to you. And we need to be coming to you as much as possible. That's because you guys need allies. We, we need to be partners in all of this. Is that follow up? Oh, That's all I got. I was, I was just going to follow up on that a little bit. In C1, there are um, several sections that have some delegations. Um, some of them is for entering into contracts. Um, some of them is for 
coming up with qualifications for disabled hunters. But what I've been hearing as um, the two sections that are particularly of concern and interest are the two that deal with the temporary closure being delegated to the chairperson. Yes. Uh, so are, is that the particular sections that? That's the section that the, the flag that I saw and read really got higher up. Yeah. It was the closing, um, I guess, for mammals and birds. Mm -hmm. Two sections of mammal section. Right. I'm out there also. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Mahalo. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I have a question. <coughs> I have a question. So, <coughs> you know, I hear, so I hear, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I think the dilemma that I that I feel sitting here is that I also I hear a lot of people basically saying that they are so opposed to the TMT that they. They think it was good to put rocks in the road, that they will do whatever they whatever is necessary to stop that construction from going forward. And I'm a lawyer. I'm a person that believes in this phrase. It's called the rule of law. And there is a, there are legal recourses. There is still a legal recourse to stop the TNT. It's not standing in the road. It's not putting uh, rocks in the road. And I'm just. My dilemma is, is I, I, I don't know what they expect the government to do when the government, like myself, is committed to the rule of law. But they, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure, I, I understand, it seems like people think that, that the government is just going to not sit passively because they are so committed and so earnest in, in their beliefs. Well, you have to look at through Hawaiian lens, <coughs> this rule of law that you're talking about. It was no, it was an overthrow. Legal. You know, I mean, it's legal it's hard law. For us yeah. to buy that when we have that history that we have to deal with. And at the same time, we're still willing, because we're so protective of our existing resources, <coughs> we know sooner or later we're going to get to that point where it's going to, this is a nation of laws, and sooner or later that, that law is going to be corrected. Yep. And in the meantime, we have to work with the existing system yep. because our resources are disappearing so yep. fast. I'm 70 years old. I used to see fish galore. You know, I know the resources are disappearing. I know the resources. Yeah. I have to do something to protect it because I have a kuleana to the future generation. And so do you. So all I'm saying is, you know, you have to do what you have to do, but don't play games like this to do what you gotta do. Make it pono and and, and, and straight up. And we're gonna have to do what we're gonna have to do. And we're gonna be, we are saying we're gonna be couple of aloha in all of this. There's no intention what yeah. in our day we weren't couple of aloha. Our generation was not couple of aloha. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I have lawyers keeping me out of jail constantly. So, <laughs> and that's the truth. So this generation has, yep. has knowledge that we never had. Mm -hmm. And they have protocols and guidance mm -hmm. that we never had. You guys gotta back up this generation. Yep. You know, I mean this is this is a great partnership if you guys could could put it together to save our resources. That's yep. the that's the end game. The end game is not whether we should have telescopes on the mountain. It's it's the sacredness of all of our resources. We all know yep. as Hawaiians we came we came from Wakea, Sky Father, and Ho'oloku Kalani, the Star Mother. I mean, mm -hmm. talk about irony. That's who we are. We're born of these people, and we're fighting with the telescope guys. This thing don't make any sense. Yep. Well, I, I, I wish there. I, I hope there is a way around this conflict. I, the only thing I'd like to suggest to you is that uh, Native Alliance have had many successes in the regular legal system with uh, the judges that have you know the, the, the U.S. flags you know, next to their bench. They have had many successes, and we are trying. And, and this board here is is trying to move the laws. When you talk about resource protection, we're trying to move the laws in a positive way. For every manner. success, we have ten failures. Okay, yeah. so let's balance this thing. Okay, yeah, let's so but process. That's what they did. We had seven year process. What? Why are you guys grumbling? We have a seven year process. Just look at this process. Mm. I mean, you cannot accept the process that you, when you lose on every single one on, on the process. So I just want I'm saying this process, 
you know, all this stuff that, that the government is telling you guys to go do in order to get us off the mountain? That's, it's, it, it's not your kuliana to do. If he wants to do that, have the governor and his attorney general go find another way. You're not, we're not going to go make enemies out of the Hawaiians who want to protect it, which is what you guys are supposed to be doing in the first place. That just doesn't make any sense. Okay. It just doesn't make any sense. Story. When I was 18, I was a protester. Um, not too long. When I was 18, when I went to college, I was a protester. But when they came to the club, they never come for honing. I got back, I got hit on the head with a stick, real hard, knocked me down. I got hit again on the arm, and the cop was trying to arrest me. And I crawled off and I ran. The Italian cop tried to catch me and I went in the dormitory and hid in the closet. And I had a headache for about three weeks. And I got away. And I was throwing rocks and snowballs through the president's window. Me and some of my freshman friends. Because he didn't like what the president of the university was doing. And I was 18. I looked back at that, how stupid I was. You know? And then I had trouble in intermediate school, Stevenson. I was asked to leave because I was in a gang. You know, I was only Holly in a gang. Then I went to high school. I got asked to leave high school. So when I got sworn in as a lawyer to uphold the law, I never broke it. And I uphold it. I swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States, Constitution of the State of Hawaii, and all the federal and state laws. And that's it. And when I look in the mirror, I look in the mirror and I say, I'm proud I didn't break that. And I, I tell my Hawaiian clients, I'm not going to hold sign with you on the road. You want me to protest, I protest in court according to precedent of the existing law. And the problem I have with this is Chris has the same problem. The problem is the, the case of, I got it right here. Hang on a minute. You want to take a look at two cases. One of them is Oha versus State of Hawaii, 129 Supreme Court, 1436. It specifically says that the apology resolution did not apply to invalidate the transfer of all the land of the federal government to the state of Hawaii. All the land of the federal government went to the state of Hawaii instantaneously when the, when the statehood bill was passed in the U.S. Congress. That's what the case says. So for me, I cannot pretend that Mauna Kea, or want to believe that Mauna Kea is owned by somebody else. Or that the, or that the, the apology thing meant that the, that the land didn't go to the state of Hawaii. I cannot go there, and that's the problem. So I, I have to go with the existing law. The existing law says that 30 meter has a contract and a property right. If the Supreme Court pulls that decision and does something with it, we may all end up on the same side again. But until that happens, I'm not going to break my oath as a lawyer. I don't because have to do I, that. because I got Hawaiian family too, brother. I don't have an oath with, for, as a lawyer, but I also understand international law. So, so there's more than just national law. Okay, well, I, I understand. So that's, that's the difference between you know myself and, 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 and I respect I respect your point of view because you're a stand-up guy. But I'm older than you, I'm 76. <laughs> but anyway, Walter, we need your help. We need your help. And what we gotta do is, if the law stays the way it is and the Supreme Court approves what, what the 30 meter gotta do, and there's still gonna be a protest, we're gonna be on the side of law and order. I am not, I have to be on the side of law and order. As long as I'm on the board, I'm on the side of law and order. And I'm sorry, but I draw the line right there. I got Hawaiian grandson. He comes to my house every weekend, plays with my wife and I. 
Mostly he plays with my wife, his the tutu, you know, and they read books. And I look at him, and I know he's never going to make it, maybe all the way to law school, but he's a fine man. He's only six. And I want him to have the right idea in his head. And I want him to learn the law in order is important. So all I'm saying here is that if the law courts do what they do, that's fine. We'll abide by the law courts. But right now, what we're talking about is rule making and the rule making. Okay. That, that's okay. the part that I'm here. And okay. That's, okay. That, I hear that's you. going to either separate us okay. or help bring us together to trust. Because right now, these two last minute, these last minute moves, this Konani move, is not a good Konani move. No, not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Verse 64, can I say it's Morris? Not here. He's here. Oh. Hello, my name is Derek Ben Flores. My name is Bonnie Hilo. I was raised in Wyoming, I'm currently living here on the wall. I'm storing fish pond in the area. <coughs> um, um, sitting on behalf of my wahine, Lenani, and then my kids, and then um, Kai Pio here, I had to leave, so I got all their numbers. Um, this is the first one, the C-1, I asked you guys to oppose that room, where is the hunting part. First we're going to be hunting, controlling how we feed ourselves, then fishing, and farming, and the thing can go on after that. For the first one, and then um, I oppose the second one too. Um, I got to go up to the Mauna. Uh, one uh, the day all our lures got locked. And it's kind of crazy to see even the porta potties all locked. And the next day on the news, um, so got to see the protectors bring up lure for all the mm -hmm. tourists and everybody there to get you mm -hmm. back to. And then next on the news hearing that oh, they said all oh, they lock all the lures because the cesspool is full. The cesspool is full, so you gotta lock all the porta parties too. Kind of crazy, all the lies and stuff going on. <laughs> just opposed the two, um, and just trying to write those stuff to say but good. Just listening to how you guys talking um, about the law part, can understand how you guys stand, but you had a whole another generation of us that kind of know more than just what is up to uncertain. Um, they do not really know more, but they not going to just stand on because what the law says and not fall on our mm -hmm. eyes. Um, we're standing for the Aina and mm -hmm. the talks that our group wouldn't have taught us before, especially with the Pohaku up there. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of stuff you're saying too, but that's where we stand and we still will be standing to the very last of our Aina. So Sunday I went for a hike at Ka'ana Point to go see the sunset and uh, on the way back it started getting dark, the moon wasn't rising and I had brought a flashlight that wasn't fully charged. So it got too dark, I didn't see uh, a big mud pit uh, right, right before I got to the parking lot and I slipped and fell and I broke my tailbone and I sprained my right knee really badly. So that was Sunday. But that was my fault. I didn't come prepared for <coughs> the hike that I was doing. And it's very embarrassing to me because I am a lifelong hiker and backpacker. I've climbed Mount Whitney and hiked hundreds and backpacked hundreds of miles. But it was a mistake. And it was a mistake made because I left my house in a rush. I was under time pressure. 
to to get there to see the sunset and so wasn't prepared properly. And my point in telling you this is that being up in the mountains, being up in the mountains without safety equipment, tents, backpacks, blankets, is uh, a threat to the safety of someone that's in the mountains. Um, we all make mistakes and, I, and when it, you know, done in haste, you know, we react under pressure. Uh, and when, to, when it comes to safety in an alpine environment, those mistakes can cause great injury, broken bones, and even loss of life. So you guys say that the purpose of these rules is that the protectors are putting themselves at risk by being on the Mona after dark in hazardous conditions and inclement weather. But in fact, you are the ones who will be putting them in danger and at risk by prohibiting backpacks, blankets, tarps, tents, and stoves, the very equipment needed to ensure their safety in such conditions. Without shelter from the elements, people on the mountain will be put at risk of hypothermia, exposure, and other weather-related medical <coughs> issues. So I'm therefore abhorred at the proposed new rules. I'm appalled at their blatantly punitive nature guised in a sham of concern for public safety. I'm also deeply concerned that these rules are being taken as an emergency measure, as if there were an eminent danger inherent in the protectors just being on Mauna Kea. It is illogical, perverse, to prohibit the possession of blankets, tents, tarps, backpacks, and camping gear, and stoves, things necessary to keep warm and prepare food. It's as if, I'll wrap up. In prohibiting possession of gear necessary for safety and survival in an alpine environment, you, the BLNR, and the state of Hawaii are in fact, or would in fact, be endangering lives, not protecting them. So it's in the interest of safety that I oppose this proposed emergency rule, and also warn you that approving these rules will be an unconscionable and costly mistake. You would be morally accountable, legally, for any injuries and harm that result. The, the right of the protectors to exercise their religious freedom on Mauna Kea is protected under the First Amendment by the United States Constitution. So when we talk about respect for the law, is that not the highest law of the land, the United States Constitution? <coughs> As you know, a lawsuit was filed, I believe, Wednesday in U.S. District Court against ELNR, Chair, Chair Case, Governor Ige, Office of Mauna Kea Management, and UH Heal Chancellor David Donald Strainey. Forcing these new rules, restricting the exercise of religious freedom, will be a costly mistake for the state and for the taxpayers who pay the bills. Can, sorry, can you ask that up, please? Sure. It will only serve to take, make this agency and the, and the governor look as backward and loathsome as Governor George Wallace in 1963 trying to bar African students from the University of Alabama by standing in the dory. Yes. Yeah. Our protectors have vowed to continue the blockade against desecration of Mauna Kea, and I have no doubt that they will continue their vigil and protective action on Mauna Kea, as they have for the past 107 days. There have been three protectors who have been hit by vehicles on Mauna Kea. These are real safety concerns. These are real safety concerns. I would like to see those issues addressed. Have these people that have hit these, these protectors been held accountable? Has there been training for other uh, employees on the mountain to deal with how they drive on the roads? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Christopher, can you buy the way you Camarillo, Koyino, Kailapuru is where I came from originally. But actually, no, can you hear me? So I've come from Papa and Bakia. My genealogy is Sasin. 
the only genealogy that's in existence that has been proved by science. Oh, wow. Right. I am a, my last job was, my last paying job was with uh, Office of Law Affairs as a IT person. Um, I'm field trained, EMT, and my doctor's is in theology. I've heard, I've actually, actually, I, I've actually been laughing at a lot today. Uh, it, it, I, I think that you guys, it, it, with all these lawyers here, you guys are like confused <laughs> about what is lawful. And I, I don't really want to argue like one joint resolution against another joint resolution. Because the joint resolution that protects ERFA and protects, you know, the American Indian Religious Freedoms Act is just that. It's a joint resolution. And Congress has no constitutional ability to practice their law outside of the area that Congress can designate such law. And that law happens to be in the area that the federal government bought, which is D.C. So, Hawaii's not a state, but let's talk about a different law. Um, let's see. Selective prosecution. You guys are lawyers, you guys should be um, familiar with that. It's when you specifically attach prosecution to a place or a thing that is outside of the guidelines of political or other effect. And I think that on the agenda is C1 and C2, and I disagree with both. Um, I have traveled around this island several times, walking with Lono, carrying Ki'i o Lono, during Makahiki. We've been welcomed at many a school and many of the organization and location. And we do it by the side of the sky. We walk with our ancestors that are up in the heavens. <coughs> and to remind me that right is against anything that any good lawyer should represent. Okay, number um, 67 is going to be somebody representing the Chair, members of the board, my name is David Copper. I'm an attorney at Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation. I represent Kalani Flores. He's a Native Hawaiian with traditional and customary practices in the Mauna. We, we oppose these rules um, and we oppose them based on existing legal precedent. First, I think it is very clear that the department has failed to meet the requirements of Kapa'a Kai Oka'aina versus Land Use Commission. It's a case by the Supreme Court and it said that state agencies have an affirmative duty to preserve and protect traditional and customary Native Hawaiian rights. This means that before you enact these rules, you must identify the scope and existence of traditional and customary Native Hawaiian rights, the extent to which those rights will be infringed by proposed action, and you must protect those rights. I look at the staff submittal, there's no Kapa'akai analysis in here. None has been provided by the Attorney General's um, that's existing legal precedent. You cannot enact these rules without an analysis. I'd like to talk more about the rules. I think it is clear that it's unneeded. I know a uh, member you and other members have shown concern over, hey, you know, it's great what's going on and you appreciate the passion, but there's rocks on the road, there's danger. 
The proposed rules do not address that whatsoever. There is nothing in the proposed rules which addresses safety because of there's rocks on the road. Well, so let's do a lawyer trick. We're going to pretend that, okay, let's assume everything the opposition, the department is telling us is true. Well, they're saying there's illegal activities happening on the mountain. Okay, well, why do we need these rules? We already have rules making these supposed activities illegal. Well, I believe I heard the Attorney General's office say, our current rules are not specific enough. I have the rules. This is how specific they are. Okay, it's prohibited to remove damage or disturb natural features, rocks in the road. To remove uh, damage or disturb historic prehistoric remains. To remove damage or disturb any notice marker or structure. And to occupy any building. Engage in any construction or improvement. Introduce any plant or animal. Enter or remain within uh, this area under the influence of alcohol. Drain, dump, or, or leave any litter. Deposit any body waste. Build any fire on the ground or in any structure. And of course, residing in this area. So it's already illegal. Why do you need to have more rules? Just enforce the rules that you already have. So again, that's my question. Why do we need more rules? Well, the Tribune Herald, as great as they are, they found some emails. And we all know what, why, why these rules are up. <clears throat> it is very clear that it's for political reasons, to support the TMT telescope. And I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but someone called these rules, the proposed rules, a home run. And I'd very briefly like to finish. They say these rules are a home run. And while I caution you to adopt these rules, I agree, they are a home run. If you want to violate Kapa'akai, it's a home run. If you want to step on Native Hawaiian rights and the rights of the public, then you knock it out of the park. And if you want to enact needless rules, at the expense of the Constitution, it's a grand slam. There, look at these rules for what they are. There's no need to strike out on this one. Thank you. Um, so you've heard, you, you have a general idea of what the, I'll just call it the encampment. I have like. a general idea. Okay. Is that a violation of the existing rules, as, as your lawyer's opinion? I haven't seen the encampment, but you, it sounds like the department is saying it is. We've heard that camping is illegal. If there is camping, then yes, it's illegal. Well, you've just told us that everything, okay, that, that, that a whole bunch of things are, are already illegal. I'm just asking, you, is, what, is people staying overnight at this encampment currently illegal? Well, I'm saying that's what the department is telling you. That it is illegal. That's not but, what yet, you said the first but yet time. we need more rules. That's not what you Hello, said the first we're all I here. Said. I said, let's do a lawyer trick, remember? I said, let's assume what the yeah. department says is yeah. true. That. That's what I said. And I, yeah. in an effort to fit in my time, I may have spoken to that. But that's what I said. I said, let's do a lawyer trick and assume what we're being told is true. And why do we do this? It's to show how ridiculous the proposed position is. It's, this is what they're saying. Help, it's an emergency. People are doing illegal things. So what are we going to do? Make them illegal again. <laughs> That's what they're saying. So in your mind, is it, is it uh, a violation of the rules? What's happening right now? From what I understand, there are very few people who have committed violations. We know that the vast majority of the people on the mountain have, did not place those rocks. Are cordial, but it goes beyond that. What about spending the night uh, on the mountain? Is that camping? No. Tell me. What? So you're you're not willing to say. So that that, that sounds like you think it's ambiguous. What I'm saying is, again, these rules. I mean, the rules you have now are trampling on native Hawaiian traditional and customary rights. Unfortunately, there is no analysis which you are required to do before enacting any rule. If there's an effect on traditional and customary native Hawaiian rights, you have to do the Kapa'akai analysis. Well, you know, you, you said that. Right. You said that a few times. But all, we were, all we're asking you is, do you think that the 
the present rule barring camping is ambiguous with Don't respect answer. to what's going on. No. And, and, you, and if that's the think, question, then no. Okay. And so you think it is camping. What's going on up there is camping and it violates the rules. I, I've never been up there. You can let laugh about it, but I've never been up there. Well, sir, if I mean, you want to tell me, is there camping going on there? Just come out, come out, I'll let you Okay. Well, you know, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to control these um, guys. I, I'm, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just calling some questions. This one. And it's fine. And like I say, the person I represent, you may call him protective protester. This is someone with traditional customary practices. And these practices, which occur at night, which are well documented in environmental disclosure documents which have been submitted to the board are being affected by these rules. <clears throat> and if you did an Apaakai analysis, I've you would see a that I've, and address those rules. Yeah. Can, can we just one. go on? Mr. Murray, please proceed. I'll try to be short. I've done a Kapa'akai analysis on it too. And with no disrespect to you, I've been representing the Hawaiian community for more than 45 years on cases all over the state, all the land cases, and your boss and I are buddies. We were in the wars back in the 70s. So I've done the Kapa'akai analysis myself, and it isn't so clear to me, unfortunately. If I was convinced beyond some doubt that you were right, I would feel a lot more confident than I feel right now. Because my analysis is that the state has the right to regulate cash rights. And that's what's in Article 12, Section 7. Right at the end it says the state has the right to regulate it. But so not out of existence. Well, 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 Come on, you guys, this is not going to be Regulating it out of existence isn't the same thing as a temporary rule that lasts for 120 days. If we if we passed if we passed a if we passed a law that outlawed it on Mauna Kea, then I believe it would come within the purview of of um, Ling. Uh, hang on a minute. Ling, Ling versus uh, North, Northeast Indian Cemetery Protective Association, 108 Supreme Court, 1319, 1988 case, U.S. Supreme Court. Are you familiar with that case? No. Okay. That case says right on point that where Hawaii, excuse me, Indians had religious rights in this beautiful forest up on a mountain. And the federal government wanted to put a, a uh, logging road right through the middle of it. And they said, it's going to spoil it. The US Supreme Court said, as long as you're not outlawing it, you can reasonably, you can put some controls on the, right, the First Amendment right of worship. I think it's an unfortunate decision because I've been supporting the Hawaiians all these years. This is a bad decision for me. But that's the existing law. And I read all these cases in the last four days because I didn't want to come over here and speak out of turn. But you got to go read this case. It's bad for your position. And that's why I told the Attorney General he got to go read it too. So I didn't just pick you out. I told him the same thing. Got to go read it. Because it has a lot to do with this case. And it's an unfortunate decision, but it's the it's the existing law, and it seems to put a squeeze on pass rights. That's what I think, and I'm, I feel bad about that. But I think that that's the existing law. So with all due respect, counsel, I respect you representing your client to your best ability. But on this issue, I just have a little different opinion. Okay. Thank you for your help. Thank you. You're 69. No, I'm 68. 68. Uh, there. Okay. Is it okay if we 
and I'm the um, Ahamoku representative at Keole for the Aleda Hawaii. My flight is at 7. I submitted my testimony and I just wanted to um, acknowledge all of you folks and appreciate the hard work that you folks are doing and have to do in making the decision. But um, Thank you. we the Ahamoku um, oppose both C1 and C2. Wow. Mahalo. Thank 
Hello, Hamay. My name is Nalbari Nala, and I am here humbly before you to read testimony on behalf of Clarence Fuko Kahishin, Ms. Chair, and members of the Board of Land and Natural Resources. I am Clarence Kuching, age 79, a longtime Hawaiian cultural and religious practitioner on Mauna Kea. I am also a longtime student and practitioner of the Lua, being a member. I'm sorry to interrupt, but if, if you're not going to have time to read the whole thing. So oh, no, I know. Yeah. Okay. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, being a member of Pakui Lua. I am in opposition to the adoption of the proposed rule. The proposed emergency rulemaking does not meet the requirements to be legally adopted at this time. The basis that should be required to justify the passage of a rule should be credible. The basis upon which you rely for adoption are skewed in incredible and illogical ways that you should be ashamed to even start to consider enacting the proposed rule. At this time, whether it is timely or not, this testifier requests a contested case hearing. An important part of my practice includes walking, hiking, across, up and down the aina, walking, hiking in the footsteps of our ancestors. I am a co-founder and leader of Huaka'ina Aina Mauna. In 2002, we started hiking at sea level at Koholalele Landing at Kukai'o on the Hamakua coast and proceeded up the Umikoa and Kaula trails to the summit of Mauna Kea then went down the Skyline Trail, crossed Pohakuloa Training Area, down the Old Kona Road to the Pu'uanahulu, then down Pu'uanahulu Kiholo Trail, ending at sea level on Kiholo Bay at Luahine Bay, where we were privileged to swim in that most famous pond. In 2003, we walked, hiked from the summit of Mauna Kea to the rim of Mokua Veo Veo on Mauna Loa, then down and around Kilauea, then down the Keaupo Trail to Keaupo Landing at sea level. Hua Kaiina Aina Mauna is planning our activities that will take place later on this month. Near the end of the month, we are walking, hiking from the Mauna Kea Access Road at Pu'u Lilinoi at about 13,000 feet to Pu'u Makanaka on the Kaula Trail, then descending to about 10,000 feet. We will be starting at approximately 8 a.m. that will give us the full day needed to accomplish our objectives. You are on notice by my testimony here that this activity is taking place. While you say that a permit is required, I disagree, as permission is not required when one has a right to exercise. We will be exercising our constitutionally provided cultural and religious rights. On July 31st, we will be flying our nation's flag on the summit of Ku on the summit at noon with appropriate oli and kule to celebrate Kala Ho'i Ho'i Ea. These two activities may be curtailed, I believe, if the subject rule that is being addressed today is promulgated, and that will make us very unhappy. Let me tell you, I will not accept a million dollars to not be able to participate in these activities. I will not sell my right to practice. Therefore, I would suggest that you curtail all further action on the emergency rulemaking and the irregular, illegal, and unconstitutional curtailing of my and my fellow Kanaka Mali rights to practice our customary and traditional cultural and religious rights. Mahalo Thank you. Will you please um, remind Mr. Chin that if he, that he needs to follow up with a recent and contested case hearing request within 10 days? Okay, we have um, number 70, Kaui Unikea. Hello, my Koko. My name is Koko Unikea. I am from Manoama Valley, located between Tatmas and Round Top here on Oahu. Um, first, I would like uh, um, some of the um, information that I looked up here on your website um, on behalf of your mission statement um, speaks of how you guys enhance, protect, and conserve and manage this area. Um, going off of that word protect, which means to keep safe from harm or injury, um, I don't think you guys are doing that. Um, by withholding items that is necessary for people to be on that mountain, not just to stay over a night, but even just to stay in the day, um, would put them in, in harm's way. Um, 
such as uh, the cold weather um, <coughs> and the use of the Russian. Um, I won't go into that too deep. But um, it's it's a big uh, a big word that everyone is speaking of in this movement of the Hawaiian people. Kiyati. I'm not too sure if a lot of people know what that exactly means. Um, it is a very big and important word which describes uh, a guardian, someone, um, a caretaker, a watchman. Um, we take on that responsibility as a kia'i to be that watchman or that guard for our aina. Um, and that is the reason why that they need to be there 24 seven to be that watchful eye um, for our aina and make sure that no desecration happens on that land. Um, there are many reasons that we need to be there um, after 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. Um, outside of just protecting the space, uh, such as cultural practices, ceremony, um, and observation of the sky, such as the people in the telescope. Um, it is a big part of our lives to um, observe our skies, our heavens, as much as it is for scientists. Um, so it is just as important for us to be there and be able to study that science as the people that are there for the, um, in the telescopes. So I think that the adjustment that has been made to uh, allow people that are in the observatories to be there and break these rules that you speak of, um, I disagree on that. Um, we're not there to um, threaten anyone. Um, the, the pohaku in, in our lives are like people. So when I see rocks in the road, it's like, to me, it's our kupuna that are supporting us in what we're doing, um, in being there physically for other people to see. So you may have seen a couple hundred people, but a thousands of rocks to us are just like our people. Um, and that is the spirit that we bring with us to help us and protect us in what we do. Um, I don't think this, this um, rules will um, do anything. To me, it's like putting a band-aid on the situation. We need to all come together and figure out a solution so that no one can be threatened um, and everyone can be safe on this mountain. Mahalo nui, aloha. Number 71 is Joshua Noga. He spoke early. He spoke, okay. Uh, 72, and I'm sorry I couldn't read. Okay, it's going to cross that mic. Cool. My name is Martha Thompson, and I'm the oh, director of the uh, CRM. I want to make sure. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, and if you all want to take a break, I won't be here. Okay. Again, my name is Mariah Thompson, I'm the director for the Sierra Club of Hawaii. I've been involved uh, in the effort to protect Mauna Kea um, for many, many years in various organizations and various capacities. Um, much of my testimony covers things that have already been said, but the third and fourth points, I think, are important to raise. Part of why I'm concerned about these temporary rules is because I know that the Office of Key Management is currently considering their own restrictions to public access. And uh, they're frightening, you know? They uh, definitely favor astronomers over everyone else. Uh, they would prohibit people using flashlights, for example, and cell phones on the mountain. They would um, uh, authorize the chancellor to uh, restrict access for up to two years at a time. And we're concerned that these temporary rules will be used somehow um, in this OMKM process, which is not rulemaking, because they are convinced they do not have to follow rulemaking. Um, and that's a problem. But I also want to address litigation. I mean, uh, Mr. Ewan and Mr. Roy seem to think that it's easy for uh, members of the public to conduct litigation. It's extremely difficult. I've been involved in this for a very long time, not as long as many but I have seen the toll that it takes. And just getting an injunction, it's cost prohibitive. You have to put up a bond, for example. 
And the thing is, is that you wonder, what can you as a government do? And I actually have a suggestion. If you as the government could say, pause the TMT CDUP until the Supreme Court issues its ruling, you have a temporary reprieve and a time in which you can negotiate and work out with opposing sides a, um, a compromise. And in that temporary reprieve, all access up the road could be allowed because the, the protectors will feel no reason to uh, guard the road and to prevent access to the telescopes. There is no um, controversy with the current telescopes up there. There's nothing wrong with people going out. You know, the protectors have nothing against that. Um, it's just the construction equipment for the, tel for the 30 year telescope. When they read the rules, and in the plain reading of the rule, it says you can't have a substantial adverse impact. And the EIS says the TMT has a substantial adverse impact. And yet you allowed it to happen. It's hard for them to I believe in a rule of law. And I just have to say, when you look at these temporary rules, C1 and C2, that would bar public access, I'd like you to take a moment, step back, and imagine, instead of a telescope being built on a distant mountain, actually the controversy at the, at the heart here would be a luxury subdivision on the shoreline, or a federal highway over a reef, and instead of native Hawaiians standing in front of you with tea leaves and backpacks, you have surfers with their long hair and their surfboards. And would you seriously consider barring public access to the shoreline to surfers and other ocean users in order to make the luxury home developer feel more comfortable and then just tear up the shoreline while there's litigation going on? I don't think that you would. And so I'm urging you here today to not do that in this case. Instead, tell the TMT to hold its horses until the Supreme Court issues its ruling. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, if 72 is, uh, sorry, I was 72. Well, you actually moved around to 68. So. I'm a Kupa of Pololo Valley here on this island. Um, I'm here to formally read testimony on behalf of my father, but first I would like to respond to some um, comments that have been really disturbing that I've heard throughout the day. Um, the first being that I completely resent the comments made by Attorney General Douglas Ching in which um, he argued for the need for this change in rule to maintain safety by alluding to the possible future violence acts by Kia Imona in saying that we will, quote, do whatever it takes to protect this Mona when all we have promised is to stay as long as it takes in Kapua Aloha in nonviolent protest. Um, this, I think, is an essential distinction that I would like noted for the record. We have never threatened violence um, or any such extreme actions when, in fact, the only person who has, done, who has demonstrated that he will um, do whatever it takes to further his initiative is Governor Ige um, in talking about the fulfillment of the TMT. Um, I would also like to respond to one of the astronomers who said that the beautiful and important thing about their work is that it seeks to answer the deepest and most important questions about the world, and I would like to say that our science and our beliefs do too attempt to seek an the answers to these questions, and I would like our science to be recognized as essential and important to these questions. Um, I would also like to respond to the idea that has been raised by a few people that there are no better organizations than the Office of Mauna Kea Management to manage our mountain, um, when in fact our Konohiki and Kupuna have managed that space before the arrival of 
missionaries and the creation of this fake state eventually without any documented acts of desecration or threat to public safety. And this is something that surely cannot be stated by the state of Hawaii or the office of Mauna Kea management, whatever they call themselves. Um, with that said, I'm going to go in to reading my father's testimony. I think it goes without saying that I um, stand in strong opposition to these rule changes. Um, my father, Jonathan K. Kamakuiva Ole Osorio, is professor at the Center for Hawaiian Studies, um, respected Kumu uh, Hawaiian musician and activist. And I apologize to you folks, because I'm definitely going to go over time, um, and I am accountable to you guys to that, and I apologize. I wish to voice strong opposition to the Office of Mauna Kea Management's rule changes that seek to limit access by Native Hawaiian religious and cultural practitioners to a so-called restricted area at the summit of Mauna Kea. I object to this rule change on a number of grounds. One, Native Hawaiians have, in increasing numbers, been paying their respects to the mountain and to our traditional deities as the sacredness of that summit has been threatened by erection of the latest and largest telescope. Two, access to religious shrines and the ability to maintain cultural practices are universally acknowledged as standard human rights in civilized countries. Where those rights are abridged or oppressed, there is almost inevitably civil disorder. Three, the rights of indigenous peoples to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies. The right to maintain, protect, and have access and privacy is declared in the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, of which the U.S. since 2009 is signatory. Four, in the Apology Resolution of 103, Dash 150 in 1993, the United States states the indigenous Hawaiian people never directly relinquished their claims to their inherent sovereignty as a people or over their national lands, the United States. This means that the state of Hawaii and its laws are indeed a fiction, either though they're through their monarchy or through the plebiscite or referendum, and acknowledge that the native Hawaiian people are determined to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations their ancestral territory and their cultural identity in accordance with their own spiritual and traditional beliefs, customs, practices, language, and social institutions. Five, the only restorative action that the U.S. committed itself to in 103-150 was in support of reconciliation efforts between the United States and the Native Hawaiian people. It ought to be clear to the members of this board that the rule change it is considering violates the principles and spirits of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a document that represents the earnest work of hundreds of principled men and women and the agreement of every member nation of the UN. While they may not have the ability to enforce their directives, they have a powerful moral force in the world and demonstrate how civilized governments should engage with and fairly deal with their indigenous peoples. It should also be clear to the members of this board that the rule change violates the spirit of the apology law and is a prime demonstration that the state of Hawaii has no intention of cooperating with the United States support for reconciliation. For in the face of mounting objection to the proliferation of telescopes on Mauna Kea by Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners over the past several decades, instead of seeking ways to address or engage with Kanakamaldi complaints, the state chooses to build the largest, most intrusive telescope of all and to bar us from that sacred summit in the name of public safety. The state cannot credibly argue that it is unable to manage the summit and, summit and enforce current laws pertaining to defacement, vandalism, or destruction of property. Where those things occur, it is possible and proper for the state to take action that is allowed by law. It is neither proper nor wise for the state to violate the principles of international conduct that are accepted by enlightened nations in the 21st century, targeting a native people, exercising our cultural and religious rights. Mahalo to you all. I want to say that I oppose the emergency rule changes. Um, it's 
to adopt the state emergency rules um, in regards to camping. And I also oppose the delegation of the board's power in uh, agenda item C1. Um, actually, uh, I oppose the delegation of this board's power to the chairperson in regards to the ability to close, to temporarily close the, the area for a period of six months. Um, and that is um, due to the fact that I just um, realized that the state statute that was just passed and approved by Governor Ige on May 9th um, added a provision or added a section in sections uh, 13-22-11.9 that adds that they can temporarily close it for this reason, and this is the main reason why I oppose that that um, uh, agenda item. And that item is, it says, um, they're allowed to temporarily close this, this road to comply with the requirements of agreements made with private landowners or leases. And that would directly affect us and this democratic process where we can voice our concerns with you, and it just gives the authority to the chairperson this one person without the board and without the board's approval and without this this dialogue that we're we're having. And I was I was actually concerned because I didn't hear that 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 what I just read and it's it was added into two sections of the, the Hawaii Revised Statutes. In section um, 13 122 11.9 and in section thirteen dash 123-21.1 and it reads exactly the same to comply with the requirements of agreements made, made with private land owners or leases which means two or three entities may have total control in dialogue between the chairperson and I, I, I would like to have the opportunity to voice my opinion to all of you because everybody has a different opinion and of different views <laughs> and what they're compassionate for and and it's all related to our values, you know, that we, we, we gathered as we grew up. So um, I I really oppose that strictly based on, on those things, you know. Um, I think the board should reserve its power and maybe expand it to, to include, you know, maybe to maybe meetings on at least two islands, you know, for the board to hear it, you know, because I am i don't like talking about problems. I like talking about solutions, just like everybody else, you know, because there's a lot of creative minds out there who, who and we're not being utilized. I've heard a lot of good comments, and and I, I want to be part of a solution, just like everybody else. Thank you. Mahalo. Mm -hmm. Wait, I'm 78. Yeah, she's. She might wait. What's your name? Aina Moni. Well, it said you were Yeah, Alright, um. Hello, my name is Aina My name is Aina Duwamoni. I was born and raised on Hilo in Hilo, Hawaii. And now I currently reside in Guam. I was raised in my culture from a very young age, and I'm very proud to be a native Hawaiian. With that being said, it is my kuleana, my responsibility to my culture, to my people, and my aina to stand firmly against C1 and these newly proposed rules and urge you, the board, to do as well, as I believe this is just a ridiculous reaction or tactic to hinder the native Hawaiian people and our movement of protecting our rights, our freedom, and most importantly, the land that our ancestors entrusted us to Malama. I feel these rules. This. I feel. I feel these rules distract the public from the truth that a multi-billion-dollar investment, A.K.A. money, is more important than the people's voice, and most importantly, a people's culture and religion. To me, and most of the Hawaiian people, our resources are Aina is more important than money. It's more valuable. It's irreplaceable. We aren't just doing this for us, but for my future keiki and also the future generation. And as for these false accusations of threats from the kia'i, I say show me the physical, tangible proof. Mm -hmm. We have always acted in kapu aloha. This is a new movement. We're not the same as our 
earlier ancestors. Um, and with that, we will prevail with Kapu Aloha. I ask you to stop the desecration of all our resources and our sacred lands, and especially our deities. This is our religion. It's not just cultural practices. We believe in this as any Christian or Muslim or any type of other religion that do. And I just say, when will enough be enough? Aloha aina, kukia imana, mahalo kia. Should we let him get the bear and chew? Aloha kako. Uh -huh. My name is Baron Chang. I'm going to be fast with this. I have to be fast. I'll have to go over. Uh, okay, I wear a lot of hats. One hat I want to wear is um, safety uh, and medical officer. If you don't know who we are, there's been several of us who have been here already. Um, we walk the trails of Mauna Kea starting from 2002. Um, and if you don't know who we are, we are the guys in 2013 who found Mr. Brian Murphy, the guy was lost from Michigan for five years in the mountain. We go where other people don't. And can I explain what would happen when we did that? We had to call cops. We had to call DNR. Don't care. We had to call the Mount Care Rangers. We were delayed. Okay. This was a day after Hurricane Flossie. Okay. We did not make it to the pickup point in time. We had to spend overnight on the mountain with 40 mile an hour winds at the peak, and it was cold. Okay. We deployed emergency blankets. We had emergency food. We had emergency water. Now, the new rules say no tarps, no backpacks. Like, well, we would have been in really bad shape if we didn't have this stuff, okay? The other thing, okay, these trails take a long time to walk over. If we're gonna start access at 1 p.m., you're not gonna get off the mountain in time. And if you're not gonna have your, your survival blankets and your water and your supplies, you're, you're talking about potential mortal danger here. You're not making the place any safer. So I stand opposed to all of this. The other hat I wear, okay, I'm Vice Chair Ahahui Malama Kanyakapupu. We are the stewards of Kanyakapupu, and you can see our agreement with DLNR. We've been this since 2002. It was clearly stated to us that we do not have police policy, okay? If we tell people not to do stuff over there, we do it on the basis of moral authority. If somebody does something up there that they're not supposed to be doing, we call don't care. We call the cops. The guys on Mauna Kea Rangers, some of the stuff they've been doing is atrocious. If we did that kind of stuff, there'd be complaints about us. We, you guys would be pulling this uh, stewardship agreement like this fast. And the other thing, we'd probably get arrested for assault. I don't think you should let the Mauna Kea Rangers run that, hip, that, that place. And incidentally, I know what happened to the waters of Hopokani. What happened was in 2005 when we went there, was already parking by road. The military was taking it to run their air station at Pohakuloa. We went there again in 2014, and it was completely diverted, 100%, all channeled to a concrete basin. All that was transferred to DLNR, Department of Parks. Every single drop was diverted down to Pohakuloa State Park. And these are the waters of Kane. This is the waters of life. These, the water is not being processed, okay? It's not potable. All that stuff is being used is to flush toilets and to wash your hands. This is the waters of Kane, the waters of life. This comes from the springs of Hopo Kane, one of the four sister goddesses of Mauna Kea. The physical embodiment. embodiment. All right, okay, one more thing, if I may. Okay, you know, the Mauna Kea guys, you know, they say that, oh, you know, they got this white cloak, you know, they're, they're science, they're pure. Well, the fact of the matter is they are not quite that pure. You know, we have records of what abuses can occur in science. You all know of the uh, 1932 Tuskegee experiment where they took Afro-American minorities with syphilis and they didn't treat them, they let them die. They produced wonderful science, advanced mankind, you know? They published papers, they had academic advancement. Pardon? Please wrap up. Okay, okay. They have not done any kind of ethical study on this. In medicine, we have, okay, I'm an assistant clinical professor of medicine at John A. Burns School of Medicine. We do, whenever we do anything, we have to institution review committee. We have to look to see what adverse effects 
our, our, our study is doing. And we don't do it if the, the, the committee says that you are adversely affecting a group. The astronomers have never done that. They've never done an ethical review. And we have more than enough um, instances where science has, has failed on the ethical side. You know, the, the nuclear bombs in, in uh, Micronesia. I mean, that's a complete ethical failure. I think the telescope guys really need to do a multidisciplinary ethical review of what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. you guys will do that. I got to find them in my heart for me to do the right thing. I was there on Wednesday, that second arrest day. I never get arrested. I was one of the first guys that put the Fuhaku on the, in the middle of the road. Uh, I'm here for, you know, come clean. I never tell nobody else what to do. That wasn't my kuleana. My kuleana was only for kako'o, which means support these brothers and sisters of Mount Awakea and help protect. But when I saw how DLNR was behaving themselves, I had a hard time with this couple of law. So 
for me, what I had to do was, I was just going to run up to the mountain, to the top, the summit, and go pull it at the ahu. As I was running, I just started grabbing pohaku. Put him on a put him on the road, I guess. And a lot of young brothers over there all saw what I was doing. And I guess they would follow. Because even halfway through, I felt like, oh, when I was kind of looked back, I was like, wow. So anyway, long story short, for me, I felt I gotta come here, come clean with myself, and I hope you guys can do the same too. Find it in your guys' heart what is the right thing for do for not only Mount Awakea, but for Hawaii and the world. Mahalo. Hey, oh. My name is Kabeigao Keloha Wright. I'm from Maui. Just so happened that I'm on this island taking a class and that's why I'm here today. Um, tonight, actually. Um, so I'm here just to. So sorry. <laughs> um, so I just want to be on the record saying that I'm strongly, I strongly oppose these rules, these emergency rules um, that are supposed to be in the name of public safety. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, I don't appreciate what appears to all of us to be um, an act of criminalizing the actions of the protectors. Um, and a lot has been said, and I just wanted to reiterate the fact that Hawaii and Hawaiians in general have really um, welcomed settlers, historically speaking, um, welcome settlers with open arms. And I think that sometimes that equates to um, the whole thing about, you know, I've, I've actually had people throw this in my face, where's the aloha spirit, right? Um, but I just want to remind everybody, and maybe not just you, but everybody here, that aloha is not just this. That's what everybody thinks aloha is. Aloha is this. <coughs> Us as, as the indigenous people of this place giving aloha. But what you're seeing is the other side of aloha, which is this. When we offer enough, and we cannot continue to give. Um, I've been here all day, just like you all have, and I appreciate your fortitude. Um, but I've heard a lot of people, heard a lot of people offer to help you. Help not just you, but this whole situation. And I would just strongly encourage you, rather than um, approving this sort of, what appears to us to be a knee-jerk reaction, and perhaps a, you know, that's how it appears to us. Um, but perhaps try to facilitate, I mean, according to your mission statement, we're on the same side. Uh, and I, I really do believe that we can work together. If, if, if the bottom line is that we're all concerned for the health of the resources, then I think that we can work together. Um, and then lastly, with all due respect and humility, um, I appreciate the fact that you've taken an oath, you know, and you, like, you know, you, definitely respect the law and order, the rule of law. I get that. Um, but I want to say that not, not everything that has been legal in history has been right. Um, there's a lot of things, and I don't have to tell you what they are, but historically <coughs> speaking, that is the case. Um, so thank you very much for being thoughtful when you make your decision. 
speakers are in here at this time. I've been live streaming for five hours. Uh, and okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kathy Kamatu. I'm number 91 and I strongly oppose both of these C1, C2 and the construction of TNT. I, um, as you can tell from my name, I've married into a very um, traditional Hawaiian family that's very immersed in the culture and I'm grateful to them for what they have taught me about their culture. But I'm not sitting here representing them. Um, I wouldn't be so bold to do so. I'm representing um, the Hawaii portion of my family. And if you took a profile of me or of many of my friends, you would feel that maybe we would support TMT or we would support these type of rules, but I want you to know we don't. And there's thousands of us that don't. Thousands that are not Hawaiian, but are watching what's going on, and they don't. Before I speak to you as a wife and a mother and a grandmother, I want to speak to you as a business owner. Recently we found out that Hawaii is um, one of the lowest rated states to have a business. And it's not because of what's happening that to stop TMT being constructed. It's because what's happening here in this room, where we're arbitrarily changing the rules. Business owners like to know the rules, and then they work within the system. But Hawaii is known to arbitrarily change the rules, make up new rules, choose who has to follow the rules, who doesn't have to follow the rules. And I think this is really a prime example. I'm sorry to sound so rude, but I think this is a real prime example. When we look at the pictures that Oha showed, and we look at many other incidences that have happened up on that mountain, and then all of a sudden, now we have to have this imminent peril. It's just another arbitrarily knee-jerk reaction that we as business owners also see that happens here in Hawaii. As a mother, grandmother, wife, um, we love that mountain. We love hiking. We love going out on trails. We love doing things. Just four weeks ago, um, my son-in-law took three of my grandchildren up to the top of the mountain and watched the sunset. Your rules would forbid that. Your rules would not allow that. And even though you say, oh, it's only for 120 days, it has been very much um, my experience. I'm an older person, and my experience that once a precedence is set, that precedence is continued. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can trust it that it would just be 120 days. There would be a reason to continue it past and beyond that. My um, children are very educated. My family is educated. Two are doctors. Many have master's degrees. My husband and I have master's degrees. They, all the men, um, in-law sons and my own sons, and my husband are Eagle Scouts. To even begin to think about doing some type of hike um, without a backpack, in that type of elevation, without a, without a blanket, just is appalling to think that you would consider that a criminal act to make a rule to be of that effect. My husband has looked forward to taking his children, taking his ma'opunas up there on that mountain and teaching them things that his own auntie Iolani Luahini has taught him about Mauna Kea. And if you don't know who that is, then you have no business deciding how to take care of Mauna Kea. Um, and with your rules, he'd not be able to do that because we would exceed your rules of 10 people up on that mountain. Just so we have five kids. Just if we took our five children and their spouses and him and I, he would not be able to teach them what his auntie EO taught him. And if we somehow whittled it down to just ten people, they would have no blanket to sit on. They'd have nothing, no 
no common sense items with them to be up on top of that mountain to learn that stuff. Um, <coughs> I know my time is short, I just wanted to quickly address and sum up that I've heard astronomers and other people up on the staff on that mountain talk about how they've had these, this emergency and that emergency and medical emergencies. And it sounds to me like they were able to handle it just fine without these rules in place. I heard an astronomer talk about how he's been up there for 18 years and they've coexisted just fine. And I'm willing to state that obviously it hasn't, else you wouldn't have all these people so upset. All you have to do is drive along Hawaii Island and look at the yellow lights and realize that they dictate what's happening and people are saying enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Susan Gates and board members. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to all of us. Um, well, my name is Linda Molina. I am from Chile. I am an agronomist engineer and also an orchard resident. I want to read my letter to you. Uh, dear presenters, I want you to please. I want to please ask you to vote no on this proposed rule set to restrict use and access to the Mauna Kea access road. As we all know, these rules will take away our natural born right to enjoy and protect our secret place, the Mauna Kea. You may think it is just dust and rocks, but the Mauna Kea is alive, is sacred and deserves all the respect. The Mauna Kea is alive. It is made out of dust and water, just like we are. I feel as a human being, I have the duty to speak for my beloved Mauna Kea. The corporations want to have their telescope built, but what about respecting our sacred land? They already have built 13 other telescopes. When this is going to stop? As a human being, I feel ashamed of being part of this civilization, so absorbed in the money and the power where the respect for the land is being transpassed to the point to destroy one of the most sacred places on earth. We all know we are living in a generation of change and awakening in where we have learned to live to the consequences of all our actions. This is not the first civilization or will be the last to exist. But to me, this is definitely the one that has caused more harm to our planet. Please. Please, representatives, help us to change that. Your decision can change the world. Hawaii it is an example for the world. We are going all clean energy, and we're going to destroy our secret temple for the world in this universe to put for money to put a bigger telescope when it's another 13 telescopes. I'm going to add, Jesus' commandment said, Treat others the same way you like to be treated. That includes the Mauna Kea as everything else and everybody else. Thank you. I also, can I please ask a question? Be because of these regulations, I want to know why bringing a blanket to the Mauna Kea it is illegal. Why you guys want it to be illegal? So, uh, just to clarify, the current version of the rule <coughs> doesn't have a blanket restriction. It just says sleeping bag, that's restricted. Yeah, sleeping bags, but it's restricted, but not blanket. What's dangerous about sleeping bag? Blanket, it? No, that's the, the, no one says it's sleeping bag. The, it's the version that was there. distributed this morning. Because oh, sleeping bags are more dangerous than blankets. On water and bathroom is okay. Like, those are basic right. human needs. Like, why this harm somebody? Thank you very much for your time. I hope you guys take the right decision for all of us, for our kids, for our grandkids, and this planet, you know? <coughs> Thank you. 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 Kiala, Kabu Anui, Michael Vera, 
this here name again, please. Good evening, Michael Vieira. I represent a company called Taiboko Hawaii, which is a tour operator, one of eight tour operators which uh, provide tours uh, up Mauna Kea. Taikobo has been opera operating for more than 20 years. Taikobo and other permitted tour operators are regulated by the Office of Mauna Kea Management. The rules place limitations on the type of vehicles and number of vehicles that can be used by the tour operators. The operators also pay a surcharge for each passenger and annual fees to renew permits. By complying with the regulations, tour operators provide a safe and responsible option for visitors and the fees provided by the tour operators help fund the maintenance of roads and, amen and amenities servicing Mauna Kea. Many of Taiboko's clients are from Japan. Many Japanese visitors come to the Big Island specifically for the purpose of visiting Mauna Kea. And due to scheduling issues, tourists visiting Mauna Kea often spend several nights in Big Island hotels. Taiboko and the other tour operators have been impacted by increased competition from visitors using non-regulated means to access Mauna Kea, increased fees, and the reduction in services, including the unavailability of toilets. Further restrictions upon tour operators' use of and access to Mauna Kea would create a severe hardship upon the company. Taiboko and the other tour companies are an essential part of the Big Island tourist industry and when considering the economic impact, the safety of visitors, and preservation and impact on the environment, commercial tours on Mauna Kea should not be further restricted. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, number 100 was signed off. I'm just going to go through this um, other page and see if anybody is here. Jason Rosado. Present. Hello, uh, my name is Jason Rosado. I'm here to testify on behalf of Tom Kauai on the Big Island, but he cannot be here today. So he says, Aloha, my, my name is Tom Kauai. I'm a native Hawaiian photographer who was born and raised on Hawaii Island. My family is from Zero, and as far back as I can remember, my grandfather, Thomas Nassau, took his grandchildren up to Mauna Kea to Stargate. Those children, those childhood memories have always drawn me back to the Mauna. Now, as a photographer, I use my craft to display the beauty of the Mauna and to help document cultural sites and activities up on Mauna Kea. Two favorite attractions to our island is Kivalea via the Hawaii Volcano National Park and Mauna Kea. Taking away access or even limiting its effects on culture, businesses, tourism, the people of Hawaii, and the residents of the Big Island who for decades have been going to Mauna Kea to hunt, play in the snow, stargaze, and practice our spiritual, spiritual rights as Hawaiians. Mauna Kea, is the best, Mauna Kea is the best place on this earth, and the main reason why these observatories are here to do what they do. So why take away something that should be shared by the Kanaka Maori? Hawaii Island residents, all Hawaii residents and visitors alike. So many share in the experience of this sacred place. Mauna Kea is deeply ingrained in who I am as a man and as a native Hawaiian creator. I ask that you reconsider the rules you are putting in place. I am opposed to the common rules, the way they are, written, that strict local people are something my family has been doing for a generation. Mahalo Nui, Tam Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Aloha, my Kako. Aloha. My name is Kim Horson. Dick Horson, I'm a Native American. I'm a 10 year Army veteran, combat veteran. And I'm going to instill my kuleana to protect and to do um, some sort of diplomacy in this conflict which we have going on right here with Mauna Kea, Mauna Awa Kea, over on Big Island with my brothers and sisters, my Kanakamoli brothers and sisters. I believe the current, I am against the, the current rules only because they discriminate, not based on race. Though Kanakamoli are a race, other, like how other people practice <coughs> culture as well. So I believe it's a great, uh, religious discrimination. 
Everybody has a right to assemble, but I do, I do applaud the current the, the issue that we have with safety at this point because there's a lot. This is a very volatile, hot issue right now. I just want to say that I've seen a lot of conflict. If we were to do the same thing with, say, the Middle Eastern people and build something on their Mecca, we'd get the same thing. Now, DLNR has gone to the Mauna with weapons with 9mm pistols, right? Kanakamoli are living the Kapu Aloha. They did not bring any weapons up to the Mauna to hurt anybody. DLNR did, authorizing deadly force if, if necessary. Now that in itself, being a veteran, we bring what's called escalation of force. Someone brings a weapon to a conflict, that in itself is a threat. This issue deserves special preference because it is their religious location, the Mauna, the beginning of their creation story. I believe it's an unlawful order. If I was still in the Hawaii National Guard and my governor ordered me to, 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 to take deadly force, if possible, on people that are just practicing the religion, I would not do the. I would not participate in that unlawful order. I believe it is an unlawful order. I'm just advising you on what I've seen and to take this in consideration that the telescope is, in fact, a target, a military target, to, it will be, because it can attract missiles. You can look up www.hawaii.edu offices, testimony of Kemp. Uh, we need to make sure what we're doing here is totally safe. I don't know if we've, we've contacted the Navy, if we have the capability to defend Big Island and Mauna Awakea from an atomic attack from other countries. I mean, it's very serious. Um, we need to find that out. From what I'm concerned, our Navy capabilities are in Kauai and Oahu. So this is a this is a this is a big big issue, and I'm just tired of seeing it on TV. And I appreciate that you guys are trying to be safe, trying to uphold the law. Nobody is above the law. Nobody is above the rule of law. And when you when you sir said that you had a Mo'opuna Native Hawaiian keiki. He didn't know if he could finish law school. I, I disagree. I believe he can finish law school. I believe we underestimate the Kanaka too much in the Native American people. We are very smart. We've been here a long time. We were invaded. Our cultures were taken away. Our religious, we never had real religious rights. <coughs> Try to take away crosses from the Catholics or the Christians. Same thing. Can't do that. And it's, it's all about equality. So I, I just hope and pray you guys would do the right thing. I believe in you. I've been to this board so many times when, when William Ayala was still the, the head here, the head chair, and we're still in this predicament. We're still having this problem. So it's falling on deaf ears and it's got to stop. Mahalo. Thank you, Mahalo. Thank you. Aloha Boar, thank you for being here tonight and persevering in all these hours. And I know that uh, you folks have been attacked in some occasions on testimony, and I just want to let you know I appreciate you folks. And, uh, my name is Kavika Kane, Kouinoa. Um, I'd like to start by saying I oppose strongly for the emergency rule for two reasons. Number one, the emergency rule is based on the Attorney General and the Mauna Kea management and the DLNR and all the uh, workers up there. Uh, they want this emergency rule because of safety reasons. And the Attorney General read some of that. He even mentioned threats. He wasn't detailed about that. But I oppose this for number one, that that's very over-exaggerated, the safety reasons. Number two, the reason why I oppose this ruling, emergency rule, is that there's laws already in place. There, there's no need for additional laws or rules to be implemented. So let me clarify. My first position, the reason why it's over-exaggerated, over the past 100 days, 
There's 24 hours in a day. <clears throat> I'll call it my, that's 2,400 hours. Over the past 2,400 hours, there's not a lot of safety problems. There's not. Over the past 2,400 hours, yes, brother came over and talked about him putting the pahaku in the road. Yes, that was Pilikia. Yes, we have to address that. <coughs> that didn't take up much of that 2,400 hours. Yes, there's been challenges with disrespect with uh, rangers and DLNR DL officers and, um, and the words being exchanged with uh, workers up there. That's very minute, very, very minimal over the past 2,400 hours. So for, for them to say these emergency rules are necessary because of safety, that's, that's, that's not true. That's very over-exaggerated. My second position, there's laws already in place. That was read by the brother from the legal Hawaiian entity. Yeah. Uh, rules already existing. There's no reason to put these emergency rules in place. I think the emergency rules by the Attorney General, the DLNR, the, the Governor's Office, from the workers up at the top <coughs> of the mountain, they want to put these rules in place to limit access. Absolutely. They want to limit access to our ku kia'i mauna, they want to limit access to our practitioners. They want to limit access to the Native Hawaiian community to practice their religious rights. And that's what it's about. This emergency rules is to limit access. On the contrary, what needs to happen is open up more access. And this is why I think more access is necessary. Right now, we want to talk about solutions. Right now, we want to talk about what's best for both parties. Yes, the governor wants this construction to continue. Yes, Team T's raised the money. Canada disposed, um, you know, they, they just uh, said we're going to give some money too. They want the construction to happen. My Kari, go ahead, let the construction happen. However, there's another party. There's a native Hawaiian community that says, no, we don't want this construction to happen. We need to go up to the mana, we need to worship, we need to pull it, we need to gather, and we need to pray and <laughs> assemble and speak out to stop the construction. So to validate both parties, construction goes on, we need more access to assemble and to speak. So that will be porno for both sides. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, yes, it may take longer to construct this telescope. Maybe it's 10 years instead of five. Maybe it's gonna cost more than a billion, maybe two billion because of the delays. So we need to satisfy both parties. I'd love to clarify my issues, the two reasons why I oppose this, if the board would like to ask me. If not, in closing, I'd like to uh, just leave a message. In closing, I have a message from the Kukia Imauna that is currently up there right now. Some say it's camping. Some say they're sleeping overnight camping. I say that's not true. I say the Kukia Imauna protectors, they're uh, sentinels. They're, uh, they're there to protect the Mauna. So yes, part of them, their uh, responsibilities is to stay overnight in the staging area, not to camp. That is to provide sustenance and safety. By, we need the porta potties there for them to practice their religious rights to protect that Mauna, which means 24 hour vigil. They need to be there 24 hours and they need to have a staging area. They're not to desecrate, they don't litter, they're, they're not there to, um, to, to do anything with the minerals or the natural resources. They're there to practice their religious rites, and that is to have a staging area. They take care of the malahini, all the tourists that come over, they educate the keiki, we have keiki there. My brother Sam Kapoi, Kamu Kapoi from Waianae, he took his whole family there, his two young sons, and they're at the Mauna right now. In this frigid weather, there he, he feels it's important that his two sons understand what his dad stands for, along with his wife, his ohana is there. Now Sam and some of the brothers up there, Nakua, they do not adhere to federal or state or county laws. Their precedence, first and foremost, is to their people. So to be there on the aina, to be there on the mauna, takes precedence over federal, state, county law. And they're going to exercise what's true to them, what's formal to them, and be there all night. 24 hour 7 vigil, and that's the Kukia Imauna, the Amana Kea. Mahalo.
Kial Flores. Inu Flores. Renet Kaikini. Kaikina. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Ramona Lynette. What you just heard was my son. I'm so proud of him. My dear, I stand as, uh, in behalf, I stand of Mary Kabena Pukui. I am the daughter. I am Nohi Olelo. Nohi Al. My, I just moved and I'm from the mainland. I re represent all the brothers and sisters all over the world. I am a retired from the Delta Airlines and I've traveled all over the world and I've met, and I visited all these indigenous people. But there's people all over the world are supporting Mama Kea, and I am their speaker. I'm the ancestor of Pele. My daughter, and I have two, I have my son and my oldest, but my youngest is Kabena Ula Okolani Hii Abu Pele. She was young at the time of only two and a half years old. I took her off to Mauna Kea in the early 80s because my two, old, my two oldest children was in school. I shared the ah, the ha with her and I, and I chanted and I taught her the mana in Mauna Kea. Now my daughter at the age of two and a half was raised in the mainland but she was born in Hawaii and she knows the ha and she knows the culture and the mana. As she grew up in the mainland, she was strong in Hawaiian culture though she was not raised. And I am a former grade school teacher. I also volunteer in high school. You don't even understand the history books that is given about the Hawaiian cultures. It's totally false, mm -hmm. falsified. My daughter stood and wanted to, put, uh, wanted to protest about how it is written in the history of the United States, how Hawaii is, is, is manifest. I told her no. It comes within you. But I want to tell you, brothers, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, you know when I go to Mauna Kea, I am so hurt that I can't go up there. My family, my mo'opunas, my kupunas, I come from the lineage of Kamehameha and from Lili Okalani. I stand strong with my mana. And they are saddened that I am not able to go up. My kupunas and my great grandchildren, I want to teach them the ha. I want to teach them the religion. I don't want it to come in a textbook. I don't want them to learn this in a book. I want them to experience. I believe in all of you. I really do. And I know we have the control of writing history. We can make it right in our history books, and we can make a difference. Because when the day comes, those books are written about this moment, about this event, it will stand strong on what needs to be done right. Political, which I'm not really strong in. I do have children who is strong in, pol in politics, but for me, I know that I stand strong that for the history, we need to make a difference. And I believe that you would do the right thing. Aloha, and thank you. Thank you. Alfred Medeiros. Lisa Hollett. Jessica Andrews. Maya Safran. Jessica. Lisa. 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 I didn't know what number you were on. 117. Aloha. Aloha. Um, my name is Lisa Howard Andrews. I come from Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaii Island. Um, I um have testimony to share with you from a brother in Hilo um, that could not be here today, and it's coming up now. Um, this testimony is 
strongly against the Testimony in regard to the request to adopt new administration new administrative rules. Thirteen one two three twenty one two restrict the use of and access to Mono Cap. Alora BLNR. I write to you today with the perspective of a Hilo resident that values both the contribution of astronomy and the special cultural and environmental elements of Mauna Kea, and I write to you from a place of deep concern. I'm concerned, even alarmed, by this bold attempt by the state to manipulate its elected and appointed power to undermine the rights of the citizenry in order to advance the cause and alleviate the concerns of corporate and state interests. As a fair-minded person and an astute observer of the events unfolding on Mauna Kea. I have researched the matter from both sides. I have also made many visits to the area on the mountain that would be affected by the proposed rule changes. Let me tell you what I see. I see the state government led by Governor Ige and Attorney General Chin consciously and egregiously mischaracterizing the intent and actions of peaceful protesters, protectors, to receive, deceive, and <coughs> the general public and institute rule changes that violate constitutionality, protected civil rights in the guise of protecting public safety. The guise is thin, and anyone that takes an honest look can see right through through a commitment to peaceful protest, which is the most appropriate and noble form of resistance to perceived corruption and abuse by government. A group of committed citizens have stymied the advances of corporate government project, of a corporate government project, and the government is frustrated, embarrassed, and upset. This frustration gives neither appointed nor elected officials the right to misappropriate their political authority to draft new rules to punish those that resist. This is the behavior of unjust, undemocratic, and desperate governments. <coughs> the statements against the protesters made by Attorney General Chin are blatant propaganda designed to inflame the public and garner support for rule changes that, if adopted, will certainly be found by later courts, real short, real mean, um, and investigators to be an abuse of power. In fact, policy changes advanced with such targeted focus, based on such bias and fallacies, could warrant an investigation by the Federal Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. This is a strain and burden the state of Hawaii can little afford. The adoption of these proposed rule changes would not only be devastating evidence that the state of Hawaii feels empowered to disregard the civil rights of the individual for the benefit of corporate and political interests, but it would be the most targeted and blatant disrespect of Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners in a very long time. If the board is somehow under the impression that the inflated concerns regarding public safety expressed by the governor and attorney general will provide sufficient cover for the violation of the civil rights of peaceful protesters or protectors, let me assure that you that your impression is absolutely wrong. Please do not adopt these rule changes if you do, it will only serve to assure me and my fellow citizens that you see that law as a tool to achieve your own goals instead of civil code designed to protect the people and natural resources of the special place. Mahalo for your consideration. Sac Street, Hilo, Hawaii. Thank you.
Thank you. cultural practitioners and they go up there and do an oli and then they bring blankets and backpacks and stuff that is needed for appropriate blessing and things like that and that you would be making is unnecessary and would not support and support the community and um, there's necessary things that are needed for the Land and Natural Resources. I am Jessica Maloney Andrews. I am before you as Kikyo Kaisa from Hawaii, Hawaii Island. Mahalo for taking our testimony today regarding the new restrictions. Besides being a sacred place, Mauna is a place that must remain open to access. <coughs> My generation would like to see your generation handle this is issue in a formal manner and certainly without breaking the law. I know the road on the Mauna Kea is safe, on the mountain is safe and clear. Also know that the road was graded two times shortly after the second wave of arrests. And I believe two times a week all year long. I see that the porta potties have been stolen that were part of the protection of the Mana by people operating under government eBay's orders. I have been taught that stealing is against the law. They should be returned to the Mana because all of our Kuliana is to protect the Mana. Porta potties are needed. <coughs> Michael Puna are the cult, are cultural practitioners that must have blankets, and they they and their helpers carry items in backpacks, plants, lay, tea leaf, offerings, also jackets, blankets, mats for kneeling, food, drinks, bags of for, for trash, and items for child care, items for kupuna care, like strollers, wheelchairs, and first aid aid kits, etc. <coughs> so as to have hands to free for walking safely and st steadily. <coughs> I think it is none of anyone's business what we bring to the Mauna Kea as long as it is not going to hurt anyone. The only people that have been hurt 
are the two protectors that have been hit by cars. My Kumuhula and other Kupuna on, are on Mauna Kea, and I want to visit them as soon as possible, whenever that will be. Now you are shutting us down because we care about our land. We have done not done not done anything to hurt you, the road, or not yet. Nobody would like to hurt anything or anybody because we just care. <coughs> Keep conservation land conservation land. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, 120 Kaleo Wong, 121 John Griffiths, 122 Malia Maki, 123 Rosanna Prieto. Here. <coughs> one person. And from what I've seen and heard just today, despite what I've researched I've done on that one person that power would be delegated to, I don't feel that person is qualified to make those decisions on our behalf. I feel that it's necessary at this time for the decisions to remain in more hands than one, especially if that one person is not qualified and can't even pronounce most of our names. You know, Thank you very much. You know, that's true.
this is going to be a problem if you don't solve it with a potentially better solution because our hunters will be denied access. Um, we have hunters that go to the backside of Mauna Kea um, and start their trek at about 1 o'clock in the morning to get there. Um, they use stoves to heat up their food during the afternoon. Um, and sometimes, you know, it gets cold out there. And for safety-wise, you know, these these items, you had more items on the first list and were taken off. And we, by the time I got here by 1 o'clock, we had to change our testimony a little bit. Um, to, I guess it was to appease um, the hunters, but still using a game management area to solve a problem, it really just limits access to more people. And, um, you know, everybody has the right to protest. And this is a short-sighted uh, endeavor. And if uh, many of you will probably have an opportunity to read the Tribune Herald paper that came out on the the steps that are being taken to come up with this, this rulemaking process. Um, so I just suggest, strongly suggest, or that you guys come up with a better solution to this overall problem that's affecting more than just the protesters up on the mountain, but it's affecting a lot of mountain users. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 137, Kelani Cook. <coughs> practitioner, not a lawyer, I'm going to talk about law, so let me know too much. Um, I'm a historian, and one of the things that I wasn't even going to testify today, but it was listening to the Attorney General's um, talking, or the Attorney General talking about this. Um, if I heard this correctly, the Attorney General admitted that um, and with, um, with the, pretty much the purpose of these laws, what they're doing now is not illegal. They can't prove that they're doing something illegal with the camping. When people are doing something illegal, they got arrested, they got hauled down, they bailed out, they're back up. Um, they're not, if they're not doing anything illegal, and you change the laws specifically to follow, to go after what are political opponents of the governor, um, it makes a little bit of a mockery of the system, and you guys are the ones who are gonna get I mean, it's kind of weird that they're asking you to do the rule change, and you are gonna take the heat for the governor's project, or a project the governor really supports. Um, and that, that's the first part. Um, that their, their actual purpose is already sort of making a lot of the, the system of law. Um, the procedure that they're using, this that they're claiming this imminent peril, um, and they haven't actually been able to produce evidence of the imminent peril, there have been accusations, but all of those are things that, I mean, even when you're talking about the guy uh, getting spit on, and it was hard to hear outside, so that was something you saw? I was right next to him. That's, isn't that assault? Well, you know, the person who did the spitting is somebody that I know from Hilo for a long, long time, and I didn't approve of it, but I didn't feel it was my responsibility or my authority to be a cop. Mm -hmm. I, I was there as a I was there as an invited guest. Yeah. I was greatly offended and I felt really bad for the old guy because he he was walking with a cane. He was having a hard time already. I and know. she walked up and spit right in his face and when she called him, I haven't said it in here but she used a very strong racial epithet against him, and that's why I say that's what motivated me to try to change the system. And when I came down the hill, I told Chancellor Straining, "We got to fix this place. This thing's a mess." And, the and that's that's part of what my mission is here. And if I'm not perfect <coughs> in my mission, it's because. I got strong be feelings perfect. too, because I've been on the Hawaiian side all these years. What, what I'm saying is, something like that is, I mean, if there is an actual assault that goes on, there are laws for that, right? That should be covered. 
And for something like that, that's also a huge violation of the whole of Kapu Aloha, and, and that should be taken care of on that side too. Um, so the older these, generation uh, didn't have quite the finesse that... The older generation was uh, brought up in a 60s, 70s you know, spirit. Whatever, what's it called again? Kapu Aloha. Kapu Aloha. That finesse is a little more sensible. <laughs> um, but what I'm saying, my age not like that. That's right. Uh, uh, just saying that laws are in place for the things that are actual threats and the possibilities of actual assaults. And if those things happen, the laws are in place. And to create new laws that justify it by saying we're going to create these new laws. How do we? How do laws. we get? You know, your point to world things, but answer me a simple question. We have. Uh, responsibility of keeping the roads open so that the staff of the 30 meter can go up there and do what they want and if the court shuts them down that's their tough luck and if the court shuts them down then we will block them from going up there but until the court shuts them down we have to obey the law and we got to keep the roads open so how do you answer that what did you do last time Huh? What did you do last time? What did we do what last time? On the 24th. We sent the cops up there. And, okay. and that's, everybody knew this is, hey, this is the thing. Know, we knew it was going to happen. Right People are going to get cops, arrested. Let me and they're with, like, that's, and that's okay. part of the right. Rest, right? We're not rearranging the, the rules. Problem is, the problem is with that scenario. The only way you can effectively do it is that when you have demonstrations, and I'm not an expert in this area, but you have to have overwhelming force. Yes. And you have to last long enough to abate the problem. And if you don't and have, if you don't have to overwhelming do that, you force, do that project. if you don't have overwhelming <clears throat> force and you can't last long enough to abate the problem, then the problem gets exacerbated. And that's twice, what happened. Twice. And it happened twice. And so, I'm not the governor to say which way the state goes. Governor Ige was elected by the will of the people, and he has his own philosophy where he wants to go. And he said in the paper what his position is. And if the law says that these people are supposed to be there, we, we can't, we can't keep the roads open only for some and not for others. And that's another issue. Isn't it? But, it is. It's, it's, but we're talking about the imminent peril part of this. Well, the, the, Where is the imminent peril? The, em, the imminent peril is, you know, I don't know if you were in here, but some of the things I heard sounded to me like imminent peril. And they should have, be investigated. Well, you know what? You know what? You may be right. They should be investigated. But, I mean, what kind you know, of, these rangers are technically well, law, or there's some form of law, right? Excuse me. I, I, I hear both of your sides. We're here for this yeah, so you got two Portuguese over here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on with this. It's been a long time. Oh, yeah, I know. I, <coughs> we need to move on. I'm about Seriously. 15 minutes away from probably getting divorced if I don't show up. And finally, the rules themselves, I mean, they've been changed, but they've also sort of made a little bit of a, I mean, with the blankets, it's obviously like the content of the law is making a mockery of it. But then even with the, I mean, the backpacks, and we have to keep massaging this thing just because it's like, we started silly and we're trying to get less silly. We do that. <laughs> When the people who are under the law make a mockery of the law, that's an issue. When the people who are in charge of creating and enforcing the law do that, that's a greater issue because it undermines the authority of the law in general. And that's something as a historian that you can see that either it's overwhelming force, which ends up with despotism and horrible, or the law is made a complete mockery of the So yeah. basically you're against opposing C1 and C2. Yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to all this. I'm going to be brief because I know you all want to go home and I do too. Um, my name is Mary Steve. <laughs> Um, I was born and raised on Hawaii Island, and I was raised in the shadow of Mauna Kea. I'm educated at UH Hilo, and moved to Oahu three years ago to start my PhD. I'm here today in opposition to the emergency rule changes, and I feel that these rules are unfairly targeting protectors 
oppose the PNC construction. I applaud the efforts of the protectors. They are standing vigil on Mauna Kea and protecting land that has already been set aside for conservation. Everyone is so focused on TMT and the good science that will come out of it that they forget that astronomy does not represent all science. I'm educated in biology, anthropology, environmental science, and conservation biology. As a scientist and a Native Hawaiian, I understand that there are times when we need to stand for protection of places that we hold sacred, even if it is in opposition to current rules. The protectors are standing for me, for all of us, when we can't physically be there. The DLNR has failed us in proper management of Mauna Kea, and if we continue down the path of TMT construction, this will only continue. Again, I applaud our protectors for taking it upon themselves to conserve a fragile ecosystem and sacred mountain. What does the average person do when the government has failed the people? You stand for what is right, even if you stand with the minority. The developers of TMT have been throwing a lot of money in our community, as if it is substitution for the culturally rich area that they plan to construct their piece of scientific equipment on. Construction on what is a focal point to an entire culture and island community is something that no amount of money can ever buy. And it's something that's priceless. I urge you all to oppose these rule changes and not to unfairly demonize a group standing for something that is culturally and environmentally important to all residents of Hawaii. And I urge you as a scientist and as a Native Hawaiian. Thank you very much for your time. David Mullenix, Sherry Pollock, Eo Mailani Kulahiko, Kukahiko, Kukahiko, Kalehua Krug, Jason Rudula. Good evening, Chair and Board Members. My name is Jason Rudula, and I'm the Acting Enforcement Chief and Division Administrator for DLNR's Division of Conservation and Resources Enforcement. I am in support of the emergency rule because it will provide a legal regulation that will enhance public safety for all persons at Mauna Kea. In my professional law enforcement opinion, due to the actions of protesters who block the road by placing rocks in the roadway and refusing to comply <coughs> with lawful and reasonable orders, to not obstruct the roadway, I do believe that there is immediate peril to public safety without this type of regulation. <coughs> I'd like to provide you with several examples of this immediate peril. During the protests in, on both April 2nd and June 24th, those persons who blocked the roadway placed themselves in life-threatening jeopardy. The roadway consists of a gravel cinder road bordered in many areas by sheer drop-offs and unstable slopes. These conditions create a significant hazardous condition to persons present on the roadway and creates a significant fall danger with the risk of death or substantial bodily injury, not to mention significant liability to the state of Hawaii. Further, Imminent peril is demonstrated by the obstruction of the roadway, which hinders the appropriate medical and fire response to the summit. Fire trucks and ambulances cannot pass obstructed roadways that are filled with boulders and rocks. And furthermore, fire trucks cannot access this. <clears throat> On June 24th, I actually observed the ahu and rock walls that were placed in the road. These obstructions were placed on the roadway, creating a very unsafe condition to motorists. Vehicles that wanted to pass these obstructions would have had to drive precariously close to the sheer edge drop-offs on the shoulder of the road. This danger is further multiplied by the fog and darkness and limited traction of the gravel cinder roadway. The environmental and terrain conditions 
coupled with the non-compliance of many protesters, also places our dole care officers in very dangerous situations. Dole care officers have had to effect arrests in very close proximity to protesters on the road. This close proximity and lack of space makes effectuating arrests more difficult to safely do and places our officers in, in a highly dangerous situation. In conclusion, to promote public safety, I urge you to support this measure and pass it tonight. Thank you. Yes. understand about the blocking of the road is a public safety issue. How does the 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Um, rule help with preventing that blocking of the road? In my professional law enforcement opinion, and I'm not a lawyer, so in my layman legal law enforcement opinion, this type of restriction will minimize the presence of persons in the area and thus will create a more safe environment for vehicles to pass and transit through just by the reduction of the amount of people in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, I got one point. You were there? Yes, sir, I was there on June 24th. Okay, and that's your observation, personal observation. Yes, sir, it is. And then you're the boss. Yes, sir, I am the chief. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Meliana Kamai. Hello, my name is Kamai. Oh, I'm going to talk to you o kapua keli i koa ka mai ko uma koa kine no hoku lawa aloa a mai o kapua ala ku umele ana ka makana maka mai mai ka ni ka mai heva hine o au o kapua ala ku umele ana ka makana maka mai mai ka ni ka mai no ho au ma wai anai hele au ke kula o halau kumana a o lalo au me ke aloha vale no i ke ia ka kahi aka ke lohe au i na lula ho a o ko i hana E ha loa ko una au. A mana o au, hewa loa keia mau lula. He mau na heta oko a kupono ole kahana a oko. No laila ku e au i keia mau lula ho. He kia i mau na au, he keke o ka aina au, a kako o au i na ohana maluna o ka mauna a wakea. E ku paa mau i ke aloha aina. Mahalo. ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。ハロー。
Mahalo for serving without pay, excluding you. We trust you to do what's right. We don't need to repeat what's already been said. But what I would like to say besides opposing these unnecessary so-called emergency rules is that there are many people missing from this room. There are many voices missing from this testimony. Thankfully, we have Olelo TV. Due to Olelo TV, many people are at least hearing us today, this evening. But that was not to the actions of the state, of their own accord, of their own willingness. Where is the transparency? Where is the inclusion of our people? Do we only represent the big house across the street, the corporations, the international companies with monies? No, you represent the people of Hawaii. Yes, with the laws, the legalities of it all, and the slippery slopes and the snakey snakes of using the law, creating unnecessary laws, Enforce the laws that we have. Enforce the laws that we have. We don't need to create something which is going to limit a particular group of the population, which is always targeted at the expense of everyone else who has come. Even today, we still welcome you, but we don't ask you, and even our own people, we don't ask you to change yourself. We ask each other to adapt to each other, to be tolerant. But tolerance only goes so far. And then we wonder why our people lose patience, cannot present themselves well, that they get upset, and they find themselves doing the things that they have to do, illegal as it is, because they are not legalese. They do not slip through the law, like many attorneys know how to slip through the law, create new laws, so that it all works out for who? Everybody but. Many people before us have cited so much information that you folks are probably on overload. But I thank you for hearing it. And I pray that you folks go home and you absorb it because it's in your heart, it's in your na'au. What is the right thing to do within the law? Create new things that targets a group that actually causes more danger? Why can't it be a win-win like Kavika was saying? Why aren't we looking at the and possibility? Why does it always have to be the them or us? When do we start to consider the and? Hawaiians have been us and you. We are still us and you. Because you are us. We are the people of Hawaii living here, but we know who the first peoples are, and thank you for respecting that. So I ask you folks, do what's right in your na'au, and to think about who the missing voices are. And, and if I just may add one more. So, we are in 2015, we have technology. To those voices that are not here, I ask you to do teleconferencing, because for people to come from our neighbor islands mm -hmm. to spend one, two, three hundred dollars, sometimes they have to buy the first class seat, four hundred dollars for a three minute testimony. Mm -hmm. How many of us have that? And if they are hunters, Practitioners, who of us has that kind of money? So let us use technology as it has been available to us. Mahalo nui loa. Mahalo. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Oh. She's on the sign-up sheet. I think I'm 151. 151 and 151. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this goes up to 180. <laughs> 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 All right. All right.
good uh, good evening by now, good night. Um, um, first off, I'm Makala Viteris um, from Kailua, Oahu. Uh, I'm here on behalf of myself as well as my, as well as my ohana. Um, many of us couldn't be here, um, like the woman before me spoke, you know. Um, issues of access are a big deal, you know, and access to these meetings is one of them, you know, but I'll get into that. Um, just wanted to start off by mahaling you guys. Um, I know it's hard. Um, sat across from you guys, or this board several times now. Um, and I couldn't imagine it from the other end. You know, it's, it's difficult, and the fact that you guys want to hear everybody out, going up to 180, you know, um, that's important, you know, and um, that the fact that you guys are taking your kulana seriously is a good sign of faith, um, you know, for, uh, for the public, for the stakeholders um, out there. Um, and I just want to urge you guys to continue to let that kulana guide you, you know, to um, allow, um, you know, a lot of the things that have been said today into you, your folks' minds, and, you know, really, uh, really let that uh, um, set in. Um, so just to start, um, I, I do oppose both C1 and C2, um, uh, the uh, proposed rules. Um, and just for the sake of time, you know, the cultural, spiritual, and um, religious arguments you guys have heard, I'm sure, as, uh, as well as the, uh, the environmental, the financial, and uh, the fiduciary, you know. So all of these, uh, all of these arguments are out there, you know, and I just want to um, urge you folks to not pass this rule, not open up the state, um, to a liability of uh, more lawsuits, more legal battles, spending more money, more time, more energy. Um, you know, it, it's clear. It, it's clear what uh, the general consensus of today was. You know, it's clear what the 1998 and 2005 um, state audits say about the management of, you know, Mauna Kea through the DLNR, through the um, UH Board of Regents. You know, and so the writing's on the wall. You know, the, the fact is that... Um, the mismanagement um, is a problem, and I know this is just about the proposed rules, so I'll just wrap it up with, uh, with, um, um, just wrap it up with thanking you guys for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Karen Murray. Karen Murray. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, I've been at work since I got up this morning at 5, and I, then I had to go hold signs for this and then come down here on my own time. Thank you. But, um, okay, I totally oppose C1 and C2. I feel emergency, these emergency rules are not really an emergency. You know, I was, I've been sat on, but I didn't expect any, like, laws to be, re to be enacted or changed to protect me over it, I know. I just like that. I just wash my face and that's fine, you know? Okay. Um, I think if this is an emergency, we need a new dictionary. <laughs> and um, I've been on the streets, as I just came from, and I've been hearing from people all over the world, Japan, everywhere. And when they hear about what's happening here, from TMT and what's happening now with this, what they, they, they really think that this is um, bullying, yeah? This is um, a petty kind of bullying. My grandmother would, if she saw those rocks, pictures of those rocks, and I saw great video, she would have said, oh, bring them over my house. You know, we make some, back, some in our backyard. Okay, they're not dangerous, and they were taken down within a day. And, and we also had on the news, we had a UX, UX spokesperson, David, I don't know how to say his name. Anyway, he said, that Mauna Kea is a cinder cone that is constantly in motion, okay? We have to grade it twice a week in order to even maintain that road because rocks are constantly falling into that road because that's a cinder cone. That's the nature of Mauna Kea. It's trying to heal that scar of a road, okay? Um, so as far as that being any kind of danger, that's Shibai. And after the bullet hole thing, oh my God, <laughs> credibility is like dumb. Okay, so when it came to feces on the wall and all that kind of stuff, you know, it seemed to me they would have brought it up when they closed the visitor center. Oh, feces on the wall, that's why. And bomb threat, they would have brought in Homeland Security or something, right? So I don't believe that. I don't believe those two things. I don't believe a lot of things because the cre credibility is lost. And you know, I approached you during your confirmation hearing, and I know we're never going to agree because I don't think that the military military will ever be the stewards of the land. 
not especially after Red Hill. Yeah. So um, that's especially why I don't want C1 to go. Because we're not going to agree on that. Yeah? Um, let's see. Make sure. Yeah, I mean, Hawaiians, they work with broths all the time. We were just out working on a fish pond about a month ago. You know, these things are not dangerous. Rocks are not dangerous. They're our, they're our friends. They're, they're, they're part of our lives. Yeah. What is dangerous is building another hazardous waste tank on a cinder cone. A 5,000 gallon tank of hazardous waste sitting at the top <coughs> of a cinder cone that is by the UH spokesperson's own words, constant <coughs> motion. Okay? We see from Red Hill, it's not a good idea. Tanks leak. The other thing that, um, you know, um, the other thing is that um, UH astronomer uh, on a talk show, he said, well, this is probably going to be the last of the big telescopes because it's financially draining for one. And the other thing is we'll probably have breakthrough in optics. Take out your cell phones. How great is that? You can take all kinds of great photos and videos now, right? And things are getting, computers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So funny, probably they'll put it just right in your head, right? Right? <laughs> so, if they can do that with that, TMT can take all their money and invest it in research in optics and retrofit that into one of the existing obsolete telescopes and not disturb that man and try to uh, take all that rubbish away. Because to take one down disturbs a lot of land also. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for Thank listening. You. Sorry if I seem abrasive. I'm really tired. I need to go home and sleep. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to testify? No further testimony? Okay, we're going to close. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you want to come back and respond? Remember, Lauren had asked for the Facebook uh, so I just wanted to put it in the record. <laughs> uh, sorry, we we're about to close public testimony here. Are you wanting to testify? <laughs> Um, that's a whole man of a new on a mic. I'm glad I got here just in time. Um, sorry, can you do this to your name? Kaui Nani Oye. I was number 138. All right. Um, uh, I oppose, first and foremost, um, amending anything that would exclude access and rights to the summit. I have Ohana um, buried and scattered up there, as well as um, people up there in Wayo. Um, and this proposed amendment or um, this proposal would prevent my access to those sites. Um, the pole, as we know it, is a very special time for our, our aqua. Um, and I think that by preventing us um, the access at these specific hours, you also prevent us from our inherent right to practice our religious connection with that body. So that's all I have to say. Mahalo for the long life you there. Thank you. Uh, Anyone else wish to testify? I just have to disclose her. My dad is one of my closest friends. Okay, uh, at this point we're going to close public testimony. And, um,
according to deliberation. Uh, and Sarah, I don't know if you see this is James's motion. Uh, James, it's appropriate for us now to go into executive session to talk to our attorney and whatever your script says. Sure. You use and read uh, that script. Uh, do we need to go into Do we need to go into executive session? We had one earlier. Uh, uh, I, 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 I need some legal advice from counsel because I have some uh, uh, I have some legal concerns that I, I would like to air with counsel. I think it's uh, prudent to to because it's an attorney client thing, I, I think it's prudent to go to executive session to discuss it. Now, are they going to do decision making? So I make that motion. Mm -hmm. Second, Would you like to do it yourself? Mm -hmm. Sure. Second, if you give me the script, you got it. I'll read it. I'm sorry. I don't see it. I mean, after this. You sure it's on that page? All right, here we go. Here we go, number four. Move to go in executive session to consult with uh, our board's attorney on questions and issues pertaining to the board's powers, duties, privileges, immunities, and liabilities relating to this docket. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. For Do you anticipate making uh, decision making? I know Brachi is because of old age. Oh, Do you anticipate? Hang on. Do you anticipate uh, decision making? We will come. We will come back out. We're going to come back out and either make a decision or not. But we will come back out. You come back out. We will come back out. Okay. Thank you. We're live. We have to go kuka kuka. Executive session uh, is a private meeting, uh, not subject to public uh, oversight. They promise to come back, either make a decision or not. I don't know what that means, but that means that. Uh, and there's still a lot of people here. We've been on the air. Six hours, 51 minutes. I think it's a new personal best. So. Uh, hopefully, this will also be recorded so you can play it back. And, uh, and also be able to view it on YouTube and also um, edit uh, sections out of it that were particularly good. There were some really good testimony uh, in the seven hours that uh, we've been here. People said I did a good job holding the camera. Actually, I cheat and I use a monopod, so I rested on something. Um, we're going to go out. Um, we might cut away, but you know what? We'll go out here. Thank you. You were great. Great, thank you. <laughs> Uh, we might cut away because I have to get my uh, my car out of out of parking. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cut away. Here's the screen that that uh, people on the outside can see the inside. Okay. Um, I think it was also being streamed on Olelo. I don't know if they got the whole thing. We've been here seven hours. We're going to cut away for a little while. I'm going to go get my car and probably come back here. I'm not sure if they're going to make a, uh, a uh, decision tonight. I think they're going to try. Uh, we'll see. So I'm signing off. Thanks. For joining us, I did this all on cellular bandwidth, so um, I might have a fundraiser <laughs> to pay for uh, my AT&T bill, but we'll see. You know, I got I got six, uh, the six gigabyte plan, so we'll see. Okay.
thanks for all your comments too. I'm gonna try and uh, download this. Uh, one is that as soon as I stop, it should in about uh, an hour or so be ready for replay. And then I'm gonna try and download it uh, and then edit out, edit some of the really good testimony here. And as you could, if you, if you were here the whole time, you'd know that almost all of the testimony uh, were against these special bills. They brought up all kinds of reasons that falled into, fell into um, several uh, major categories. So I'm cutting away. I'm kind of loopy. 